Part 2 The Tedril Wars 8. Alberich heard a sound that once would have prompted curiosity, and now only brought a dull, aching despair. Wagons were coming up the road to the palace gates, enough of them that the rumbling noise was audible even from the practice ground outside the cell. He knew what that meant. These days there were no more fates and celebrations at the court that needed fancy foods, wines, and decorations. The burdens these wagons bore were grimmer by far. More grievously wounded folk, soldiers and civilians alike, coming from the battlefields to the south, where the forces of Carsey grappled with those of Valdemar. People too badly hurt for their own healers to tend who had been sent here in hopes that the masters at Healer's Collegium could make them whole, or at least mend as much as could be mended. All the fault of the Tedrils, the Tedrils who had been set against Valdemar after all. It had been no rumor that Carsey was hiring them, and once the lands lost to the Menmeleth province of Rethwellen were retaken to be used as the Tedril base, it had been Valdemar's turn to face them, face Carsite troops and Carsite sun-priests backing the most ruthless mercenaries this world had ever seen. All of Valdemar, except himself, was of a single heart and mind in this situation. Everything must be done to defeat Carsey, and had the enemy been anyone other than Carsey, no doubt he would be feeling the same. But it was Carsey, and he was torn heart and soul, ripped in half between honor and desire. He wanted to go to the front lines himself, to put his considerable skill and knowledge to serve Valdemar. But there was a chance if he did, he would be fighting and killing his own people, and he wouldn't know it until it was too late. The Tedrils had no livery except among their own blood. It could be anyone in the front lines. He would not have cared, if only it had been the sun-priests and the generals that served them that he slaughtered. But it wouldn't be, would it? They would be safe in the rear, or far, far away, and he could not depend on anything except that it would not only be Tedrils he helped to kill. No, mixed in among the Tedrils, and certainly serving them in their camps, would be ordinary people, simple people, who had no quarrel with Valdemar and would have been happy if they had been left in peace. His people, the ones he had pledged himself to serve. And besides, even if he found a way to help without facing his own folk across the edge of a sword, he wouldn't be allowed to go. If he set foot outside of Haven, there were powerful people who would be certain that he was doing so to betray Valdemar. And having deserted Carsey, how could he blame them for that assumption? When a man turned his coat once, it took no great stretch of the imagination to think he might do so again. Whenever his mind wasn't otherwise occupied, it was thoughts like these that came flooding in, and with them a tide of guilt and depression. People who had become his friends— his brothers and sisters were going south into danger. And here he was, safe in the sunshine of high summer in Haven. He was glad that at least he had a task, something he could do honorably. Now he knew only too well some of the pain that Axel must have felt when he remained training the cadets, while his trained cadets went off to do the fighting. And he knew the agony of being torn between desiring the best for his land— and knowing he could not support what the leaders of his land had joined hands with. Axel himself must be feeling that same agony, for Axel had given Valdemar's spies some of the information that warned them that the rumors of the Tedril's hiring was true. It must have been by Vicondus's will, surely, for the information had come well before the first attack on the border of Valdemar, with enough time to prepare for that attack and those that followed. These were not battles. These were wars, where the Tedrils moved into land opposite the border, fortified it, then launched campaign after scorched earth campaign from spring through autumn, and then vanished, only to pick and fortify a new spot during the winter from which to pillage a new territory. Each time they did this, they effectively halted all farming, all commerce in that area, decimating it and leaving it barren and trying to recover. It was a diabolical plan and there was nothing that Valdemar could do to thwart it without crossing the border into Carsey themselves, which Sendar, wisely, would not allow. 
and damn all use my foresight as against them. The magic that the heralds called gifts and that Carsey called witch powers, Alberich found less useful than the exaggerated tales had led him to expect. Oh, he had mind speech and very powerful, but it was of use only with other heralds with mind speech and with companions, and in setting the truth spell, which he seldom used. He probably could reach across the length or breadth of the country with it, but he never left the city of Haven. He was never allowed to leave. And he had foresight, that ability to glimpse what was to come, but it didn't stretch ahead more than a mark or two. It was a gift that might be invaluable on a battlefield, except that he wasn't allowed near the battlefields. Of course, it was also an erratic gift, which manifested irregularly and unpredictably, certainly not one he controlled, certainly nothing he could use from here to help in the Tedril Wars. It seemed to work only in cases where something he could do immediately would change what was to come. The Tedril Wars... Everyone called these seasonal blights by that name now. Little wars, leeching wars, stretching now into the fourth year. Every spring a new little war, more deaths, more fresh-faced youngsters going out to face the foe. And Alberich wondering, as surely as Dathor wondered, had he trained them well enough, prepared them well enough? Could he? Could anyone? It wasn't only heralds he trained. It was young guard officers, those healers that would accept training in the use of weapons, and even some of the highborn youths who volunteered, out of a sense of duty and with dreams of glory in their hearts. He trained them and he sent them out, and he never knew if any of them would return. Valdemar bled from a wound that was not allowed to heal, that weakened her steadily. Alberich knew this, knew that when the Tedril commanders judged the land weakened sufficiently, they would turn a little war into an all-out campaign. And there was nothing he could do about it. If it hadn't been for Cantor, he would never be able to sleep at night. But Cantor had his own ideas about what was good for his chosen. And when Alberich was prepared to spend another sleepless night staring at the ceiling, his gut in a knot and his head throbbing, he would sense Cantor moving into his mind like a storm front, and then, well, then the next time he saw the ceiling it would be morning. Last night had been one of those nights, leaving him singularly irritable, and not at all inclined to be charitable toward any of his pupils. Charity could, would, get them killed, especially the one before him now. Alberich surveyed his latest pupil, and reflected that Trainee Misty was at least providing one thing for him, a distraction from grief, although she was providing a little grief of her own of a different sort. The middle-aged woman looked right back at him, her hazel eyes unnaturally large behind the thick glass lenses she wore, held to her face by a frame of wood with leather straps that buckled behind her head, flattening already straight brown hair. She had a set that she normally wore that had lighter frames with side pieces of wire that hooked over her ears, but those kept flying off during any sort of exertion. This had been the best they could do for weapons practice, and it wasn't very good. Her peripheral vision was poor enough, and the frames of the lenses made it worse. And they were a handicap in another way. The first thing that an attacker would do would be to try to smash them. But she was virtually blind without them, so what could he do? Her short-sightedness was just the first in a string of handicaps that made her woefully unsuited to be a herald. He thought she looked particularly aggrieved this afternoon, but it was difficult to tell what her expression was on the other side of that wood-and-glass mask. Physically, she was utterly unprepossessing and looked like what she had been before she'd been chosen, a sedentary scribe and clerk. He had no idea why she of all people had been chosen, at a time when fighting heralds was what was needed, not clerks, and how he was going to turn her into a fighter, he had no clue. He despaired, she, well, he didn't know for certain how she felt, frustrated surely at the least. She was the single clumsiest trainee he had ever attempted to teach, bar none. He didn't think this was on purpose, though. For even though she clearly didn't want to be here, she did try until she was black and blue. Even if she'd come here as a child, she'd have been clumsy, he suspected. But this business of learning weapon craft late in life, 
a task to which she was utterly unsuited, must seem utter madness to her. He didn't blame her for being irritated and unhappy. What was the point of putting her in this position anyway? She couldn't see without those lenses, she would lose them in a fight, and then she would be blind, and how was he supposed to train her to overcome that? Though there were tales of blind warriors with preternatural abilities in both Carsey and Valdemar, those had all been about men and women who had been trained since early childhood in their craft, who brought skilled bodies and the finely honed senses of hearing and smell and touch to bear on the problem of being unable to see. Not a middle-aged clerk who had been bent over a desk all of her life, she would arrive at the front lines only to return in days in one of those wagons, if she returned at all, which she doubted. She sighed and shifted her weight from one foot to the other, recapturing his wandering attention. Weapons, master, all due respect, but we both know I'm hopeless at this. It's a complete waste of your time to try and train me to use this. She gestured at the sword she carried, and she spoke in car sight. In point of fact, if it were not for the fact that she couldn't fight, couldn't shoot, and couldn't defend herself, she'd be in whites at this very moment. Self-defense was the only skill she lacked to enter her internship, for she'd known most of what a trainee learned long before she was ever chosen. There was nothing about the history of Valdemar and the Heralds that she didn't know before she came here. She mastered the fine points of the law with the indifferent ease of someone who had spent years copying legal briefs. In fact, anything having to do with the written word, including no less than four languages, was of no difficulty to her. And she was the only person besides Alberich himself who was a fluent and natural speaker of his own tongue, learned directly from old father Henrik before Alberich had set foot on the soil of Valdemar. There's a saying in Hardorn, she continued. You shouldn't attempt to teach a goat to sing. It will waste your time, hurt your ears, and annoy the goat. I can say without fear of contradiction that the goat is getting annoyed. He had to smile at that. She blinked behind those thick lenses, and emboldened continued. I keep asking this one question, and no one will answer me. Can you give me one single good reason why I have to learn weapons work? And because all trainees have to is not a good reason. After all, she set her chin mulishly, you don't make all healers learn weapons work, so why should every single herald have to? Since he had just been about to say, because all trainees have to, he found himself stymied. He opened his mouth, closed it again, and regarded her thoughtfully. Just what would you do if you were ambushed in the field? he asked. Run she replied promptly. I'd cut loose my saddlebags if I was mounted, throw away my belt pouch if I was afoot, and run. Chances are whoever attacked me would be after my things and any money I had, not me. I'd let them have what they wanted. Things can be replaced, and while they'd be scrambling after loot, I'd be getting farther away. That was a good answer, Cantor observed. And if you had to help villagers with a bandit attack, he persisted. She laughed. Give my advice and go for help, she replied. Not that anyone would be likely to take the military advice of a dumpy, bookish female who's half-blind, no matter what uniform she was wearing. But riding a larian, I'm as fast as any herald, faster than any other messenger. And once I'm within mind speech range of any other herald, I can relay my information. Another good answer. She's full of them, isn't she? She's full of something, he sighed. She wasn't intimidated by him, not in the least difficult creature that she was. She didn't care that he was Alberich of Carsey, only half-trusted even by the heralds. I know all about you from Henrik, and from Gary as well, of course, she'd said on meeting him, meaning Garrison, once acolyte, now priest. Gary, who'd become as much of a confidant as Alberich ever made of anyone. Simple sentences, but the way she'd said them had left him wondering just what it was that they'd told her. And later he wondered what and how much she had written down, for she seemed to be always writing everything down in little notebooks. She always had one with her. When she wasn't writing things, she stared in a way that made him feel she was memorizing everything so that she could write it down later. 
So how are you going to answer her? Cantor prompted. She has a good point. You're never going to make her into any kind of a fighter. You were just thinking that the first thing that anyone seeing her would go for is those lenses, and then what? Then she'd be blind, of course, and utterly helpless. No, she was right, very right. The best thing she could ever do if attacked would be to run away. Could running be the answer, then? It should never be said that Harold Alberich refused to find a better way when one existed, Cantor said. Besides, if she can't fight, they won't send her to the front lines. They'll use her to replace a Harold who can fight and send him instead. Put that away he said abruptly. You're right. I would be no kind of weapons master if I could not match the weapon to the student, not the student to the weapon. And escape might be the answer, however unlikely that weapon might be. Come into the salle, into the sitting room, and we will discuss this. He didn't miss her smile of triumph, not that it mattered. She wasn't going to get off as easily as she thought. There might not be fighting practice, but she was going to find herself training until she was in far better physical shape than she'd ever been in her life. There would be extra riding classes, for one thing. If her companion was going to be running, she had better be in shape to stick with him, no matter what he had to do to get away. And if she was going to count on being able to run away, Alberich was going to make her into a competitive foot racer whether she liked it or not. Some of that clumsiness, at least, can be trained away. She followed him into his living quarters. Daythor wasn't there at the moment. One of the healers was trying a new treatment for his swollen joints, a course of bee venom, for beekeepers swore that the stings of their charges kept the ailment away from them. By now, Daythor's bones were painful enough that he was more than willing to tolerate even the stings of angry bees in hopes of getting some relief. As a reward for his cooperation, he'd get a massage with hot stones and a treatment for his hands of hot sand afterward, something that did give him consistent relief, even if it was only temporary. Misty took one of the chairs in front of the window. Alberich sat opposite her. We need to think, he told her. We need to find a way to make the things you can do into weapons, running, for instance. He pondered that for a while. I'll trade you, saying for saying. In the hills in Carsey there's a proverb. The hound that chases two hares catches neither. If you're going to run, we need to contrive a way that you can create more than one thing for your pursuers to go after. Dropping my packs, she began. But what if there's something in your packs that you've been entrusted with? He countered. What if it's in the winter with no way stations near? If you drop your packs, you won't have what you need to survive. It won't do you much good to escape from bandits only to freeze to death in a blizzard. He brooded over the idea for a moment. Then the answer came to him. I think we should add a bit of extra equipment specifically for you. Packs and belt pouches that you're meant to throw away. What? she asked. Stuffed with straw or the like? He shook his head. No, not that, actually. If you drop worthless decoys, it won't be long before bandits and brigands all know that the packs you drop are worthless, and they'll ignore them and go for you again. No, that hare won't run. There will be just enough in the decoys to satisfy an ambusher, without making it look as if you're an especially juicy target, and to make certain that attackers chase the packs and not you. And the same for belt pouches. From now on, you'll be carrying at least two small extras, both full of coppers, and if someone attacks you, you'll throw them in opposite directions, one to either side of your line of flight. She was happy enough about the planning, but visibly unhappy when he brought her back outside and put her in front of the obstacle course. Run the course, then run it again, he told her mercilessly, and keep running it until I tell you to stop. Running away isn't going to do you any good if you can't actually run any better than Daythor on a bad day. And he left her to it, with a faint feeling of having, for once, gotten the better of her. Irritating woman. Not that he didn't like her. She not only had the advantage of being one of the few people he could converse easily with in his own tongue, she was an interesting and lively conversationalist. And besides not being afraid of him or intimidated by him, he got the feeling that she respected him in a way that was quite flattering, when she wasn't trying to get the better of him. 
Why was it that she entered every conversation with the goal of somehow trying to win? Well, she could just work some of that out over the hurdles. Meanwhile, he had a class of young archers to put through their paces. When he told Daythor of his solution to the problem of Misty over dinner, the weapons master chuckled. Good solution, Daythor replied. A very good solution. But I hope it isn't one we need to use. I'd much rather that the heraldic circle can find a position for her that makes the best use of her talents here in the city, whatever those talents are. At the moment, Alberich replied with just a tinge of sourness, having had to find reasons why every single obstacle in the course was one she needed to learn to negotiate. Arguing and writing, little enough of anything else have I seen. <laughs> I've seen those little notebooks of hers, Daythor blinked. Now why didn't I think of this before? Harold Chronicler, of course. Elkarth's doing it now, but we want him for Dean of the Collegium, and we need to start training him in that. His voice faded off as he got that faraway look in his eyes that meant he was thinking, and probably mind-speaking with his companion. Alberich now knew that look very, very well. And Dithor was right, of course. With all of his own reading of the Chronicles, he could see how being the Herald Chronicler would easily be a full-time job. It wasn't just the doings of the Heralds that the Chronicler covered, it was everything. Anything that had any impact on any part of the kingdom larger than a small village. What do you think? he asked Cantor. That it's probably the reason she was chosen, Cantor replied. She gets onto a story like a rat terrier and won't let go of it until she's shaken it free of all the facts. Annoying little dogs, rat terriers. All yap and idiotic courage. Or was that stubbornness? Still, come to think of it, that described Misty rather well. Or perhaps she was more like a cat. One of those mouthy ones that wouldn't stop caterwauling, came when you didn't want them and wouldn't come when you did. We're in nasty times. Someone has to be willing to put down nasty facts without editing them, Cantor continued. And you like cats. You like rat terriers, too. He ignored that last. Hmm, nasty facts like my little exercise tonight, he replied. It ought to be written down somewhere, Cantor countered. Maybe not for common consumption, but if someone doesn't record everything, no matter how unflattering to the heralds it is, the next generation is going to get the idea that we're all plaster saints. Then, when someone has to do something underhanded for a good reason, nobody will be willing to do it. He sighed. There was that. And plenty of chroniclers in the past had created auxiliary chronicles that not everyone was allowed to read. Chronicles that recorded mistakes, blunders, errors in judgment, and jobs undertaken that were somewhat less than the letter of the law, all in unflinching detail. Not the sort of thing one gave the children, of course, but these chronicles, and not just the standard texts, were what Alberich was studying as history. Just now he was in the middle of the very brief chronicle of Levan Firestorm. Some of the soul-bearing on the part of Harold Paul and King Theron was enough to make the heart ache. He could relate all too easily to the litany of should-haves and could-haves. Well, if trainee Misty, who was certainly being allowed to read and study the unexpurgated versions of the chronicles, was able to combine the qualities of detachment and tough-mindedness that the job required, especially now, well done to her. Elkarth probably wasn't. He was too tender-hearted to be unflattering to people he liked, even when it wasn't possible to get to the truth without being unflattering. Mind, only a handful of people would know that for certain within Misty's or Elkarth's lifetime, because the chronicles weren't written for the present generations. They were written for the future, and very few heralds other than the king and the king's own were allowed to see what their current chronicler wrote, and then it was in terms of editing by similarly tough-minded heralds, and only to ensure accuracy. As he knew very well, the chronicles could be extremely caustic at times, and no one really wanted to see himself, his presumed or even actual motivations, and his failures stripped bare and put down in uncompromising writing. 
In his opinion, a young person didn't have the perspective nor the experience to write what needed to be written. So there again, Misty was fully qualified. Appointing her as chronicler second would solve the problem of what to do with her very neatly indeed. Daythor abruptly came back to himself. I believe that will work, he said, as if Alberich had been privy to whatever thoughts were going on in his mind. You're going out in the city tonight. No other choice have I, Alberich replied with a shrug. Much result I do not expect, but so silver I must, a harvest of villainy to reap. In this at least he was able to aid Valdemar with a clear conscience. In disguise, one of half a dozen personae he had concocted and established, he prowled the less savory quarters of Haven looking for trouble. Trouble came in various guises, but money usually lured it out of hiding. The money wasn't bribes. Alberich was more subtle than that. Sometimes he posed as someone looking for a particular sort of creature to hire, sometimes as a bully boy looking for work himself. Sometimes he bought information, and sometimes sold it. In all cases, there was nothing to connect the less-than-honest characters he played in the seedy drinking houses and alleyways with Harold Alberich, the weapons master's second. There was some benefit in having a scarred and scowling countenance that looked the very acme of villainy. If there wasn't a woman born who'd give him a second look, no one looked askance at him in a low-class bar, either. And fortunately, there were enough foreigners in Haven that his accent caused only a little comment, and no one recognized it as Carsite. Most accepted his story that he came from Ruvan, Brendan, or Jakatha. All three were so far away, he might just as well have told the Inquisitive that he was from the moon. Virtually anything he claimed would be believed. The only people who might know better would be true guild mercenaries, and so far he'd never seen one of those in Haven. They weren't needed here. Valdemar fielded its own standing army of full-time soldiers called the Guard and always had. Even guild mercenaries didn't bother to go where there was no need of them. Well, you be careful out there tonight, Daythor said, putting down his empty tankard. Alberich automatically refilled it for him from the pitcher on the table between them and raised an eyebrow. Daythor wasn't known for having the gift of foresight, but one never knew. A reason for the warning you have, he asked carefully. But Daythor only shook his head. Not really. It's just that it's been quiet, and it's usually quiet just before there's a lot of trouble. And trouble then comes in threes, Alberich agreed gloomily. And a full moon there is tonight. I shall walk carefully. Full moon, Daythor groaned. You're going to get into a brawl tonight, aren't you? Alberich felt his muscles tighten with automatic anticipation. He suppressed his reaction as much as he could. Daythor was very good at reading body language. Probably. Alberich shrugged with an indifference he didn't entirely feel. A bar fight would at least give him something on which to take out his frustration. He always slept better after being able to pound some villain's face into the floor. The wretches that tried to pick on him were at least as bad as he pretended to be. The only reason they were at the tavern instead of jail was that they hadn't been caught at anything lately, and they well deserved whatever punishment Vacandis decreed they meet at the hands of his transplanted worshipper. Oh, very nice reasoning, Cantor said, with more than a touch of sarcasm. Try not to give the healers any more work, will you? Daythor requested with resignation. They had a few words for me the last time you needed patching up, and since I couldn't tell them why you'd gotten caught up, they assumed I'd been working with you and Kaimel with live steel and you'd gotten the worst of it. So, of course, it was my fault. That I can promise, Alberich replied, gathering up all the supper dishes and placing them in the empty basket. For that the wretches whose bones I break seeking a healer would not be ever... Too fearful would they be that in seeking healing it would be justice they found. With a salute to Daythor he left the rest unsaid and headed for the door. He couldn't help it. There were frustrations in him that were crying out for release. He wouldn't look for a fight, but if one came to him... He sensed Cantor's sigh. 
He left the basket just outside the door to their quarters for a servant to collect, and went out into the flooding light of the full moon to saddle Cantor. His companion was waiting for him at the special stable only the companions used. Just inside the door was the tack room, but Cantor's gear was all stowed on racks near his stall, just as it was for every companion who resided primarily at the Collegium. On a warm summer night like this one, all the half-doors on the stalls were open to the night air, and with all of the moonlight pouring in, the lanterns weren't needed at all. They were quite alone in the stable, which suited Alberich's mood perfectly. You've told Tavor and Talamir we're going out tonight? he asked Cantor, throwing only the plainest and most basic of saddle pads and blankets over Cantor's back. Of course. Cantor looked back over his shoulder as Alberich tightened the girth. We're going out the private entrance? Of course. Alberich swung up into the saddle and they made their way across the field. Cantor's hooves made no sound at all on the soft grass. They moved across the silver expanse like a pair of spirits gliding over the surface of a silent sea. There was a little gate at the far end of the wall around Companion's Field that would have been a dreadful security hole had it not been closed by three doors, the final one of iron, cunningly cast to look exactly like the rusty brown stone that the wall itself was made of. Only Talamir, Sendar, and Dathor had held the keys to those doors, and Dathor had given his to Alberich. Furthermore, the iron one was so heavy that it required a companion's strength to haul it open from the outside, and it wasn't likely that anyone with a horse or a mule was going to be able to get along the outer wall of the palace without a challenge. And then a would-be intruder would have to get his mount to push instead of pull. Not too likely, that. It was an amazingly clever door that actually could swing in an entire 180-degree arc but there was a spring-loaded stop on it that worked as a fairly high door sill to keep it from swinging outward, a stop that could only be dropped down level to the ground from the inside. So Cantor could push it to swing out when they were on the inside, but no one could pull it out from the outside. Locking the door released it again, and as Alberich turned his key in that final lock, he heard it smack up into place on its spring. There was no one on the road. But several times he looked up to see one of the guards keeping watch on the wall, so well hidden in the shadows that only he, who knew every hiding place along it, could have spotted them. He nodded to them and got a little hand signal in recognition. The palace guard, at least, now knew and trusted him. Of course, he'd trained a good many of them and bouted regularly with all of them. You learned a lot about a man sparring with him. Once Kaimel had accepted him, the rest had started coming around. He wasn't in whites tonight, and that would have made him instantly recognizable to the guards no matter what. He could have whites if he wanted them, but he didn't want them. He'd become accustomed to those dark gray leathers. They suited him, suited his nature, suited his wish to be something less conspicuous. As if you could be anything other than conspicuous, Cantor scoffed. When I'm with you, perhaps not, he acknowledged. You are rather conspicuous all by yourself. By alleys and shortcuts that only he knew, he and Cantor slipped quietly among the mansions of the highborn, then through the townhouses of the wealthy, and suddenly came out on a side street in a neighborhood of inns and taverns. They were only paces away from the Companion's Bell, a respectable inn that was their intermediate goal. Alberich felt that tightening of his muscles again, and a quickening of his pulse. It was time to go to work, work that he understood, work that he and only he could do. The bell had several distinct advantages for what he was about to do. Firstly, it was a place often frequented by heralds, so the sight of a companion in a loose box would not go remarked, nor would the sight of Alberich entering the stable yard. Second, the heralds had a private tap-room available to them. Heralds could and did mingle with the regular customers, but no one would think twice about Alberich not appearing among them, for plenty of heralds who came here kept to the private room. Ah, but then there was the third reason. He dismounted and Cantor followed him into the stable. There were two other companions there already who wickered a welcome to both of them. 
Excellent, Cantor said. I shall have reinforcements if you need them. Alberich snorted and left Cantor to make himself at home in a third loose box as he approached the far wall, and the third reason for his being here. The third reason for his being here, and no other place, was that the bell had a locked room at the back of the stable that contained a trunk, and had a second locked door that let out onto an alley, a very dark alley, and one that somehow never had patrols of constables or city guard at night. He unlocked the door. He paused just long enough to light a spill at the lantern beside the door, then locked himself inside. There was a second lantern there which he lit. In that trunk had been Daythor's disguises. Now it held Alberich's. Someone else, Alberich thought it was probably the innkeeper himself, had a key to that room for any clothing he left atop the trunk was taken away and laundered and placed back inside it. Some disguises, of course, shouldn't be cleaned. The stains, and yes, the odor, lent verisimilitude to his persona. Those he put back in the trunk himself, wrapped in a waxed canvas bag to keep from stinking up the rest of his gear. Tonight, however, it was about time for Arak Benshain, a common enough thug with a reputation for not asking too many questions of prospective employers, to put in an appearance at the Blue Boar. Arak was not too noisome a fellow. Alberich could get away with cleanliness tonight. Alberich opened the trunk and selected his disguise with care. Leather trues, battered boots and hat, scarred black leather jerkin strong enough to turn most blades, and a shirt of no particular color that was a bit frayed about the cuffs and collar. Over these he slung a belt holding two knives, but no sword. Arak did most of his work with his fists. That should suit you, considering the mood you're in. Cantor was not being ironic nor sarcastic this time. As a matter of fact, Alberich replied, it does. By day the tavern, that was his goal, the boar, was a quiet enough tavern, serving manual laborers at the nearby warehouses. At night, however, it took on a rougher clientele. Some of the laborers returned to drink away their earnings, and they were joined by others, for whom the warehouses were of less than legitimate interest. Arak fit right in there. He might hire himself out as a day laborer, if he was inclined to do manual labor or forced into it, but he would far rather serve as the lookout for thugs who planned a little late-night looting. Alberich let himself out into the alley. It was dark back there shadowed on both sides by tall buildings, but he knew his way around Haven even in pitchy black. He kept to the alleys for the most part, only crossing streets when he had to, and at length found himself in the warehouse area where the boar stood. There was a lot of coming and going around a warehouse, and no one asked what was being stored there very often. And of course, warehouses were full of things that were already packed for transportation. What could be more attractive and easier for a bold gang of thieves? Alberich had been recruited by such gangs once or twice, though never out of the Blue Boar, and never as Arak. He had hopes, though, and he nursed his thin, sour beer at a table here several times a moon, waiting to see if his patient fishing would catch him another gang of thieves. He opened the door quietly. It wasn't a good idea to make any kind of an entrance into the boar. There were always people there who would take that sort of hubris amiss. Flash of blue. A tangle of thrashing bodies on the floor. He paused just inside the door and caught himself. Damn, come on, don't show anything or you're dead. He shoved on inside the door on strength of will until his vision cleared and he could pretend that he hadn't just had a flash of foresight. The regular servers knew him by now, or at least they knew Arak's distinctive hat. He caught the eye of one, nodded at a vacant table off to one side of the room, and took his seat there. Within a reasonable length of time, the server appeared with a jack of beer. Despite Cantor's needling, he'd had a few hopes that someone might try to recruit him tonight. A full moon now meant moondark in a fortnight, and moondark meant the possibility of work. But the truth was, from the moment he'd crossed the threshold, he knew that Daythor had been right about a tavern brawl in the offing. 
even if he hadn't gotten that brief, very brief, glimpse of a tumble of fighting bodies on the floor of the place from his foresight, he'd have known it. There was something in the air tonight, something wild and edgy, something that made Cantor, back in his stall, prick up his ears and ask wordlessly, and in all seriousness this time, if Alberich thought he'd need any help. Alberich never actually got a chance to reply. He was just starting on the first swallow of his beer when the fight erupted over a card cheat three tables down. The cheater had friends, and the friends waded in, and Alberich saw... Flash of blue. The fight was only a pretext to rob the only person here with any real cash. That was the owner of the blue boar himself. Three people swarming the bar as combat seemed to thrust them toward it by accident. He came to himself long enough to dodge out of the way of a tumbling body and shoved his hand into a special belt pouch he always wore as Arak. It held weighted knuckle guards, his preferred weapon for brawling. He didn't like using blades in a brawl. He was there to immobilize people, not kill them. No point in killing them, when if they were what he really wanted, he wanted them alive to question. Another flash of blue, freezing him for a moment. The three thieves, he assumed that was what they were, waited for the fight to reach the bar and then threw themselves over it, the surprised tavern owner trying to get out of the way as they all three landed atop him. There were short, heavy clubs in their hands. They clubbed the tavern keeper senseless. Alberich shook his head to free it of the vision, as shouts and cries of pain marked the center of the brawl. A drunk, stinking of beer, blundered into him and made a wild swing at him. And that was just enough. Alberich sprang into motion like a mastiff held leashed and suddenly released. A savage grin with nothing of joy in it split his face. He ducked under the other's swing and gut-punched the drunk with his laden fist, stepping out of the way and shoving him to one side, to topple him before he spewed the contents of his stomach all over everything in front of him. Flash of blue, and he saw the three thieves vault over the bar and make off with the cash box, while a larger fight still engaged the bouncers and everyone else they could draw in. That was it, that was all his foresight showed him, but it was enough. When his eyes cleared for the third time, he saw the three men beginning to make their way towards the bar. Ha! Another drunk approached, got one look at his face, and flinched away. Alberich shoved him aside, straight-armed another, shouldered into a third. And when the three would-be robbers reached their goal, he was already there, waiting. They only saw one more temporary obstacle in their path and moved to clear it. They weren't very good with their lead-weighted clubs, which was probably why the clubs were weighted in the first place, and they hadn't practiced fighting as a team either. He managed to get the first two to tangle each other up for a moment by grabbing the first and shoving him bodily into the arms of the second. They weren't expecting anyone to reach for them. While the first two were shouting and tripping over each other, he stepped in toward the third came in low, and laid out his target with a brass-laden right to the point of the chin. His fist connected solidly with a satisfying impact that snapped the fellow's head back and sent him sailing across the floor to land over a table. It didn't break, of course. The tavern keeper didn't want the expense of replacing furniture every moon. The boar's tables and chairs would stand up to a charging bull, and the bull would come away second best. Now he felt it. That heady pleasure, which would be a guilty one later when he came to think about it. That rush of energy and unholy glee that only came during a fight. Fighting drunk, that was what Daythor called it. For it wasn't the berserk rage that wiped out thought and sense. On the contrary, it made him sharper, and he enjoyed it when he was fighting in a way that would make him feel a bit ashamed of himself later. But now, it widened his manic grin and filled his veins with lightning. When the first two got clear of each other, he grabbed them both and shoved their heads together with a crack that echoed even over the noise of the brawl. One went down, the other didn't. He was stunned, though, stunned just long enough. Alberich grabbed his shoulder and spun him around to face forward, pulled back his fist, and delivered a gut punch that made the fool's eyes bug out as he toppled to the floor. He looked around for the trio's friends, the ones he'd seen in his vision, 
But they, seeing that the cash snatchers were down and out, and there was no reason to continue the fight any further, began breaking free of their little knots of combat and scuttling away. He thought about pursuing. His blood was up now, and he was ready to chase down half a dozen of the young thugs. Chosen. Enough. You've ended the problem that will do for now. Cantor's demand cut across the fire in his veins and chilled it. He shook his head and backed up out of the way against the wall. With the instigators gone, the bouncers were managing to quell the remaining belligerents without any help from him. He slipped his knuckle guards off his hand and back into his pouch. Part of him regretted that the fight was over. Most of him sighed with relief. When the last of those still trying to fight had been tossed into the street, he gave the bouncers a hand with sending the unconscious after them. The three he'd done for were among them, but he saw no point in saying anything about what might have happened. After all, there was no proof. He accepted a somewhat better tankard of beer as his reward for helping out, and stayed only long enough to drink it before returning to Cantor. His glee was gone. His guilt had started, and besides, nothing more was going to happen tonight. If anyone was thinking of hiring Arak, they wouldn't do it tonight. The men he'd downed might have friends watching, who would take it amiss if someone rewarded Arak with a job. The moon was down by the time Alberich got to his hiding place, and he had to feel carefully for the keyhole to let himself inside. He discovered bruises he hadn't felt when he changed back into his gray leathers. Maybe you didn't, but I did, Cantor sniffed as he mounted. They'll heal, he replied, sending Cantor back up the street toward the palace. He felt as he always did after a fight, weary and with emotions dulled, except for a fierce and bitter satisfaction. The weariness was welcome. He'd sleep well tonight for a change. There was someone watching you from the corner, Cantor went on, giving him a flash of something that the companion had noted through Alberich's eyes. I think you'll be offered a job next time you go there. The bitterness eased a little. Alberich recognized that vague glimpse. It was someone he'd been watching for some time now, a legitimate businessman who somehow seemed to have more goods in his warehouse than he'd actually purchased. Now, now he might find out just where those goods came from. Good, he said aloud. That is why we come there, isn't it? Not entirely, Cantor retorted. At least you don't. Alberich started to reply, and thought better of it. Cantor was infinitely better at warring with words than he was. He let his silence speak for him, letting Cantor come to his own conclusions. Eventually the ears flattened and out of the silence came. I apologize. And you are also right, Alberich acknowledged. I do seek out fighting more often than necessary. I could go about the same business without getting involved in altercations at all. But it is what I need right here, right now. Cantor sighed, but his head nodded. So be it. If you need it, then we will continue to seek it, and I will say no more about it except to ask you to take care. Alberich closed his eyes for a moment. Perhaps some day we will no longer need to go hunting trouble for trouble's own sake. It was all he could offer, but Cantor seemed to find it enough. Nine. Daythor had invited Talamir to his quarters tonight, in a way that had been less invitation and more demand. Talamir was fairly certain that he wanted to discuss the current situation with his second, Alberich, the probable subject of those discussions, now officially a full herald, though he kept stubbornly to those peculiar grey leathers of his, was gone when Talamir arrived. Daythor interpreted his curious look correctly, not a surprise considering how well he and Talamir knew each other. There was a small fire in the fireplace, although the weather was not yet so cool in the evenings that a fire was necessary, but the weapons master seemed to crave both the extra warmth and the emotional comfort of a fire more and more often of late. Come to that, 
They all craved extra comfort. The wars seemed both too far away and too near. A feeling of dreadful tension underlaid everything, no matter how trivial. A frantic feeling as if whatever was being done had to be done, or enjoyed, or dealt with now. For there was no telling what the next day, or even the next candle mark, might bring. Small comforts took on enormous importance, yet one indulged in them in a spirit of guilt, quite as if throwing on another log was somehow going to deprive the guard on the border of heat and light. Daythor had lit only two lanterns, one behind each of the two hearthside chairs. The fire provided the rest of the light in the room tonight. The weapons master's second was nowhere to be seen. He's out, in town. Daythor said as Talamir looked inquiringly at the third seat that Alberich usually used. He won't be back for a while. I believe he's got something on the boil tonight. He's doing good work down there, Talamir observed as dispassionately as he could, and settled himself into the padded chair opposite Daythor's. It was difficult to be dispassionate about Daythor's bland statement— Every time Alberich had something on the boil, there was usually a great deal of violence involved before it was over. Alberich was directly involved in that violence at least half of the time. If Talamir hadn't been aware of just how much he despised unnecessary force, he'd have suspected that the man was seeking out opportunities to thrash someone. But perhaps he is, and he's simply making sure that the opportunity calls for necessary violence. That wouldn't be too difficult in the neighborhoods Alberich had to prowl. I wondered how much you'd kept track of, Daythor said. What with everything else you've got going on? All of it, I think, Talamir admitted. And he's as good as you ever were in the covert work, and better, far better than I. We are perhaps too much the gentleman. He fits in down there better than we ever could, no matter how much we deluded ourselves about our acting abilities. The words hung heavily in the air, and Talamir glanced out the window of the sitting room. It was moon dark, and a companion ghosted into and out of sight among the trees out there, a glimmer of white in the darkness. There's too many bloody bastards taking advantage of the situation to make trouble, or money, or both, Daythor muttered. You cut one down, and two more spring up to replace him. It wasn't like that when I was doing the dirty work. It was never that vile down by Exile's Gate. Talamir shrugged. They both knew that was true enough. Haven had been stripped of all but a skeleton staff of the guard. Constables and even private bodyguards had gone to join the army. The opportunities for the criminal and unscrupulous were legion. Alberich and a trusted handful of constables and the palace and city guard were accomplishing more than even the council guessed. None of it had anything to do with being a herald, of course, other than an occasional use of the truth spell and his communication with Cantor. Alberich never did anything that could not have been done by an ordinary constable, providing, of course, that an ordinary constable had his knack for subterfuge and covert work, which, of course, none of them did. There was only one Alberich. He couldn't rid the place of crime forever but every time he removed a criminal from the streets, it took a while for someone else to fill the void left behind, a breathing space for the constables still at work on the street. Alberich had a real flair for working clandestinely, something he'd probably never explored back in Carsey. Talamir wondered how Alberich felt about this new skill. It didn't seem to match the persona of a simple military man, as if Alberich would ever be a simple anything. It was never that vile, because there were never that many opportunities, Talamir pointed out. And what are we to do? Demand some sort of certification of virtue from everyone who passes the gates? Haul them away and question them under truth spell as to their motives? I think not. The best we can do is what Alberich is doing, and thank the gods we have him. The fire flared, revealing Daythor's troubled expression. You know the man's in a real mental state, Daythor said, leveling a long and accusatory look at his old friend. Talamir shifted uncomfortably, but his conscience forced him to meet Daythor's eyes. I have the feeling that he's overworking, just so he can sleep at night. 
I have the feeling that he's looking for trouble just so he can work out his frustration on a legitimate object. The problem is, when you start looking for trouble, it starts looking for you. Talamir sighed, deliberately looking down at the plate of fruit on the table between their chairs. Slowly and methodically, he picked up an apple and began to peel it. I know, he admitted. I wish there was something that I could do about it. But even if we hadn't promised we would never ask him to do anything against Carsey, the council won't allow him out of Haven, Daythor snorted, and Talamir looked up from his apple with reluctance. The creases and wrinkles of Daythor's face turned his frown into something demonic, and the firelight only amplified the effect. Damn it, Talamir! Can't you do anything about this? I know he wants to do something about the wars, and I see his face every time he watches another batch of youngsters going south. It's tearing him up. What? Vouch for him? I have a hundred times and more, Talamir replied. "'nettled that Daythor would even think he'd been doing less than he could for Alberich. "'Then there's the little matter of what he calls his honor, "'Which he's damned touchy about,' Daythor growled. "'Exactly so,' Talamir agreed. "'So what are we going to do? Truth here. "'I'd give both legs for a dozen Alberiches, "'all willing to go spying back there among his own people. "'Damned insular carsites. "'Strangers stand out among them like a chira in a herd of sheep.' Accents, mannerisms, what they know without even knowing that they know it? He threw up his hands in frustration. You just can't teach those sorts of things. Tell me something I don't know, Daythor said, throwing an apple core into the fire in a gesture of exasperation. Just how many agents have we lost? Too many. Talamir was just glad that none of them had been heralds. He had argued, successfully, that the heralds were too few to risk inside the borders of Carsey. But the fact was, from the beginning, he had doubted the ability of any of them to pass as Carsite, and when the sun priests got their hands on heralds, the results were traumatic for every herald. It wasn't just the death bell tolling that sent everyone into a spate of mourning. It was that everyone knew what happened to heralds that got caught in Carsey. There was a sick fear behind the morning, and the same kind of frustration and anger that sent Alberich out looking for a fight. The Lord Marshal had been perfectly willing to send in his own people, however, and when he did, exactly what Talamir feared happened. Carsey devoured agents as a child devours sweets. They seemed to last about a moon before they were discovered, certainly not much longer. What happened to them after that? Talamir was all too aware. He preferred not to dwell on it, for at least all the men had been volunteers and knew precisely what awaited them if captured. Certainly no more than a handful had returned. Horrible. And there didn't seem to be a great deal they could do to change that. No matter how much information they gathered on Carsey, no matter who they spoke to or how many old books they read, they were not able to fool real Carsites for long, if at all. What we need, Daythor said glumly, is what we can't get. Real car sites. Someone who's got all the little nuances, habits, all the things you just can't study. Someone who fits. Someone who can't give himself away. Because what's second nature to him is all based on real car site memories. But the few folk who've come over are all too frightened to go back. And I can't say as I blame them. The scent of burning apple, sweet and bitter at the same time, added a strange nuance to his words. Alberich wouldn't be too frightened to go, if he could. Alberich had everything they needed in an agent. If only they could use him. And the other stumbling block. If only his sense of honor would allow him to be so used. It was so intensely frustrating. Sometimes Talamir just wanted to howl with the frustration. If it was bad for him, it must be worse for Alberich. He was facing enormous pressure from those who didn't know about the covert work and saw only that he spent little time in the company of the other heralds and less doing anything that might help the war effort. There was even more social pressure from those who had no idea that the council had effectively shackled Alberich to Haven. There was a feeling from some that he had somehow betrayed the land that had taken him in, the brotherhood into which he had been admitted. 
But what could they do to change that? Nothing. Everything he was doing, other than his position as Daythor's second, was covert, and had to remain so. Especially the work with the Lord Marshal's agents, though for all the candle marks he spent with them, there was little enough to show in the way of success. But then, the agents were only men. Clever men, facile men, but just ordinary men. They couldn't be him for a day or a week, or somehow pluck the deep memories that made him carsite out of his head and plant them so solidly in their own minds that they became carsite themselves. Which brought him back to the problem all over again. If only they could make all those agents into little Alberiches. If only they could link those agents into Alberich's head, so that every time they did something wrong, he would catch them and correct them. And a blinding revelation hit him. Good gods! Talamir exclaimed, staring unseeingly at his reflection in the window. I do believe I have the solution. To which problem? Daythor asked skeptically. To the problem of how we can get effective agents into Carsey. Talamir replied, holding his half-peeled apple tightly. And to the problem of Alberich contributing to the war. You know how mind-healers are able to get into someone's head and do things with their memories, extract ones we need from someone who's unconscious, and all that. Once again, he found it unnecessary to explain to his friend where he was going. Mind-healer. You think they'd be willing to get into our car site's head and get his memories out, then plant them in someone else's head? Daythor looked interested, but skeptical. They're damn near as touchy about what's moral and what's not as he is about his honor. If he agrees, I can ask, Talamir replied. I lose nothing by asking, and if I already have his consent, what can they object to? And will those memories be real? Daythor continued. I mean, you know how faulty even trained memory can be. Memory isn't reliable, especially not childhood memory. Which doesn't matter, Talamir responded triumphantly. Not in this case. What matters are the little things that make him car sight, not the particulars. In fact, I wouldn't be at all averse to some inaccuracy, even a little childish fantasy. If we can make agents who aren't Alberich but are common car sight folk, all the better. Daythor brooded over the idea for a while. I'm not sure that could be done with the Lord Marshal's men, he began, sounding very dubious indeed. But Talamir shook his head. I'm not talking about the Lord Marshal's men, he replied. If this works, we can risk Harold's, and we'll have to. I suspect it will only work with those who've got mind speech. Ah, hellfires, Daythor was clearly dismayed. After a moment, however, he scratched his head and shrugged. I suppose you're right, and I have to think we'll get volunteers. I'd be shocked if we didn't. It was a depressing thought, actually. His yearmates, students, teachers, people he knew, rushing eagerly into the worst danger. It was bad enough for the Lord Marshal to send spies, but if the Carsites found heralds on their soil... Yet... If those heralds could pass as common car sites, and be able to discover and pass on what the Tedrils were going to do well in advance. The alternative, though, was not to be contemplated. Alberich was not the only one who thought that the Tedrils were engaged in a campaign to drain Valdemar until it was so weak that one tremendous push would collapse everything. They don't know us very well if they think we'll just collapse. Talamir thought grimly. They know us not at all, Taver said, although Talamir had not deliberately used mind speech, sounding just as grim as Talamir felt. But the cost of holding against them, never knowing when the push is coming, it didn't bear thinking about. So we must know what they are about to do before they do it, so that we can appear to weaken without actually doing so, then we can lure them into making their final push while we're still strong. That really was the only possible option. Sendar and the Council had weighed all the others, not that there were many. By emptying the treasury and conscripting every able-bodied man and woman in the kingdom, they might be able to mount a counter-campaign. 
There wasn't enough money in the entire kingdom to hire a force equivalent to the Tedrils. There is not enough money in all of Carsey twice over to hire the Tedrils, Taver reminded him. They are fighting for themselves, not Carsey. Carsey has not hired them, per se. Or at least they offered them something more than just gold. Carsey has merely provided them with a platform from which to launch a campaign to conquer a new homeland, and the resources to support them while they do so. Why do the Carsites hate us so much? Talamir asked aloud, in something like despair. Why? Daythor shrugged. Religion's at the heart of it, I'd guess, he opined. But don't ask me. Ask Alberich. Religion. What about Valdemar could possibly seem so threatening to a religion? There is no one true way, Taver said. That is what threatens the sun priests. That is what terrifies them. If you offer that to people, you offer them freedom— and you challenge those who claim ultimate authority. If you offer that, you give people options. The sun priests rely on being the ultimate, unchallengeable authority. Their lives depend on the very opposite of options. Their rule depends on their followers having no options, and relies on blind belief and even blind obedience. Perhaps, but how do they expect to keep their people in the dark? Short of building a wall around the country and guarding every exit point, there was no way of keeping people from finding out what was going on outside their borders. Ah, but a war builds that wall, doesn't it? Taver responded. You don't need stones when you've got an enemy. Interrupting, I hope I'm not, Alberich said from the doorway. He sounded exhausted. When he came into the light, Talamir took a good long look at him and decided that he was at least as exhausted as he sounded. Hmm, another fight? he asked. The weapons master's second was somewhat the worse for wear. He had a bandage across his forehead and another binding his forearm, suggesting that he'd already been to the healers, bruised knuckles, and other signs that he'd been getting into trouble down in Haven. Small wonder he sounded tired. Fruitful, was all Alberich said. But to drink, something wholesome, if you please. He made a face. The taste of sour beer to remove from my mouth. I very much please, lad, and get off your feet, Daythor said quickly, and Alberich limped into the room. Daythor tilted the kettle at the hearth and poured out a mug of mulled wine, handing it to Alberich, who sat down and accepted it, draining half of it in a single go. So... What did you net us this time? Smugglers, Alberich replied. Of vile things in, of information out. He raised a weary eyebrow. One leak less there is, and the jail full. He still looked troubled, though, and Talamir knew why. It wasn't that he hadn't done well. It was just that he was concerned that there were informants who were eluding him. Anyone that Alberich caught down in the slums of Haven would not likely be sending the most sensitive information. Not that there was any sign that there was such a leak, but they always had to assume that one could exist. Finding those leaks was Talamir's job. Alberich could not function in court circles, while Talamir could, cultivating a mild-mannered and quiet demeanor, saying little and all of that agreeable and sympathetic. He came across as unworldly and just a bit absent-minded. People confided in him a great deal, and generally had no idea how much they had told him. Nevertheless, there was no doubt in Talamir's mind that if saboteurs and couriers were to materialize in Haven, they would be living and operating in the area that Alberich was responsible for. Elsewhere, people were curious about their neighbors. In effect... Each little quarter outside of the most impoverished areas was a kind of village, where everyone knew everyone else and wanted to know what they were up to. Not so around Exile's Gate. The inhabitants were utterly indifferent to the doings around them, and with good reason. Those who were too curious often ended up on, at best, the wrong end of a beating. Plenty of damage can come out of Exile's Gate, Talamir assured him. Anything you do to stop it from traveling to our enemies is another arrow in our quiver. Alberich sighed. It seems like not enough. 
but he leaned back and accepted a refill and an apple, which he peeled with a frown of concentration, getting the entire peel off in one piece. The knife made a crisp sound as it passed through the flesh. If you were a maid, you'd be tossing that over your shoulder and looking for the letters of your husband's name in it, Daythor observed, as Alberich carefully set the long curl of peel aside. Alberich regarded him somberly. Is that so? In Carsey, such are for the children fried and dipped in honey. I have told you, divination a thing of witchcraft is. No Carsite maiden would dare such a thing, for the fear of the fires. Once again, Talamir was struck by how very different the Carsites were. A Valdemaran wouldn't think twice about tossing an apple peel, reading the tea leaves, wishing in a fountain. And that was the essence of the problem that faced the agents sent into Carsey. Have you eaten? Talamir asked, instead of commenting. More than just that apple, I mean. Alberich shrugged. Talamir took that as a negative, and made up an impromptu meal for him from the remains of supper's meat and salad and some bread. Since Alberich took it with polite thanks, then absently ate it in less time than it had taken Talamir to make it, the king's own was certain that he must have been famished. Glad enough I am to be rid of such filth as were locked away, Alberich continued, swallowing the last bite whole and absently licking his fingers. Only I wish it were more that I was doing. In the south, that was as good an opening as Talamir was likely to get, and he took it, explaining what he had in mind. He knew Alberich very well now. He didn't waste his breath in trying to convince the man of anything, just stated his case. He watched as Alberich's eyes took on that curiously unfocused appearance that meant he was discussing the idea with his companion. This gave Talamir plenty of time to study Alberich, and he didn't like what he saw. Besides the bandaged forehead and forearm, not his sword arm which was telling, there was a bulge beneath the sleeve, covering the biceps of that same arm that suggested another bandage, perhaps of a previous wound. The scars left from the burns on his face were crisscrossed by others now. That, as Talamir recalled, was a favorite tactic of low and dirty street fighting, to go for the face, figuring that the pain and blood that any facial cut produced would be such a distraction that it would be easier to go in for a kill. Not that facial scars were going to make him stand out in the neighborhoods and the company where Alberich was going at night. The opposite was true, actually. The more scars, the more he would fit in. Beneath the scars, the face was good, if carved on harsh lines. A long oblong, with a stubborn chin, high cheekbones, wide brow, heavy eyebrows set in a permanent scowl, aquiline nose and the eyes of a goshawk, fierce and wild, with the barest hint of something that was not quite sane. Or at least it was a peculiar sort of sanity that saw deeper into dark places and could stare into the abyss without flinching. Perhaps it was the curious quality that Alberich's eyes had of never being the same color twice in a row, varying from the gray of a threatening storm through a muddy green-brown to, as they were tonight, something close to black. For the rest? Well, there was no doubt that even in the company of heralds, who were a fit and athletic group, Alberich stood out. It was not that he had a perfect body, at least not in the sculptural sense. It was something else. The practiced eye picked out the quality of muscle, the way every movement was just enough and no more, the absolute stillness at rest, and the immediate response when one was called for. Every movement was exact. It was difficult to describe, but easy to see when one knew what to look for. There was a fine economy in Alberich's actions, not a bit of energy wasted, and nothing held back when it was needed. All of which, of course, came across as predatory and threatening, and probably all to the good down there in the slums. So, Alberich said at last, I will think further on this. It was a disappointing reply, but Talamir tried not to show his disappointment. There was nothing more he could add to his argument, and anything else would be nothing more than pressure that Alberich would probably respond poorly to. Seeking my bed, I should be, 
Alberich continued, rising and looking down at them solemnly. Daythor's second I still am, and their trainees always are. They bade him good night, and once he was out of the room, Daythor shrugged. Well, there it is, he said philosophically. It's up to him now, and hope he can find a straight path through all our tangles, Talamir added. "'wondering if he ought to begin praying to the Sun Lord just for a little help, "'and whether if he did, the Sun Lord would take it amiss and tangle things up even further. "'Alberich lay in his bed, hands tucked behind his head, staring up at the ceiling. "'There was no fire in his room, but a dim light from the lanterns and torches lighting the gardens "'came through the curtains at his window and created soft shadows, "'contrasting with the deeper pools of darkness among the beams. "'He was acutely conscious of little things, all of them so alien, "'so very different to the things he found ordinary. "'The crisp herbal scent of the sheets, not carcite serral, but Valdemar and lavender. "'The shape of the room. Long and narrow rather than square. The flavors lingering on his tongue. The cadence of conversation in the next room. All these things speaking eloquently of another place than the one he called home. And his mind buzzed with activity, though his body was still. This was a pretty little quagmire that had been set at his feet. Granted, he had been helping the Lord Marshal's men— but he'd done so knowing full well, having warned them all as well, that no one not born in Carsey, or at least raised there from early childhood, could ever pass as Carsite. Now he was punished for that, for that had been sophistry, a way of appeasing both sides of his conscience without having to compromise either, and he had known it. Now he was caught, and there could be no evasion. Either he could aid Valdemar against Carsey, or by withholding his aid help Carsey instead, knowing he was handicapping Valdemar. Such a choice, and at the moment he could see no way of acting or not acting that would not cause harm, violate his pledged word, or effectively cripple the abilities of those who had succored and adopted him to defend themselves, betray his home, or those who had saved him. Talk to me, Chosen. Cantor demanded. You've closed yourself off to me. Trust me as I trust you. Let me hear your thoughts. You won't like them, he replied mordantly. Perhaps not, Cantor countered. But at least you will be talking to me about it. Perhaps we can find answers if we both look for them. He took a moment to frame his thoughts. If I do what Talamir asks of me, I go against my oaths. And it is of no use at all to claim that the spies will work only against the Tedrils when my people are working hand in glove with them. Act against the Tedrils and Carsites will bleed. Little doubt, Cantor agreed, as he stared at the shadowy ceiling listening to the indistinct murmur of voices in the next room. But how are you being true to your oaths if you withhold help that could shorten this fight? You know that your sun-priests will not hesitate to add Carsite troops to the Tedrils in order to defeat Valdemar, and the longer the wars go on, the more Carsites will die. I have no control over what the priests do or do not do, he said stubbornly, and I do not know, not for certain, that they will order my people into this affray. What they do is in their own hands, and the will of Vicandis. I can only control my own actions— and I am the one who is responsible for what comes of them. He felt Cantor ruminating over that one. Well, he'd spent enough time agonizing over the problem himself, and it was the only answer he could come to. No matter what other people did, if he was to remain true, he could only do what he felt was right. Pah! Cantor said in disgust. Why must the right answers be so unsatisfactory? But Chosen, this might be right by your oaths, but must you remain bound by oaths to those who violated their responsibilities, not only to you, but to the people they lead? If I break those vows, he replied slowly, painfully, I become no better than they. Who will trust me if I break my vows? How can I trust myself? Silence again as Cantor considered this as well. This time his reply was only a frustrated sigh. 
I have no argument for you that would not also be sophistry, Cantor admitted, after the silence had gone on for what seemed to be a candle mark at least. Strangely enough, that reply brought him a modicum of relief. Cantor was with him. Cantor was at least as uncomfortable with the situation as Alberich was. But the companion was with him. Cantor, his best and truest friend in the world, was not going to use that friendship to try and persuade him of something against his conscience. Now all he had to do was argue with himself. He sensed Cantor thinking furiously and waited to see what the companion would come up with. I don't suppose, Cantor offered diffidently, that you could get some sort of dispensation from the priests of Vicandus absolving you of those oaths. Gary won't give that. He can't offer it on his own authority, and I wouldn't accept it from him even if he did. No matter what the sun priests down in Carsey did, Gary knew that short of an apparition of the Sun Lord himself, there was no way that he could absolve Alberich of previously made vows. And as for asking for some sort of message from Vacandis himself, he flinched away from the very notion. For whatever reason, the Sun Lord had elected to permit the Sun Priests to act as they were. Only he knew what was in his mind. Alberich could speculate, but here was the truth of it all. Who was he that Vacandis should appear to him to absolve him of his oaths? Only one man in exile. One man who could only prove his faith by remaining faithful. Chosen, Cantor said suddenly, interrupting his thought. Let me ask you this. Suppose, just suppose, that you were not bound by those oaths. What would you do in that case, if you were completely free to do what you wished to do? What would he do? I haven't thought about it, haven't even considered it. There was no reason to, he replied honestly, and then answered just as honestly, if I were free, I would aid all those agents without a moment of hesitation. I'd go myself if the council could be persuaded to trust me. In fact, I'd demand to go. Why? Cantor interjected. Why would you demand to go? That was an easy question to answer, for it was the sum of all of his turmoil. Because no one born and raised in Valdemar could ever be so careful of the lives of the children of Carsey as I. No one but I would care enough to take the extra effort to be sure no harm came to them. Alberich was no empath, but the sudden flood of triumph that welled up from Cantor was a thing so tangible that it felt like the beams of the rising sun reaching upward into the heavens at dawn. It so surprised him that he felt stunned, too shocked for words. But Cantor had words enough for him. Then chosen, Alberich, herald of Valdemar and captain of Carsey, make more of you. Make them out of the heralds that Talamir brings to you. Give them not only the things that Talamir wants, but the memories, good and ill, that have made you what you are. Do that, and they will be as tender of Carsite lives as you, and you could ask for no better stewards in your absence. He lay blinking for a long moment as the sense of that penetrated. Then he closed his eyes and considered the advice from every possible angle. And he could find no flaw in it. What better thing could he do for his people than this? How could it violate his oath to create more protectors of his people? Cantor was right. Cantor was right. Relief flooded into him with such force that he felt dizzy with it, and he clutched the sides of the narrow bed as it seemed to move beneath him. And when the feeling of release ebbed a little, he felt his face wet with unexpected tears. Oh, my people! Oh, my beloved people! I can send you protectors to take my place at last, at long last. He rubbed the tears away with his sleeve, swiftly controlled himself, and realized that the murmur of voices in the other room had not stilled. Daythor and Talamir, Sun Lord bless them, were still deep in their plans, searching for answers. Trying to find a way to persuade you without pressuring you, Cantor pointed out. Yes, they would be. They had been as careful of his honor as he was. More, perhaps, because they did not understand the reasons behind what he did. They only honored his conviction that he needed to do them. He got out of bed. 
It wouldn't be the first time he'd rejoined a discussion while in a nightshirt and sleeping trues. He made his way to the doorway of the sitting room and stood there a moment, silent, seeing again the strain, the care, the burden of duty weighing both of them down. At least this time he'd be able to lift some of that, not add to it. He cleared his throat and they looked up, startled. I believe, my brothers, he said, with a nod to both of them that acknowledged their kinship without unnecessary words. I believe, help you I can, and must. So speak you with your healers, and tell them, Alberich of Carsey wishes this most devoutly. He waited just long enough to enjoy the look of stunned shock and amazement on both their faces. Then he turned and made his way back to his bed, there to enjoy the first untroubled night of sleep he'd had since the Tedril Wars began. 10. The mind healers, with one adventurous exception, were not happy about the plan, which was not really a surprise. Alberich did not give a toss whether they were happy about what he was doing. All he cared about was that they had agreed to the project. The heralds he had recruited for his agents were a diverse lot, four of them which was all he would risk on this venture. He didn't know any of them well, which was another good reason for having chosen them. Three of them were too old for him to have trained. The fourth had been so average that he was entirely unmemorable. One sun-weathered, dark-haired man who was a tinker, and thus had all the skills to pass successfully as a car sight tinker. One, in his late middle age years, was from a family of herdsmen, and thus able to pass as another goat herd, who had been displaced from his home in the hills by the war. In fact, he could probably make a fine case for having had his herds confiscated by the Tedrils, leaving him with nothing but the meager possessions he could carry on his own back. The third was a youngster, a lad who had just gotten his whites, but he had three advantages. First, he was from a forester family just on the border near Burning Pines. Second, he had been an orphan, forced to take responsibility for himself from an early age. As a consequence, he acted more like a young man in his late twenties than one just barely eighteen. And thirdly, thirdly, he was smart. He had a strongly developed sense for self-preservation. He thought before he said or did anything. He, of all of them, was the likeliest to be recruited by the Tedrils themselves, and the most likely of anyone who had volunteered to be able to keep his head and stay plausible when within their ranks. There was something to be said for the type that has been knocking about in the world before becoming a herald in this case. The fourth was a woman as old as the old man. She would try to get taken on as a laundress or cook. Alberich didn't hold out much hope for that, but if she could, well, an old woman would hear a lot from the Tedril camp followers. Even if the Tedrils themselves didn't speak to women, the recruits were of the type that wouldn't be able to keep their mouths shut. None of them would have their companions with them. All of them were confident that their companions could stay out of sight but within call, so if things began to look the least bit dangerous— they could get out of the camp and escape before suspicion mounted to certainty. Alberich was quite certain of one thing at least. When they were done with these sessions, they would be car sight, or he would call a halt to the whole scheme. That was how he had sold his plan to the mind healers. He had to wonder how much they really understood what he meant, but he had to take a chance somewhere. No one knew how this was going to work, but the mind healer who had agreed to mediate the experiment had some ideas of his own that he wasn't inclined to share with anyone, not even Alberich. He had only promised this much. If what he planned worked, the heralds were not going to get Alberich's memories per se, and Alberich was not going to be reliving his own memories. I won't say anything more, he'd repeated stubbornly, no matter who asked him or how many times he was asked. I don't want anyone going into this with any preconceptions to muddle things up. If this works, it will work very well indeed. Though how they were supposed to enter into the situation without any preconceptions was beyond him. When the time came, Alberich appeared at Healer's Collegium at the appointed hour, with three of the four heralds he had recruited trailing in after him one by one. It probably would have been amusing if they all hadn't looked so serious, even apprehensive. 
He could have been a tutor or nanny trailed by his three of his four charges. They were sent to a quiet chamber that held two narrow beds and a chair between them, and stood, as Alberich thought to himself, like a gaggle of useless idlers, none of them particularly wishing to take a seat either on the couches or the chair. The young man still hadn't arrived there when Healer Krathak, long and lean and sardonic, appeared in the room to which they had been sent. Ah, good. I only need one of you volunteers at a time, he said, looking entirely too gleeful for Alberich's comfort. Hmm. You, I think, Orvin. Take a couch. Alberich, you take the other. Try to relax and close your eyes. The former herdsman made a bit of a face, and did as he was told, taking the farther of the two couches. In silence, Alberich did the same, taking the nearest. He closed his eyes and heard a creak as the healer sat down in the chair, felt a hand laid atop his forehead, and suppressed the urge to knock it away, and— And suddenly he was in Carsey. But this was not exactly a memory. He had never lived in this cob-built hut too small to be called a cottage, though he had seen plenty like it over the years. This was a typical mountain hut of the poorest sort, yet there was a poorer state than that in Carsey, and that was to be the lowest of the kitchen or stable staff, who had not even a scrap of floor to call their own. Scullery maids, cook's boys, they slept on the kitchen floor and ate what they could scrape out of pots, never washed except what parts of them got immersed in water when they scrubbed things, never changed their clothing until it dropped from their body. He and his mother had, thank Vicandis, never been that lowly. However, in this incarnation, it appeared that the protagonists of this memory were. A little boy who was him, and was not him, about three years old, was watching a woman who was his mother, and was not his mother, scrubbing the floor of this hut. A floor made, as was usual in these huts, of the scrap ends of boards gathered and pieced together. She did not own this place, whereas his mother had owned, or had at least rented, their little dwelling. This woman was a servant here, the only one, sleeping on the hearth, doing the heaviest of the work, taken on by the mean old woman who owned the place only because, in her outcast state, she asked nothing but food and shelter for herself and the boy that was him and not him. He looked through that boy's eyes, yet he did it from an adult perspective. Now he recognized the memory from the framework. If this had been his real memory, he would have been watching his mother scrubbing the floor of the inn where they lived. But this wasn't his village, it was another, in herding country, where he had served in his first year with the Sun's Guard. It wasn't an inn, for this particular village had been too small to have one. This was just one of the many little houses, with a bush above the door to show that it sold ale and food. He didn't recognize the woman. She was something like his mother, but mostly not. And although he somehow knew that Orvin was actually experiencing this episode as if he were the toddler, Alberich was watching it as a sort of dispassionate passenger in Orvin's head. This was fascinating. Living fiction. Except that Orvin was living it. Had he come from a background that was that impoverished? It could be. The mind healer could be taking both sets of experiences and melding them together in a car site setting. The bones of the experience were the same as his own. A group of fellows who considered themselves to be young toughs strolled past and decided to abuse the woman because of his presence, calling her whore and worse. True, she was not married and now had no prospect of ever wedding, True, she had not named his father to anyone but the sun-priest. But his mother, and in this manufactured memory this woman, were hardly whores. They sold themselves to no man, and had been so tight-lipped about the identity of Alberich's father that nothing had ever made them reveal it except to the priest. The boy knew none of this, nor did Orvin, who was actually living through this instead of observing it, nor had Alberich at the time. Orvin, from his childish perspective, only knew that the men were large and loud, and were making his mother unhappy. They frightened him, and he began to cry. Now all of this came with an incredible load of detail that Alberich had not even known was in his memory. The scent of the harsh tallow soap the mother was using, and of the wet wood of the floor, 
the beer smell from the cask just inside the door, the aroma of the peas' porridge over the hearth and wood smoke, the sharp, not-quite-spring scent of the air itself, the sour sweat smell overlaid with goat and sheep of the men. And that was just scent. There was the quality of the sunlight, thin and clear, giving a great deal of light but not much warmth. He somehow knew the look of the cobbles and the dirt path outside the door, the shape of the hut, with its rough cob walls, whitewashed sometime last spring, the whitewash shabby from all the winter storms, the shape of the other houses of the village, of the village itself, a straggle of houses along the road. He even knew the road, cobbled only where it passed through the village itself. Alberich knew where it had all come from. He'd seen dozens of villages like this one over the years. The story came from his life and the setting, but both were tolerably confused together, creating a new life entirely. It wasn't him. Orvin, taken back in his mind to the level of a toddler, was the one feeling all of this. It would be Orvin's reactions that counted here. The flood of external detail was giving Orvin plenty to take in. Internal, of course, was something a good deal more primal. The uncertainty and all the turmoil of a small and terrified child. Then he came striding up the path, as if the crying had summoned him. Tall, bearded, straight-backed, dressed in a long black robe with something bright and shining and immediately attractive to the wailing child on the breast of it. He wasted no time, verbally laying into the men in a voice like thunder, somehow making it clear that it was their good fortune he wasn't going to lay into them physically as well. There was a great deal of what Alberich, from his dispassionate distance, recognized as holy writ being quoted, mostly about the poor, the fatherless, and the repentant. There was also a great deal of writ quoted about the ultimate destination of those who abused the poor, the fatherless, and the repentant. And a curious thing happened. The more the man spoke, the larger he seemed to become, and the smaller the woman's harassers became. As they shrank into themselves, unable to look either at the woman or the sun-priest, that was clearly what he was, although it was Alberich and not Orvin who knew this, the woman took on more confidence. Since none of the thunder was being directed at him or his mother, the child calmed and crept near to her, and she hugged him close. Now go! the man finished at last, in tones dripping with disgust. And if you don't wish another taste of my tongue, find yourselves something godly to do for a change. They slunk off, exactly like whipped curs. Now the man came to stand over the boy and his mother. How long has this been going on, woman? He asked curtly, but not unkindly. She shrugged. Since he was born, Holy Father she replied in a resigned voice. Now the priest looked down at the boy. Then it is time I took a hand, he pronounced in a way that said quite clearly that it would be useless to protest. I will have the boy with me for two marks in the morning every morning. It is time he learned the ways of the Sun Lord, blessed be his name. And when the village sees that my eye is on you, there will be no more of scenes like this. Then he turned and stalked away again, and the memory, or more accurately, manufactured memory, was over. Alberich woke, suddenly released from the experience, and opened his eyes. He was as calm as he had been when he took his place on the couch, but from the tear streaks on Orvin's face, it was clear that he had experienced, and quite directly, everything appropriate to that young child in that situation. The healer was grinning with great satisfaction, so Alberich had to suppose that what he had planned had worked. But he put one finger to his lips, and motioned to Alberich that he should leave the room for the moment. Alberich felt a little unsteady, but did as he was told. The other three were waiting outside, sitting on a long bench, and looked up at him expectantly when he emerged. The healer pleased is, he said laconically, and left it at that. It was not very much later that Orvin left, looking quite composed for a man who'd been dissolved in tears only a short time ago, and the healer called in Alberich and the young man, Harold Wethys. The next three sessions were similar.
with Alberich serving more as observer than participant, but each setting being appropriate to the persona being created for the people involved, and rich with vivid detail. Wethy's had another mountain village, but his mother was from a forester clan, for instance, and for the old woman the village was down in the plain. Even the identity of the sun-priest changed, and Alberich had the notion that here, too, the image was coming from the other heralds, each of them contributing the face and figure of some authority in their childhood, trusted and wise. He was thoroughly exhausted before the sessions were over. But to his surprise, very little actual time had been spent in the enterprise, no more than a mark or two. But if he was tired, the others were completely drained by what was for them a highly emotionally charged experience. And it was just beginning. He wondered if they were already starting to regret volunteering for this. But although it was as physically wearing as a good long practice session, this first set was not as emotionally difficult as Alberich had feared. Well, truth be told, although he had known that the only way to make these fellow heralds into what he wanted to be was to give them bits of his own life, that was entirely what he had feared as well. He hadn't wanted to expose himself and his life to others so nakedly. But it appeared that somehow he wasn't going to. The others had no idea how much of what they were going through was really part of his life, and the emotions they were feeling were theirs, not his. Perhaps that was what had bothered him the most of all about this whole project. He had not wanted his feelings to be so exposed. If this was the healer's doing, then he owed the man thanks, more than thanks. He lingered while the last of his four volunteers collected himself and tottered off, looking dazed. Healer Krafik gave him a knowing look when he didn't leave, and leaned back in his chair, arms crossed. I'll save you trying to wade backward through our language and tell you straight up the answer to what you're going to ask me, the mind healer said with a grin that had just a touch of smugness about it. Yes, I planned this whole business of only using what you know to build seminal carsite experiences for our four victims, rather than taking your memories entire. It's all been very deliberate. I've got a lot of reasons for doing it that way, as much as for their sake as yours. You wanted the made car sight, not made into duplicate versions of you, and I didn't want them subsumed into your rather formidable personality, Harold Alberich. But most of all, I did not want you to have to expose yourself in a way that would have been difficult for you to come to terms with. Alberich let out the breath he'd been holding in. You knew, he said, with just a touch of hesitation. That you didn't want everybody and his companion knowing every sort of detail about your past? Krathak looked sardonic as well as smug, an odd combination. I'd be a pretty poor mind healer if I hadn't been able to pick that up, now wouldn't I? Alberich just shrugged. It was only the truth. At any rate, things will diverge more from here in the little life stories we're concocting, the mind healer continued, and scratched his head with a slight frown. How to put this? The powerful incident that formed you into what you are now will remain the same, and all of your background. But the way our agents will react to it, and the details of the incident will be driven by their own personalities. Am I making sense to you? I... Alberich hesitated. Well, never mind, you'll see it as we go along. The point is, the more we do, the less it will be anything like your own experience. The mind healer shrugged, stretched, and got to his feet. Then he paused, giving Alberich a long measuring gaze. Go do something, he said. Something purely physical. There's such a thing as thinking too much, especially for you. Since thinking was all that Alberich had been doing for the past several marks, the advice seemed good to him, and he nodded. My thanks, he replied, and went off to follow his healer's orders. Sendar coughed unexpectedly. Selene pressed down too hard on the goose quill, and it leaked, leaving a trail of ink spatters on the parchment. She cursed and tried to blot the damage, but only made it worse. She dropped the quill and made a grab for the edge of the parchment in irritation. Her secretary snatched it away before she could crumple or tear it to pieces, as she had two others. Let Krantz take care of it. 
her father said, without looking up from his own work. He has your notes, he has what you've written so far, and he should have been doing this in the first place. You don't need to be here, and you're getting hunched shoulders from sitting at a desk. Go do something purely physical. When she didn't respond, he looked up at her. You do not need to write every word of your judgments yourself. Krantz doesn't have enough work from you as it is. For Haven's sake, you don't need to replace the entire circle, clerks and all. You've already freed up two heralds from the city courts so that they can go south, and that is enough, Selene. He sounded exasperated, and he probably was. She was trying so hard, and in her head she knew he was right, but in her heart she kept feeling that she should be trying harder still. She rubbed one of her tired eyes, and let poor Krantz take the offending paper away to his own desk. It doesn't seem like enough, she said. She felt forlorn, but she was afraid she sounded sullen. I feel like anyone who isn't feeble-minded or sick or afflicted somehow ought to be there, not here. Her secretary, a young man who was nearly as short-sighted as Harold Misty and afflicted with wheezes when he ventured near anything in bloom, looked at her mournfully. She immediately felt even more guilty for making him feel guilty for not being in the fighting. My dear... Her father sighed. Selene, you sit in council with me, you're serving in the city courts, and half the time you don't let Krantz do his job. You're doing more than you need to, and probably far more than you should. Get out of here, into the sunlight, before you forget what it looks like and you turn into a troglodyte. She stared at him, blinking. He rose, took her hand, pulled her out of her chair, and shoved her forcibly out the door of the royal suite as the two guards at the door tried not to stare. The door closed behind her, and to her astonishment she heard him slide the lock slide home. And don't come back until your nose is sunburned, she heard Sendar say, his voice muffled by the closed door. For a single moment she thought about pounding on the closed door, demanding to be let in. The right-hand guard made a choking noise, and Selene swiveled just in time to catch him screwing up his face in an attempt to keep from laughing aloud. She knew him very, very well indeed. He'd played companion to her herald too many times to be counted when she was little. In that he had been more fortunate than most patient fellows who allowed toddlers to bounce on their backs. Companions were expected to have minds of their own and didn't wear bitted bridles and they didn't suffer being drummed upon by little heels when they didn't move fast enough. He'd bounced her off a time or two when she exceeded the bounds of the allowable. She made a face, but didn't comment, because there was great relief in being ordered to do what she wanted, but had been too guilty to pursue. "'Begging your pardon, your highness,' the guard said, composing himself. "'But I believe that sounded like an order. I'd obey the king if I was here.' He stared straight ahead, but his eyes were twinkling. She gave a theatrical sigh. Orders are orders, she agreed, and with a wink turned and headed for the nearest exit. Caryo, I'm on my way, she mind-called, feeling just a bit giddy, as if she'd been released from classes for an unexpected half-holiday. I'll need... Done. Your Alberich has been ordered off to gallop out his megrims by the mind-healers, Caryo replied cheerfully. Perhaps your father knew that already when he ordered you out. It wouldn't surprise me. You can both do with an outing. It could well be. There wasn't much that Sendar didn't know. It saved her hunting up her bodyguard and trying to determine whether he could be pried away from duties of his own, of which he seemed to have rather too many. If she'd been ordered away, she wanted to leave Haven altogether. She hadn't been outside the walls in, well ages, certainly not since the wars began. They wouldn't go far, not far enough that anyone could rebuke him for leaving the city. Not that he had a choice if he was guarding her, and she would point that out if anyone dared to say anything. By the time she reached the stables, Alberich was waiting with both companions, saddled and bridled. As usual, it was impossible to read him, and she had long ago given up trying. A destination you have? he asked, though it was more statement than question. Outside Haven, the home farms, she replied. The so-called home farms actually belonged to the three Collegia, and supplied the needs of hearth and table. 
There was a separate farm, the royal farm, that took care of the palace. It wasn't much larger, but it had twice the staff, for the palace tables required something more sophisticated than the vast quantities of planar fare devoured by the trainees. Selene was in the mood for simple, and besides, the home farms had the river flowing along beside them, and she had a notion to go fishing. After all, Sendar had told her not to come back until her nose was sunburned, and there was no better way of doing that than drowning a worm, as the old gardener who'd taught her used to say. Alberich just nodded. Evidently both Cario and Cantor were more than ready for an excursion, because off they set at the trot. They took a shortcut across the velvety lawn, briskly heading for the palace, curving around the new palace, and getting onto the paved drive in front of the old palace. This was the side of the palace that the working heralds rarely saw, and the trainees almost never. The façade of the building was interesting, showing as it did the old fortress face of the building, with its doors meant to hold against a battering ram. But it had been softened by a planting of formal cypress trees in enormous tubs, and was fronted by a paved courtyard centered by an octagonal pool and a geometric granite fountain and Selene had no idea what the material paving the courtyard and drive were. The paving dated from just after King Valdemar's time, when the need for defense had begun to take a secondary place to other palace functions. It wasn't cobbles or bricks, for there wasn't a sign of seams or joins. It was a solid pale gray, very nearly identical to the color the trainees wore, from edge to edge, and the feel of it was slightly springy. The entire pavement was surrounded by a wrought-iron fence, tall and formidable, like a row of linked pikes twice the height of a man, with the wide drive of the same substance as the courtyard leading up to it, and through a pair of gates that were usually left ajar. Nevertheless, there were guards stationed here on either side of it, with little boxes to keep the weather off them when it was truly awful. Alberich led her past them his back absolutely straight, his seat so easy that there was no doubt in anyone who knew cavalry that it was in the cavalry where he'd learned to ride. For their part, the guards did not seem to pay any attention to them, staring straight ahead. She knew better, though. They weren't there as ornaments. The drive went toward the tall, proper walls that surrounded the entire complex, velvety grass on either side of it, but no plantings other than a row of cypresses right up against the wall itself, the same sort of cypresses that were inside the fence. And there were yet more of them planted in boxes, arranged with mathematical precision on either side of the drive. The cypresses softened the look of the stone wall, and probably helped give the guards up there a little protection from the wind in winter, and shade in summer. There were more guards on the wall and on either side of the passage that led through it, both inside and out. This was still defensive. There were portcullises on both ends and a rather nasty murder hole in the middle, through which all sorts of unpleasant liquids could be poured down upon a would-be invader. Not so, incidentally, the murder hole had made a good place for a young princess to drop petals and peas down on unsuspecting visitors, with extra points awarded for the pea that landed squarely in the middle of a fashionable hat, without the wearer noticing. There was no one up there to drop peas upon them now, and they trotted through the cool shadow and out into the sunlight and down into the city. Nearest to the palace, Predictably enough, were the enormous mansions of the Highborn, each a smaller palace in itself. The farther one got from the palace, the less expensive and more crowded the buildings, until by the time they passed out the final set of gates and walls, for the city had outgrown its walls several times, and a new set had been built around the new construction that had spilled over on the other side, the final set on this road were a mix of shops with apartments above. Stables for hire horses, and inns and taverns. The road was not, however, a straight line to the final city gate. There were no straight lines to the complex within Haven. Everything had been laid out like a maze, so that if the city ever did come under attack, the defense could be fought street by street. Before the wars, that very notion had seemed laughable. Not any more though it would probably take having the Tedrils appear at the gates before the citizens of Haven believed that. 
Out yet another set of gates, with yet another set of guards, they went, following the river which ran under the walls at this point. Here the transition went abruptly from the urban to the rural, for this was where all market gardens that supplied the city with fresh eggs and vegetables were located. While the urban had edged out past the final walls outside other gates, here it had not, for the profit to be derived from such well-watered and fertile property was not to be trifled with. And here in the midst of market gardens suddenly loomed a true farm, the home farms, so named in the plural because they had been several smaller farms at one time. All of the buildings from each of these separate farms had been thriftily disassembled and reassembled in a central location. All of the cottages joined into one big building where the farm workers lived, all of the barns ranged around a single yard, and each allocated to one form of livestock. Even the hen houses had been moved, and were lined up in a neat little row, free-ranging chickens efficiently pecking up every bit of stray grain in nearly every weather, and cleaning up insects in summer. Here the river curved away from the main road, and the lane leading to the home farm's buildings ran alongside it. Behind the home farms, also watered directly by the river and situated on this lane, was the Royal Farm. But that wasn't Selene's destination. The Royal Farm was a showplace of its kind. The chickens, segregated by meat birds and layers, kept separate to keep their breeds pure. Everything on the Royal Farm was a purebred, from the chickens to the plow horses. Every building was spotless and immaculate. The hothouses were there for forcing flowers, fruit, and vegetables out of season. Pens of game birds were there, and exotic food plants too difficult to grow in quantity. Ponds of delicately nurtured fish for the royal table, even. Too formal for Selene today. The lane was clear, with not so much as a turtle on it, and both companions broke into a canter that took them all the way to the farmhouse. Selene found herself grinning as they pulled up with a flourish in the yard in front of the building, and even Alberich looked a little less mordant. The farm manager, an ancient fellow indeed, hobbled out to determine what they wanted, and when Selene explained her wish to fish for the benefit of the collegium tables, was happy to direct them to a shed where the fishing tackle lay. Eels, Selene muttered to herself, selecting the appropriate tackle, knowing very well that the collegium cooks made a fine eel pie. She looked askance at Alberich, who was examining the poles dubiously. You do know how to fish, don't you? she asked. He turned solemn eyes on her. No. Doesn't mince words, does he? Cario chuckled. Then it's time you learned, Selene told him ruthlessly and with a touch of glee. It's a standard skill all Harolds are supposed to know. You might have to find your own food in the wilderness, after all. And I in wilderness will be allowed? Not likely that. He sighed with resignation, or disgust, or both, perhaps. She didn't care. He might as well learn to fish. It wouldn't do him harm, and it might do him good. She spent the next candle mark or so in a position every trainee ever schooled by the weapons master's second would probably have given his last hope of the havens for. Schooling the infamous Alberich, playing stern and implacable tutor to the great Stoneheart himself, and it was highly entertaining as well. She presented Alberich with his pole, and had to show him how to bait the hook, and the formidable Alberich proved to be very reluctant to touch the bait. Now don't be so squeamish, she ordered, pulling a worm out of the earth of the bait pail and handing it to him. I've shown you what to do. It's not that difficult. He took the worm in his thumb and forefinger and held it stiffly in front of him. Must I? he asked in a strangled voice. She suppressed her mirth and instead fixed him with the same sort of gimlet-eyed stare he gave reluctant trainees. She didn't even need to say anything. He barely skinned the worm onto the hook, and she knew it wouldn't stay. Sure enough, the third time he pulled the hook up out of the water to check on it, the worm was gone. He glanced aside at her. She was pulling in eels at an astonishing rate, and already had a bucket full. She just gave him that look again, and nodded toward the bait bucket, without saying a word. 
With a long-suffering expression on his face, he probed the loam with a reluctant finger for another worm. By the end of the afternoon, she was highly satisfied with her half of the expedition. She had a fine mess of eels, far more than a mere bucketful, certainly sufficient to provide heraldic collegium with an eel-pie supper. She had a properly sunburned nose, but not so much that it was going to hurt later. And Alberich was... well, it was comic. The incredibly competent Alberich did have something that he couldn't do. He had caught exactly two fish, both of them little sunperch, and neither big enough to keep. He had lost most of a pail of worms, and it was a good thing that he hadn't hooked anything large, or Selene suspected he'd have lost the rod as well. He, who couldn't miss a target, couldn't cast a line to save his life. He, who was so dexterous with any weapon of any sort, tangled his line with appalling frequency. Mind he had managed to relax— if only by cursing under his breath at his pole, his line, the wretched fish that stole his bait. Practicing with his students out of doors as much as he did, he hadn't had a clerical pallor, but there weren't quite as many frown furrows cutting across his scars. She put up her gear with a sigh of regret. He put his up with a sigh of relief. The old man came to take charge of the tub of eels, which was as well, since she couldn't exactly take them back to the collegium in her saddlebag. Together they rode, at a walk this time, back down the lane to the road. "'How did you manage never to learn how to fish?' she asked him, after they rejoined the traffic on the road, heading into Haven. "'I should learn where?' he asked. "'When very young, helping in the inn I was.' Then it was in the academy, and fishing a sport for gentlemen is, or a subsistence for the poor. No part has it in training for a cavalry officer. He must have been very young when he first began to work then. And very poor, Cario told her, knowing that she needn't say more. Although fishing was traditionally a way for the poor to add another source of all-season food to the larder— the poor also had to have the time to fish, which clearly Alberich did not. The very poor also might not have enough to spare for hook, line, and bait. Besides, he added meditatively, Where lived I and served I? No great rivers there are. Swift streams only. Trout have I heard of, which great skill takes. Wealthy man's sport. Well, you've got the knack now, she replied cheerfully and was rewarded with his sour look. Then best it is that to haven I am confined, he said, and should fish be required of me, purchased at market they can be, else it would be starvation. She couldn't help it. She tried to hold back her snickers, but they escaped. He looked pained. Oh, really, Alberich, it's so nice to find something you can't do, she exclaimed. Glad I am that such amusement given you I have, he told her crossly. Perhaps a new title I should have, Harold Jester. She couldn't help it. He looked so irritated now that the giggles just burst out all over again. And finally, one corner of his mouth began to twitch, then both corners. Then, although he didn't actually laugh, he unbent enough to admit that the joke, although on him, actually was rather funny. And it wasn't until he had delivered her back to her father, sunburnt nose and all, that she realized that she hadn't thought about the wars once all afternoon. But what was truly satisfying, she also understood in a flash that in wrestling with worms and hooks and poles, that would not do what he wanted them to. Neither had Alberich. And that Sendar had sent her off to do something, at the same time that someone in authority over Alberich had evidently decided that he needed some distraction. So, perhaps her father was even cleverer than she'd thought. No, there's no perhaps about it, she decided, making her way back toward the royal suite. He's much cleverer than I thought. However, of all the thoughts that had occurred to her today— that was perhaps the very least surprising. Eleven. Outside the tavern a storm raged, effectively ensuring that no one would be leaving or coming in any time soon. 
Water poured off the eaves of the tavern in sheets, like a waterfall as the gutters overflowed. The rain spouts added to the mess, spouting like geysers, sending a torrent of water over the cobbles. It was cold out there, the temperature had plummeted, and the rain felt like ice water. Inside the tavern, those who were stuck here nursed the last dregs of their drinks and contemplated another. Or perhaps a nice pigeon pie, or a good slice of mutton. The innkeeper, anticipating the needs of his customers, had started a kettle of mulled cider, even though it wasn't the season for any such thing, and the spicy scent began to drift through the inn, turning heads and sharpening appetites. It was unexpectedly cozy in here, with a small fire going, just enough to take the chill off the air, and the ambience was a million leagues away from the atmosphere in the last tavern Alberich had been in. Alberich had come out of the secret room at the back of the stables here at the Companion's Bell, only to find that the storm which had been threatening all day had finally broken. Since he was effectively trapped here and starving, he decided to make a virtue of necessity and avail himself of the little private room reserved for heralds and their guests. Of course he was starving. He'd left before supper time, and you just didn't eat what was offered in, say, the broken arms. Not unless you wanted to have an intimate and detailed knowledge of the inside of the privy, sooner or later, when your stomach objected to what you'd put there. Granted, the indoor water closets at the Collegium were fine things, but not as a place for an extended stay. He'd already had his fill of people watching tonight. On the whole, he'd rather just sit back on a comfortable settle alone and watch the storm. Here, once he was out of that secret room where he changed his identity from that of a herald to any one of a half a dozen personae he wore in this city, and back again to a herald, he felt almost as secure as at the Collegium itself. It wasn't only the wretched neighborhoods he prowled as a cheap thug for hire, as a ne'er-do-well of dubious reputation, as a sellsword. No, he had some respectable personae as well. He was a small merchant in imported knives. He was a votary of some obscure god whose cult was so tiny that no one had ever heard of it. For good reason, since it didn't exist. He was an honest caravan guard. But most of his time was, admittedly, spent in places most heralds never saw, but the city constables and guard were all too familiar with. And most of it was spent accomplishing very little, but waiting for one or another of his patiently laid traps to catch something. Far too much of it was spent in places that could be called taverns only because they sold alcoholic drinks. And he thought he'd been served some wretched bruise as a car site officer. At least those had been drinkable. Rough, strong enough to lift the hair on your arms, but drinkable. Tonight had been one of those nights when nothing whatsoever happened, or was going to happen, except perhaps a common brawl or two. The threatening storm had made people think twice about leaving whatever cramped little corner they called home. People with only a single set of clothing had to shiver in it until it dried on their backs if they got soaked through. The taverns had been half empty, and none of his informants had poked their noses out of their holes. When the sky above the rooftops to the west began flickering with far-off lightning, he had given up. He'd hoped to get back to the Collegium before the rain began, but luck wasn't with him, it seemed. Then again, perhaps it was. Heralds were common enough visitors here in the bell that no one remarked on their presence. When Alberich arrived here, he didn't wear his trademark gray leathers anymore. He wore whites, which made him blend in with the other heralds who frequented the place. Sometimes a herald just wanted to get away from the collegium, have a tankard or a glass of wine, flirt harmlessly with a serving girl. And why not? Heralds, as Talamir took pains to remind him, were only human. Sometimes a number of friends wanted to get together when they all came in at once— there really wasn't a big enough room in the palace where five or more could put their feet up and talk as long and as loudly as they wanted. You could get food any time you wanted it, but it tended to be the sort of thing that could be fed to a great many people at once. And a bespoke meal, of exactly what one had a craving for, was something even heralds sometimes fancied. The innkeeper took him to the herald's parlor and showed him to a seat by a window— 
from which he could see, in the frequent flashes of lightning, rain pouring down as if it would never stop. A moment later a serving girl brought him hot pigeon pie of his own, and a tankard of the innkeeper's own bitter ale. It wasn't car sight, but it was close, and unlike the harsh brews of the mountains, it was good. The high back of the settle screened him from most of the room, which in any event was empty and likely to remain so if the weather continued to be this bad. There was no closing door to this room, and a low hum like a hive of drowsy bees came from the common room in between peals of thunder. The contrast between inside and outside was so striking. Storms like this commonly occurred in the mountains of Carsey, but this was the first time he'd ever spent one sitting in a comfortable warm seat with a hot dinner in front of him and the spicy scent of mulled cider in the air. He could remember dozens of these storms when he was a tiny child, when he'd huddled beside the smoking, struggling fire on the hearth in the middle of the room, while the roof leaked in a dozen places, and more rain dripped down through the smoke hole in the middle of the roof. The shutters would rattle with the force of the wind, and his mother would hold him close as she carefully fed the fire with the driest bits of wood to keep it alive. He didn't remember the ones when he was in the temple, though. That sturdy wooden structure never left him with the fear that at any moment the roof would blow away. But the ones when he was older, helping out at the inn? Yes. He'd be in the stable, helping to calm the horses, struggling to get doors closed, running all over with buckets to catch leaks. Or he'd be out in it, tying things down, bringing them in, and never mind the lightning striking near, too near, and the cold rain soaking him through. The academy was down in the valley, in a place that didn't get storms like that. But once he was out with the cavalry, oh, he lived through plenty more of them. Most of the time out in the open. You hoped for a chance to get your tents up first, and you'd wrap every blanket you had around your shoulders and watch the rain stream down off the edges of the canvas and know it would be a cold supper again. Being caught without shelter, though, was worse. The best you could do was get down in a valley, try and find the scrubbiest, lowest stand of trees, and get under them. You'd get off your horse, because with the lightning and thunder even a trained cavalry horse could bolt. You'd use the canvas of your tent as a rain cape, and hope it kept the worst of it off you, standing with your head down, one hand holding your horse's bridle up near his nose, the other holding the canvas just under your chin, shivering, both you and the horse. Oh, this was better, much better, like so much of his life since he'd come to Valdemar. And yet, it was not enough, and he was not certain if the problem was within himself or Valdemar. He was glad enough that there was no one here. It allowed him to be left alone with his thoughts. He was rarely truly alone for very long. I understand you've lost your first fight, said someone at his elbow. The voice was female, familiar, but he couldn't put a name to it immediately, for the words startled him so much. Eh? was all he could manage, as he swiveled to see who it was that had interrupted his solitude. With a fish! Harold, no longer trainee, Misty, amended, her glass lenses glittering with reflected lightning. She sat down across from him without waiting to be invited. A rather small fish, she added in carside with a chuckle. The serving girl, laden with Misty's dinner, set her dishes down opposite Alberich's, then she whisked back through the door to the common room, leaving them together. Ah, he found trying to see past those lenses rather disconcerting. You've been speaking with Selene. He found it a relief to speak Carsight. Valdemarin was still a trial to him, and he had the sinking feeling that it was going to take years, even tens of years, before he was comfortable in it. He managed with his low-class personae mainly by being taciturn, knowing that the people around him wouldn't recognize a Carsight accent anyway. It's more or less my job she replied. It's thanks to you I've got the job, I'm told, training with Elkarth and interning in the city courts with Selene as the senior judge. I'm Elkarth's second, and Elkarth believes I should be ready to step into the Herald Chronicler position within a year or two. Good, he said, and meant it. And what has my ignorance of fishing got to do with the Chronicles? Not a thing, she admitted. 
It just came up in our discussions. I just let people rattle on, you know. It's the most effective way to learn things. She paused and tilted her head to the side. I don't suppose you would be willing to rattle on at me. He opened his mouth to say no, then closed it again. It was an interesting thought. And this would go into the restricted chronicles? he asked instead. Possibly. Some things should be common knowledge, and by the time anyone reads my chronicles, all of those covert identities you've got now are going to be outdated. So she knew about what he was doing. Well, he shouldn't have been surprised if she was Elkarth's second. She'd be reading the restricted chronicles that he was writing. He wondered, knowing that she must know about the secret room here, if she'd come down on purpose to waylay him. She ate two or three bites, reminding him that his own dinner was getting cold. He started in on it. Delicious, as always, from the Bell's kitchens. Pigeon pie was a delicacy in Carsey. The only pigeons there were the larger wood pigeons and calling doves, hard to catch and reserved for those with falcons to take them. Here in the city, though, there were pigeon lofts everywhere, and the common rock doves bred like rabbits. It was rabbit pie that was the ordinary man's fare in Carsey, in fact. Rabbit pie, rabbit stew, rabbit half raw and half burned on a stick over the fire. I grew up on this, Misty said, gesturing with her fork to her plate. We had a loft in the backyard. I find I miss the taste at the collegium. Hmm, it is good, he agreed. Not common fare where I come from. Well, here, in the city especially, you make up your pies with whatever you have to eat for supper in the morning, and drop them off at your neighborhood bake shop as you go off to work and pick them up when you return along with your bread. Most people with small apartments or single rooms don't have a bake oven. In fact, especially in the city, most people only have the hearth fire to stew over, and not a proper kitchen at all. Misty didn't seem to want a response. She went back to her dinner, and he followed her example. It is much the same in Carsey, he offered. Save that there is no bake shop, or rather, the baking place is often the inn, and we steam food as often as stew it. He well remembered the smell of the baking rabbit pies in the kitchen of the inn where his mother worked. They'd come out and woe betide anyone who touched them, each with a particular mark for the family that had left them, and a star cut into the crust of the inn pies. He'd never gotten a quarter pie like this hot from the oven. He and his mother had been on the bottom of the hierarchy of servants, and were treated accordingly. First were the customers, of course, then the innkeeper, his wife and children. Then came the cook and the chief stableman, who got whatever intact portions the innkeeper's family left. Then the cook's helpers, the serving girls, the pot boys who served the drink. Then the grooms in the stables and the chambermaids. Then, at last, Alberich, his mother, and the wretched little scullery maid and turnspit boy. Which meant that what he got was broken crust, gravy, bits of vegetable, or anything that was burned, overbaked, or somehow ill-made. Too much salt, he recalled that pie only too well. But they got enough to eat, that was the point. Once his mother got that job at the inn scrubbing the floors, they never went hungry. There was always day-old bread and dripping, the fat and juices that came off the roasts and were collected in a drippings pan underneath. There was always oat porridge, plain though that might be, and peas porridge, the latter being such a staple of the common fare and so often called for that there was always a pot of it in the corner of the hearth. Peas porridge was the cheapest foodstuff available at his inn, and they sold a lot of it. When the pot was about half empty, the cook would start a new lot, so that when the first pot was gone, the second was ready to serve. All of the inn's servants could help themselves to a bowl of it at any time, even the scullery maid and the boy that sat in the chimney corner and turned the spit in all weathers. The innkeeper was thrifty but generous with the food, not like some Alberich encountered over the years, who starved their help as well as working them to exhaustion. Ah! Misty stacked her emptied plates to the side with a sigh of satisfaction. Alberich pushed his beside them. I don't mean you to begin nattering at me at this moment, Alberich. I just meant that when you feel like it, I'd be glad of your addition to the Chronicles. And I don't mind being a listener if all you want to do is talk. Think out loud, maybe. Or just talk to hear Carsite. He smiled slightly. 
Knowing your unending curiosity, I thank you for your patience. My curiosity has as much as it needs on a regular basis right now, Misty replied. You know, before Elkarth took me on, I was never satisfied. I wanted to know, not so much what was going on, but why. That was the thing that drove me mad sometimes. Why had this or that law been made? Why were your people such persistent enemies? Why? Well, there are always more questions than answers. Now I'm able to find out my whys more often than not, and more to the point, I'm entitled and encouraged to do so. She smiled and her lenses glittered. Maybe that's why I was chosen. I can't think of any other reason. He laughed. Is that why you were always such a thorn in my side as a trainee? That you could not be told to do a thing without wanting the reason for it? She shrugged. I don't take orders well unless I know why the order is being given. And I'll be the first to admit to you that I'm very lucky and have been unusually favored in that way. Most people can't afford to indulge that particular luxury. They either follow their orders without question or, well... There are unpleasant consequences for wanting answers. She rubbed her thumb absently against the little clerk's callus on the side of the second finger of her right hand, a callus created by hours of pressure from a pen. He nodded, wondering suspiciously if she was hinting at his past. The more I'm in the courts, the more I realize that, she continued. As a clerk, well, I knew why I was doing what I was doing. It was obvious— Pointless, perhaps, but obvious. She glanced up at him sideways. You know, you have to be a clerk, I think, before you realize just what a pother people make over nothing, and the sheer amount of ill will that people seem to think must go down on paper or die, dear gods. What, letters? he asked. No, people mostly write their own vitriol in letters. We're illiterate people, Alberich. That's mandated by the crown. Just as Carsite children are required to go to the temple for religious instruction, ours are required to get instruction in reading, writing, and figuring. No, I meant legal documents. That's mostly what a clerk handles. At least, my sort of clerk. There are others who do things about money, but I've never had that kind of head for figures. I saw a lot of wills. She sighed. A lot of wills. And depositions. And the documents involved in lawsuits. Well, since you've been acting as bodyguard to young Selene, you've seen what happens when something gets as far as the courts. He nodded again. But it is important to them. Some people have too much leisure, if that's what's important to them, she said sourly, wrangling over dead granny's best bed cover as if the fate of the kingdom depended on it, when all the while down there in the south... She couldn't finish. She just sat there, shaking her head. He thought back about all of the things he had observed while Selene sat, either in judgment as the principal judge, or as an assistant when she was still a trainee. I do not understand it either, he said, then added with a touch of humor. But then, I never had so many possessions that things took on a great importance to me. She burst out laughing at that. Whereas I have too many thieving magpie that I am. So I suppose I should understand them. Then again, most of my possessions are books, so I still don't understand why people would get into such a state over a few pence or a set of silver. She looked ever so slightly superior. And if it was dead granny's library that was in dispute? He asked shrewdly, to puncture that superiority. She saw it and bravely took the blow. There you have me, dead in the black. She laughed. Oh, look, the rain's starting to slacken up. He glanced out the window. She was right. The downpour had turned into something lighter, and the lightning had moved off into the far distance. It could just be a lull, he warned, as she made as if to get up. Could be, but I'll take my chances. I need to get back up the hill. I'm tutoring a couple of trainees. She did get up then, and he found himself wishing she would stay. He stifled an impulse to catch hold of her hand to prevent her leaving, but she seemed to sense something and turned back toward him. I meant that about nattering at me, Alberich, she said. You know, I don't put personal things in the Chronicles, not unless they're reasons for something happening, and it would have to be a pretty important something. And Alberich? 
Yes. Something had passed, was passing, between them. Something he didn't recognize and didn't understand. She stared at him. He sensed her eyes behind those lenses, oddly intent. You might try talking to Gary as well. After all, that's what he's there for, isn't it? She had an oddly wry smile on her face. Well, all things considered, that's part of his job, I think, to be talked at. And with that remarkable statement, she was gone. He sat there for some time in the half-dark, wondering why this conversation seemed to have, well, a feeling of importance about it. Perhaps because it's another herald? Cantor asked. He hadn't ever gotten such an odd feeling from anyone else, not even Talamir. No, it's not just that. She's not an empath, is she? Not so far as I know, his companion replied thoughtfully. But she does have one rather odd little gift. She doesn't have to cast the truth spell to know if someone is telling the truth, so long as she's in proximity to them. It's why she's in the city courts, in fact. Interesting. Perhaps that was why she seemed to be able to get the people to tell her so much. Perhaps that was why she was so focused on needing to know the why of things. If you always knew that something was true or false, maybe your focus shifted from finding out the truth to finding out the reasons behind it. If you knew that something was true, maybe that impelled you to talk to others as well as listen to them. Am I needed up the hill? he asked. Cantor would know. The companions always seemed to be more or less in contact with one another. Cantor's reply was immediate. No. And I've no objection to staying here in this nice dry stable if you have something you need to do. Shall I tell them you're going to be down here a while? Please do. Misty might not be the right person to talk to about some of the things that were troubling him, but she was right about one thing. Garrison was, and if he couldn't take counsel with one of Vicondus's own, who could he speak with? Tell them, he hesitated. If anyone wants to know, tell them I'm going to visit a friend. The Temple of the Lord of Light in Haven was a small one, situated between a saddlery and a chandler. Alberich thought the chandler a particularly appropriate neighbor, all things considered. Candles next to the Temple of the Light? He wondered if the Chandler knew. He'd gone back to the secret room and donned the garb of one of his more respectable personae, in no small part because that persona was possessed of a rain cape, an article of clothing that Harold Alberich had forgotten to bring with him this evening. Besides, it wouldn't hurt for Lysander Fleet to be seen here. It was one more layer in the persona. The duties of a sun-priest began at sunrise and ended at sunset, but Gary would be accessible for another couple of marks. Candle marks, he reminded himself. He had to start thinking in Valdemaran terms, or he would never get the hang of this confounded illogical tongue. The temple itself, though modest in size, did not skimp on illumination. In fact, it showed itself to be a most hospitable neighbor— at the gates of the forecourt, directly under the two large oil torches, were benches that were, in nearly every kind of weather but rain or snow, occupied by one or more of the neighbors taking advantage of the free lighting to read by. The forecourt was illuminated by six more torches, and there were benches beneath them as well, although normally only a member of the temple congregation was likely to venture in there to read. Or socialize. Henrik encouraged people to feel as if the temple was an extension of their household, and there were plenty who lived tightly packed into a couple of rooms with their entire family who were happy to use the space in good weather. The forecourt was a good place for meeting friends, taking very small children to play, or just to get away from the rest of one's family. They weren't uncomfortable benches, either, of wood rather than stone, though wooden benches would have been more in keeping with carsite custom anyway, and constructed with a subtle curve that welcomed a sitter. They glistened wetly in the rain, like great sleek river beasts looming under the torches that had been extinguished by the first of the downpour. With the torches out, the only illumination came from two lamps on either side of the door of the temple itself. That wasn't a lot, 
and Alberich cursed the invisible bumps and cobbles that made for unsteady and slightly slippery footing. He pulled open the wooden door and slipped quietly inside, trying not to disturb anyone who might be there. But the place was empty, holding nothing more but the presence flame on the altar and the sharp scent of the oils used to polish the wooden interior. The aroma sent a shiver and a pang of homesickness over him. All temples of Vikandis had this scent, since, except for the great temple in Throne City, all temples of Vikandis were made of wood. Polishing some of that wood had been one of his tasks as a child. Not that his old priest had any notion of taking him in as a novice. It was only too clear from the very beginning that Alberich had no vocation, and at any rate he would not have lasted five marks in the cutthroat game of politics that most sun priests played. But the scent brought back memories of his childhood, pleasant ones, in fact, which would have surprised people had they known it. Well, not his four agents. Thanks to his memories, they now knew what a sun priest should be like. A little stern, perhaps, but not unforgiving, a truly upright person. Gary came in after Alberich let the door fall closed again, and it did so with a hollow thud. The priest, for Garrison was a full sun priest now, just as Alberich was a full herald, peered toward the shadows enshrouding the door, and made out at least the basic form enshrouded by a rain cape. What can I do for you, my s Gary began as Alberich threw back the hood of his cape and stepped forward, so that Gary could see who it was. Don't call me your son, Gary, he admonished in car sight. You're nowhere near old enough to be my father. Keep coming at me out of the dark like that, and my hair will soon be white enough to pass for your father, Gary replied. Of all people, you were the last I would have expected to see tonight. A mutual friend suggested that I don't come visit nearly enough. Alberich felt himself relaxing in the familiar surroundings that said safe haven to his younger self no matter what had happened to him later at the hands of sun priests. Huh? Gary raised an eyebrow, then a hand. Well, in that case, since this is a social call, shall we take this to my quarters? Lead on. Alberich came up the aisle toward the altar. The sanctuary, the entire temple, in fact, was a harmonious construction of carved and shaped wood, from the vaulted roof to the parquetry floor. The bench pews were finished with finials carved in the shape of a torch flame, and the sun in glory was inlaid in very subtle parquetry behind the altar. The several woods used to create it were of shades so near in color that you had to look for the pattern and know what you were looking for in order to see it. More patterns, geometric this time, were inlaid in the backs of the bench pews, in the floor, in the altar itself, and these were anything but subtle. Every color of wood possible had been used here, and Alberich reckoned that the artisan in question was either now a very wealthy man, or else was a devoted member of the congregation doing it for the glory of the one God, for it was quality work and wouldn't have come cheaply. Gary led him in past the altar and the door behind the altar itself. This was a kind of robing room, with vestments hung up all over the walls. A door in the opposite wall led to the priest's quarters. Here, Gary said, motioning him into a tiny kitchen. It's warmer in here than any place else. Have a seat. Henrik's asleep, but don't worry about waking him. He could sleep through a war and a tempest combined. Do you want anything to drink? Beer? Tea? Tea, please, Alberich replied and watched with interest as Gary moved efficiently about the tiny kitchen, heating water in the pot over the hearth and getting mugs for both of them. I don't know why I haven't come here before, instead of making you come up the hill. He said that because the kitchen smelled right. Those were carsite spices he could taste faintly in the air, and a uniquely carsite black tea that was steeping in that kettle. There were sausages hanging up in the corner of the hearth, both for further smoking and because the smoke kept insects away. Sausages Alberich would bet tasted like the ones from the inn where he'd grown up. So what is on your mind? Gary asked. A great many things, Alberich replied, now fully relaxed, with Gary's good tea on his tongue. Tell something, though. What do you think about Misty? I like her, but 
she's deceptive. I don't mean that she lies, I mean that her appearance is deceiving. She looks and sounds harmless, but she's a hunter, Gary said instantly. She won't let anything stand in her way once she's on a scent, though I'm not sure what quarry she's stalking. Probably a lot of things, one of them being answers. Ah, uh, but to what questions? Alberich replied. She's stalking those, too. Why do you ask? Gary responded curiously. I'm not sure. Now that I'm not having to browbeat her into training properly, and she's a full herald and Elkarth's second, we're peers, so we're no longer in conflict with one another. She intrigues me, I suppose. It must be that instinct, one hunter recognizing another. She's the one who sent me here tonight, in fact. He took a sip of tea and savored the flavor. It was the right flavor, the one from his childhood, although the flavor from his childhood was a diluted version of this. I'm hunting answers myself. Gary regarded him with a somber gaze. You of all people ought to know that you aren't going to find many of those here. Questions, certainly, but precious few answers. Ours is a faith, Alberich, not a map or a guide, and certainly not a set of certitudes. At least, that is the way it should be, not what it has become. He said that sadly, and once again he was back in childhood, with that kind yet stern priest, who tried to show him in ways a child would understand just what the Sun Lord was and was not. We are the mirror of Valdemar, more like the twin, or we were before things disintegrated. Gary sighed. I've had this discussion with Henrik, actually. He is of the opinion that the long slide began with a will to power. I think it's more complicated than that. I think that the priesthood was corrupted by the congregation. Alberich blinked. How, exactly? The laity wanted absolutes, answers, and the priesthood finally elected to give them answers, the simpler the better, Gary replied. The writ took second place to the rule, and a poor second at that. The answers took away all uncertainty, and what is more, took away the need to think. Alberich frowned. Not for nothing had he spent so much of his childhood under the tutelage of a priest who knew and lived the old ways. Above all the writ demands that a man, or a woman for that matter, learn how to think. Gary nodded. You see, the old ways require that each person come to the Sun Lord having thought through everything for himself. The current rule requires that men become sheep herded in one direction, following one path, pastured in one field. Ever and always, so will it be. Sheep. It occurred to Alberich that it was probably no coincidence that the sun priests of Carsey had taken to calling their congregations by the name of Flock. Sheep don't have to think for themselves, do they? Gary made a face. The Sun Lord was reshaped from the unknowable into the remote but predictable patriarch, from the whirlwind to the windmill that grinds exceedingly small. Do this, you are gathered unto his bosom. Do that, you are cast into the outermost hells. Gary shook his head. Answers are terribly seductive. The simpler they are, the more seductive they become. Alberich turned that over in his mind, and found it certainly matched some of his own experience. But that isn't the whole of it, he objected. Of course not. I just suggest that this was where the corruption started, Gary replied. Then came the power, power that came from giving people what they wanted instead of what they needed, and power is just as seductive and even more addictive than any drug. Now, I don't know, Alberich, I don't know how it can be fixed, or even if it can. It would take the Sun Lord himself in manifestation, perhaps and someone as the son of the son who is willing to hold to the hard course and be disliked, even hated. And loved. And loved, Gary agreed. At one and the same time, and probably by the same people. Because when you demand that each situation be considered separately, and not responded to with the pre-digested answer, you're always going to anger someone, since you're always going to disagree with someone. Probably even someone who agreed with you the last time, and now takes this new response as a betrayal. Alberich smiled sourly. It would take the Sun Lord himself to protect someone like that. 
I fear so, and I am very, very glad it isn't me. Gary drained his cup and poured himself another, then smiled. So, since I am not going to give you any answers, what can I do for you? Give me an opinion, he outlined as best he could what he was doing with his four putative agents. They have seen the very best that Carsey is, in the form of Father Kentrock, my protector and teacher, and if I'm reading them correctly, they have warmed to him just as I did, and, more importantly, responded to his ideas of responsibility and honor. We're just about up to the point where I first learned I had a witch power. I suppose each of them will have a similar experience, but the witch power will be his or her own gift in real life. If you're wondering if you've somehow betrayed your vow to protect the people of Carsey, let me tell you now that both Henrik and I are positive you are doing nothing of the sort, Gary said firmly. If anything, you are going to put four more protectors in place, just as you hoped. Did you know that all four of them have been coming down here for practice in the language? Or so they say. Alberich shook his head, surprised. Well, they have. And what Henrik and I figured out after the first two visits was that they didn't want lessons in car sight. Their accents are impeccable, by the way. But an understanding of how our version of the Sun Lord differs from what they're going to encounter in Carsey. Something about the way he said that made Alberich stare at him. Oh, no, he said, feeling his heart sink. Please do not tell me that they want to convert. We wouldn't accept them as they are now if they did, Gary said with a laugh. No, actually, I think they're integrating their two personae. Then, once they know how things are now, they'll react as a carsite who was brought up in the old ways would. Alberich felt a profound relief. The last, the very last thing he had wanted to do was to change anyone's religion. That's sensible, Gary, he hesitated. Only now did Cantor interject something. Gary is your priest? This is surely a question for your priest. I'm torn, he said at last. It feels as if there must be something more I can do for Valdemar. Valdemar has given me so much. What should I be doing in return? Gary considered that question carefully. Albrecht, my friend, it is also my duty to tell you things that are true. You are doing as much as any other herald. Someone has to be helping to keep the peace here in Haven, and you are doing that. You still serve as Selene's bodyguard, and thus free someone else to go south. And in case you were wondering if you should offer your military expertise, no. No? That surprised him. But my training? One of the things that is true is that you are not a great general. Not yet, anyway. Valdemar has great generals, and it doesn't need you in that capacity. Gary gave him a look shaded with pity and understanding. Ah. Uh, he felt deflated. But, well... We have the Lord Marshal with decades more experience than you. Perhaps you have the advantage of training at the Academy, but we have the Collegium, which is, dare I say, just as good. It isn't only heralds who are taught here. Occasionally among the Blues there is a young military genius from the Guard, and the Lord Marshal was one of those. Ah, Gary was right then. He stared down at his cup. So, so other than doing what you are doing... You should be getting yourself prepared for the day when the king and the heir and everyone else that can hold a blade goes down to the battlefields of the south to hold off that last big push that you know is coming. Something about the tone of Gary's voice made him look up, because it was odd, very odd. It didn't exactly sound like Gary. Gary stared off into space, his face blank, his eyes looking elsewhere and Alberich felt an unaccountable chill on the back of his neck. There was something going on here, something he didn't recognize. You are Selene's bodyguard, Alberich, and when the day of that final battle dawns, she is going to need you more than she ever has before. Because the last, the very last thing she will think about is her own safety, so it is the first, indeed, the only thing that you must be concerned about. That is what you must be readying yourself for. Nothing else, nothing less. 
If need be, you must save her from herself on that day, so that you save her for her kingdom. Alberich had never believed those stories about how the hair on the back of someone's neck stood up when something very, very uncanny happened. Now he did, because he could feel that exact sensation. Gary continued to stare off into space with that peculiarly blank expression on his face, but something glinting in his eyes, and Alberich had the distinct impression that whatever was speaking it wasn't Gary. Which left what? Here in Vicondus' own temple it couldn't be anything inimical, but it sounded almost as if this was a prophecy. He wanted to speak and ask something for himself, wanted to ask a question, a dozen, but they were all questions he really didn't want to know the answers to, honestly. If I did, I'd be trying to tame that gift of mine and make it serve me predictably. The writ said that the future was mutable and unknowable, until one passed through it and it became the past. That was why the writ spoke against the witch powers of those who tried to predict the future. Not because the attempt to know the future was wrong in itself, but because being told a future closed some people's minds to the possibility of any other, and they focused all their attention, their hopes and their fears, on that future to the exclusion of other possibilities, which defeated the entire prime principle of free will, upon which all of the Sun Lord's writ was based. All this flashed through Alberich's mind in the time it took for the cup to slip out of Gary's fingers and drop to the table with a clatter. Botheration! Gary was back, startled, seizing a cloth and blotting at the spill before it escaped to make an even bigger mess. Look at me, wool gathering. I'm sorry, Alberich. No matter. The hairs on the back of Alberich's neck had settled, but not the uneasy feeling that something had wanted him to know more than he should about the future. A future. Except that we know there is going to be a final battle. We're planning for that already, and if I had taken thought about it, I would immediately have known that Selene would never consider her own safety under battlefield conditions. I haven't been told anything I couldn't have figured out for myself, have I? I should be going. My day starts early, and yours even earlier, he said, trying not to show any of his unease. True enough. Good thing for me that I'm a real lark of the morning, Gary said cheerfully as he walked Alberich to the door. Come by here more often, won't you? Alberich almost, almost prevaricated. Then he hesitated because the writ also said that when Vicandis wished the future to be revealed, or steered, he would find a way to do so. I will, he promised, and went back out into the cold, dark, and the rain. Ordinary things. Ordinary things. He didn't think he was going to sleep well tonight. Probably not for many more nights to come. Part 3 The Last Battle 12. He had been expecting it for months with a feeling of heavy dread and sick anticipation that put him off his food and kept him staring at the ceiling at night. All winter he'd worried and wondered, were the tedrils going to break with their pattern and attack in the winter? After that strange evening when Gary briefly spoke for Something else. How could he not have felt that the storm was about to break? He'd wished for an inkling that he was doing the right thing. And he'd gotten it. Nothing inimical could have used Gary as a mouth priest, not a sun priest, and not inside the sacred confines of the temple. Everything in the temple was sacred, no matter how homely it seemed. The Countess was the lord of all, from the sun fire to the hearth fire, and he did not scorn the small and commonplace. So even if what had spoken through Gary was not Vicondis himself, it was certainly some spirit that was doing so on behalf of the Sun Lord. Be careful what you ask for. Well, now he had it, and now he knew, well in advance of everyone else, that Sendar and Selene would go into combat, no matter who tried to stop them. Now he knew, and didn't dare tell anyone. Now he knew but didn't know when. 
He only knew it would be soon, but how soon? Every night he went to sleep on edge, and every morning he woke with the feeling that a storm was coming. And certainly this was what everyone, including the now successful agents, had been working toward all this time. To lure the Tedrils into thinking that the Valdemaran defenses were a hollow shell, and a single concerted drive would crack through. And thanks to the four that he had planted, when that time came, Valdemar would know as soon as the Carsite troops themselves did. They would know days, weeks earlier than they would have, before his four demi-car sites got planted successfully on the other side of the border. Yes, he was expecting it, but when the word came, it still hit him like a blow to the gut. It was Talamir who delivered the blow. That didn't make it better, but at least it was from the hand of a friend and delivered as calmly as that worthy could manage. It was early spring, or tail end of winter, take your choice. Raw weather in any event, the trees still leafless, though there were a few, far too optimistic for his way of thinking, that were swelling into bud. The snow was gone, but a bite in the air and the snarl of the wind suggested that it wouldn't be too wise to tempt fate by rejoicing aloud that it was gone. Half the days were clear and cold, half raining, that miserable, dripping rain that would come up without warning and then stay a week, and by the time it crawled away, half the collegium would be down with head colds. It never stayed clear long enough for things to dry up in any event, and it was a good thing that the trainees' uniforms were gray, because you couldn't help ending up with mud from the eyebrows down by midday, no matter what you did. Tail end of winter, he would call it, for all that the days were longer, and you could, if you searched diligently, find a few foolhardy crocus and snowdrops coming up in the gardens. Spring, and he hated to see it, because it meant at least another season of war. And spring came sooner the farther south you went. True, in the mountains at the border it actually came later, but once out of the mountains, or when you stuck to the valleys, spring was well on the way. Spring was no longer a season of hope and renewal, and had not been for some time. But would this be the last season of war, or only the latest? That was the question that hung suspended over his head like a sword. For the past fortnight he'd been running a cross-class with the horsemanship teacher, an accelerated course in fighting while mounted, and each day it had taken most of a candle mark to clean Cantor up afterward. All the companions had been mired to mid-flank and spattered above that line. He was cold as a frog, tired, and every time he licked his split lip he tasted mud and blood. There was no other way of learning how to fight in this kind of muck except to do it, though, no matter how much everyone hated it. He was looking forward to a hot bath with utter longing, and he trudged into the quarters behind the sow, expecting only to see Daythor and perhaps get a little commiseration before he went back to see about that long soak in hot water. It took him aback to see Talamir there. Talamir, sitting in one of the hearthside chairs and the sun still in the sky. For Talamir never was free enough to come back here before sundown. Talamir's expression told him the worst even before the king's own opened his mouth. He froze, feeling as if something had just petrified him in place. He knew. He knew. And it didn't take a gift to tell him. For a moment he couldn't breathe. For a moment he was stunned. The blow had fallen. The tedrils were moving. This is the season, Talamir said. And that was all he needed to say. So the bait had been taken. The misinformation believed. This season, as soon as the rains stopped, the rivers subsided and the ground was firm instead of mired, the Tedrils would make their all-or-nothing push. He'd wanted it and dreaded it in equal parts, and now it had come. He nodded, for there wasn't much that he could say at this point, other than, "'Know where do we? When?' "'When? Well, they're going to take a little longer than usual.' They're going to try and browbeat the car sites into adding troops. And if they can't get troops, they plan to demand money, so they can hire whatever non-guild scum they can hold together under a banner. Talamir sounded quite certain of that information, 
which meant that someone had overheard something he or she technically shouldn't have. They want shock troops to take the brunt of battle, so their own can move in behind undamaged, and they'll want a bigger base to move from than before, one that will hold all of their people and possessions in it, ready to move into Valdemar as soon as they take it. But where? he persisted. That was critical. When they knew where the Tedrils were going to come across, they could set up their own defensive lines on ground of their choosing. Not yet, Talamir admitted. Other than that, we don't think it'll be Holderkin lands. The last taste of them that the Tedrils got didn't seem to agree with them. Albrich's lip curled a little. He didn't care much for the Holderkin, but they had surely proved to be too tough for the Tedrils to digest. And it wasn't that they'd actually formed any kind of a defensive army, either. By law and custom, they kept enough food in storage at each of their holdings to keep everyone minimally fed for two years. And in that way, no single bad year could bring them to their knees. So when the Tedrils descended last summer, instead of fighting them, the Holderkin had locked every man, woman, child, and beast into their fortress-like compounds and sat the Tedrils out. After looting what little hadn't been locked up, and burning the crops, there wasn't much the mercenaries could do, except circle the walls trying to get in. That wasn't a very successful strategy, and they wound up getting shot full of arrows for their pains any time they got within range. The places were too small to justify the amount of effort it would have taken to breach those walls, and there was no real loot of any kind if you did. The Tedril recruits being what they were— they fought for the loot as well as the promise of a land of their own. Yet you couldn't leave the hundreds of holds intact if you intended to occupy the land. That wasn't merely asking for trouble. It was inviting trouble in and offering it a cup of tea, so to speak. So last season, when the Tedrils had tried to take Holderkin territory, the season had been singularly profitless and unsatisfying for them. Perhaps that had added to the impetus that impelled them to put in their final push now. They could not afford two lootless seasons in a row. Too many of their recruits were not fighting for a new homeland, and would break ranks and desert if they saw no profit coming for a second year. You couldn't even tempt them with the Holderkin women. If the walls were breached, as had happened in one or two instances, the ones that didn't kill themselves were slain by their menfolk. Given that the Holderkin would only follow precisely the same strategy a second time, it was vanishingly unlikely that the Tedrils would attempt the conquest of the entire country of Valdemar from there. It was far more likely that their plan was to conquer all of Valdemar, and then cut off the Holderkin, dealing with them one holding at a time at their leisure. I haven't much else to tell you, Talamir admitted, only that they've fallen for our ruse, that they believe we have been beaten down and depleted and that they are gathering every resource they can for that final campaign. Foreseers? Alberich asked. He hoped the Foreseers were getting something, although his own rogue and unpredictable gift hadn't even warned him of this news. Then again, hadn't it? How much of the dread he'd felt these past several moons had been due to his gift? It didn't always give him visions. Sometimes it only gave him warnings. The foreseers just confirmed that the agents are right. But since the decision was evidently made in their council a few days ago, and only just announced to the general troops, I expect that will change. Talamir sounded confident, and he had every right to be. Mutable and unknowable future. Well, perhaps. What the writ had to say on that subject was a matter of philosophy rather than reality, meant more to keep people from closing themselves off to all of the possibilities that free will gave them. And this was particularly true when Carsight writ met Valdemar in reality, and the gift of foresight, which, often as not, showed many futures, not just one. And if Vacandis really abhorred the knowledge of the future, would he have given me that particular gift? for Alberich, like the heralds, had used it to change the future he saw for a better one. He began making calculations in his mind, trying to reckon how long it would take the Tedrils to coax or coerce the Sun Priests into adding Carsite troops to their numbers, or, more likely, come up with more gold and silver, how long it would take to get all the supplies together for such a campaign, 
establish a base four times larger than any they'd had before. Then he realized that there were better heads than his who were already working on that very problem, and that their agents in place would be able to give Valdemar infinitely better information about what was actually happening than he could with what was only speculation. But there was one thing he could and would do. Two targets, and two only, they will have, should the king and heir the field take, he told Talamir and Dathor. Sendar to slay, and Selene to take or slay. Take Selene they would prefer, and sword wed to whatever leader survives. It is the land they want. Behead the leadership they must to take the land. Better still to behead the leadership, and make all right by wedding the heir. Live with their neighbors they must. Now he could deliver his warning, the warning that Gary had delivered to him. Dathor made a sound like a groan, and Talamir nodded. Just what I thought, and I told Sendar as much, the king's own replied bitterly. But trying to keep either of them out of the fight at this point is impossible. Stopping the Tedrils now is going to take everything we have, and Sendar believes that if he and Selene stay safe in Haven, we will lose the fight before it even begins. If they take the field, there isn't a man or a woman who won't fight better for their presence. And much as I hate to say this, I have to concur. With a sense of sick agreement, Alberich nodded. The warning had been delivered and heeded, but it clearly would make no difference to the king and heir. So... The warning was given to me, therefore it is I who must act on it. Then this I can do, Alberich said firmly. Heralds there will be, and guards to shield them in a battle guard. So to me bring them for training. To make the shield wall for a king a special skill is, and each man his place must know, and know that the right and left hand comrade will firmly stand. And he has to know how to fill in when the man to his side falls. Daythor seconded grimly. Alberich is right, Talamir. We haven't had a king go into combat in glory over a century. More, I think. I never was much good at history. We haven't had a battle guard in all that time. I don't know the strategy except from books. But trained the sun's guard is for such a thing, Alberich told them. Sun priests, red robes, and archpriests and hierophants we must guard if not the son of the sun, for into the vanguard they will go. When no use Sendar's battle guard, to me send them. Selene's battle guard I will choose, and Selene's battle guard and bodyguard I will lead. Remain here I will not. He was slightly appalled to feel his spirits rising a little at the prospect of a fight at last, and something he could do, action rather than sitting. But that was just it, really. It was a fight at last. No one could deny him his right to be in the thick of it now. He would be the leader of Selene's battle guard. No one could stop him now. So far as the palace guard members are concerned, I would just as soon that you chose for both Sendar and Selene, Telamir said thoughtfully. You are the best judge of them, since you work with them all the time. Then, not solely palace guard it will be, but city too. He honestly didn't think that there would be enough men in the palace guard who were young and fit enough to supply what he wanted for two sets of bodyguards. And that wasn't being snide, either. So many of the palace guard had resigned their posts to serve down south that men who had retired had come out of retirement to fill their places. Those old men were perfectly fit to stand indoor guard duty at a door— if their reflexes were a little slower than in their youth, they had a world of experience to take the place of fast reflexes. They might even be good enough to fight with the army as a whole, but they couldn't march like younger men, couldn't run like younger men, and hadn't the stamina that was needed for this job. Whatever, whomever you want, Talamir told him. I'll see to it that you get it, or him, or her. She heralds and she guards for Selene, can I get them half and half with men? said Alberich, and grinned fiercely to see the surprise on both their faces. Cha, thank you! No thanks from the princess would there be for clumsy men in her tent trampling. And with her they must be sleeping, and follow her other elsewheres, that a man should not go. You mean to guard her that closely? Talamir asked, his face reflecting an interesting mix of shock and approval. 
One man with a knife all our efforts can overset, he pointed out to them. Sendar, your charge is Talamir. Selene is mine. And, say I, guarded she will be in every moment of every night and day. Battle guard there will be, but also bodyguards, will she, nil she, waking and sleeping. He did not say that he expected Sendar would rebel over being so closely watched, and would disregard anything Talamir had to say on the subject. But Selene would listen and obey his orders, once he'd explained them. Thanks be to the one god. She wouldn't like them, but she'd obey them. Unlike her father, she could not disregard orders. He could and would have her tied up and locked into a secure tower if he had to. He hoped it wouldn't come to that, but at the moment he thought he could count on her good sense, especially when she saw her father being less than sensible. Cha, all it takes for a youngling of that age is to see the parent doing one thing, and it is certain they will try and do the opposite. How refreshing to have youthful rebellion working for him instead of against him. And perhaps, when Sendar saw his daughter being sensible, he would be shamed into sense as well. Not likely, but he could hope. You'll want Harold's Karen and Ilsa, Talamir said thoughtfully. Neither of them will be in the least impressed with rank and birthright. They saw Selene as a first-year trainee and helped me whip her into shape. Women there are in the city guard as well. And he couldn't help the wry smile. Locasti Perkin, Berta Lunge, and Hady Dellis. His spirit rose a little at the thought of recruiting those three to his bodyguard. Selene would have to be a deal older and craftier before she could outwit or overawe them. Daythor raised an eyebrow. Talamir chuckled. Oh, I believe I know those names the king's own said, matching Alberich's smile. They have night patrol around the Compass Rose and Virgin and Stars, don't they? And just last week Frog marched young Lord Raylard back to his father, then delivered a lecture to the old man that fair pinned his ears back, Daythor said with a nod. Or so I heard. Correctly, you heard. Impressed with rank, they are not either. Two heralds, three city guards, that made five— and with the addition of a palace guards woman who came to his practices who was called Lottie, if she had a surname, he'd never heard it. That would give him two women at Selene's side at all times. That would do for close bodyguards. For her battle guards and sendars, he'd want another ten or a dozen. Twenty or twenty-four good fighters. He'd have to think long and hard about who. These I need, he said, rattling off the names. Talamir nodded. Those six at once. Special training will they need. The rest from palace and city guard, I will make a list. Have it to me in a candle mark, Talamir said, getting to his feet. Send it by page. I'll have Sendar sign on it. That will cut through any objections. I'll have your six women report in the morning and the rest to you within the week. He would have liked it to be sooner, but that was probably the best that could be done. Replacements would have to be found, schedules juggled, and all of that took time. Time, which was now working against them. Selene I want as well, he added. Best it is that she learn her guards to work with. Right, Daythor agreed. And if we can get Sendar down here to work with his... Uh... He stopped at the grimace that Talamir gave. Ask for the moon and you're more like to get it, the king's own said grimly. If he sees his bed for more than four candle marks in a night now, I'll be surprised. So don't expect him to come down here for what's only a little arms practice. Then his companion we shall have, Alberich said in a burst of inspiration. One at least of the pair shall we train with. Done, chosen, Cantor said instantly. And you'll have Taver to stand in for me, because I must be with Sendar, said Talamir in the same moment. That way at least one half of the pairs will get some practice in this. The sensible ones, Cantor said. Alberich was not disposed to argue with that assessment. Six women, two in Herald's Whites, three in City Guard Blue, and one in the darker, near-midnight blue that marked the palace guard, stood at attention before Alberich. Three of the six were older than he by three or four years, and were probably at least as tough. 
but there was not a jot less than honest deference in their expression, and though all six of them looked sober, they did not look anxious. That was good. It meant that they trusted him, his competence, and his orders. You six have I selected, as Selene's bodyguards, he told them. Two each for each of three watches, day and night. Her side you will not leave while on watch, ever. He saw the two heralds exchange a glance, noticed a slight frown of concentration on Lottie's face. Now will I ask how paired you wish to be, and which watch you wish to take, he continued. Sensible you are, and know you that no less honor there is for the night watch than the day. If it's all the same to you, I think Ilsa and I ought to be on day watch, Harold Karen spoke up. Selene will have to be in on all of the battle plans and councils and the like, and, well, not to be rude, but Harold's will just blend in with the background. Meaning, no one will object to Harold's being there when some of the highborn might complain to see city guard, particularly women that they might have seen hauling their erring sons home drunk. Objections? Alberich asked, looking at the other four who shook their heads. That splits the night with us, said Berta. I'll tell you what, if it's all the same to you two, I'm used to the late hours after the taverns close, and I know that Hady and Casty are on, were on, first night watch. Lottie, think you could handle the dawn watch with me? The palace guard's woman shrugged. It'll take me a bit to get adjusted, but I'll manage. Well, that sorted itself out painlessly. Make it so, he told them. And once satisfied I am that your business you know, those watches you will take at Selene's side. Whether or not we're still in Haven, Harold Ilsa asked, looking surprised. Whether or not. Used to your presence I wish her to be. Invisible I wish you to be. Nods, no objections. What do you want us to do that we haven't done before? asked Lottie. He proceeded to show them. They were used to fighting back to back, but not when in charge of someone incapacitated or someone who needed to be kept in cover. They needed to learn how to find safe exit routes, at least two, the moment they entered a room or a situation. They had to practice defensive rather than offensive fighting. And later he would teach them quick rescue techniques— how to dash in and grab the air if someone had snatched her while she was still within reach, even if that someone had a knife to her throat. The time to get her away was not after she was in enemy territory. He hoped that at least one of each pair was a good shot. One of the best ways to rescue someone who was kidnapped was to shoot her in the leg. Someone who had to be carried became doubly hard to take. But he thought he would save that lesson for a time when Selene wasn't with them. By mid-morning, Selene had joined them. She was not at all happy about having bodyguards all the time, but she was reasonable about it. The same could not be said for her father, according to the terse report he got from Cantor. But Alberich didn't have to deal with her father. That was Talamir's problem, not his. He was just pleased that his six women were quick studies, a little quicker than he'd hoped, actually. The three from the city guard were especially adept in defensive strategies, perhaps because of their riot training. Students, crowds of layabouts and troublemakers, and drunks in fair season sometimes turned into mobs, and the city guards and constables were trained to deal with a mob in every manifestation, whether cheerful and manic, or surly and destructive. The two heralds had their own set of valuable skills, especially suited to their day watch, in no small part because they were used to letting their eyes skim over a crowd, looking for someone or something that was subtly wrong. The two heralds would have their companions to help, of course, and the companions made another good reason to have them on day watch. No one assassin, not even a group of three to six, could get past two heralds and three companions. And the possibility of getting a group of strangers past sentries and guards and other sharp-eyed sorts by day was vanishingly small. By night? Well, it was possible. But it would have to be very well coordinated, and the number of approaches to get at Selene would be limited. So once Selene joined them, 
Alberich concentrated on escapes, how to get her to where her companion could reach her, for once she was mounted, she was probably safe. Safer, anyway. Her companion could get her out of reach of anything that anyone could use at night, for distance weapons would be severely limited by limited visibility. Night Watch did have a different problem, for Selene would be asleep part of the time. The three city guards solved that problem for him, though, because they were perfectly used to manhandling semi-conscious bodies. Even if Selene was somehow drugged and couldn't be awakened, with a little luck they'd be able to get her out of harm's way. We won't eat or drink anything we haven't brought with us, they told him before he even asked. And we won't eat or drink at the same time. That way, even if someone's somehow managed to get to our grub, one of us will be able to see that something's wrong. He was quite satisfied with their progress when he dismissed them at the end of the first day. The bones were there of a good set of three pairs of bodyguards and a first-class set of battle guards. Even Selene was impressed and had worked as hard as they did in a role that did not come naturally to her, that of hiding behind others and allowing someone else to take care of her. Lottie was the last to leave, and she helped him to clean up the sow before she did. As the door closed behind her, he sat down on a bench in the sow, suddenly feeling exhausted. It had been a long, long day. The sow was silent, except for the sounds he made himself. The last blue light of dusk came in through the clear story windows up above and reflected off the mirrors behind him. He unbuckled the straps of his armor with fingers that ached from holding tightly to sword and dagger, and winced at the occasional bruise. Training the battlefield guards? Ah, that would be another question. He'd thought long and hard about it, and had decided to go with a mix of half-heralds and half-guardsmen, and had given the list to Talamir last night. He would head up the group around Selene, and Talamir would be the commander of Sendar's group. The most experienced fighters he chose for Sendar's guards, because on the battlefield the tedrils that came after Sendar would be going in for the kill. The ones after Selene would be handicapped as they would be trying to capture, not kill, so they would hold back somewhat. His people would have no such compunction against them. And he rather expected that Selene, once she saw fighting, would be eager to stay out of it. Not that he doubted her courage but she was a young and sensitive person, and battlefields were horrors. He was sickened by them, and he was hardened to the death and carnage. Once she got her first taste of real fighting, she should be perfectly willing to stay at the rear of the battle lines with the commanders. Alberich was not as sanguine about keeping Sendar out of the thick of the fighting, but then again that was not his job. It was Talamir's, and if the king's own couldn't manage it, no one could. Certainly not Alberich, the foreigner, for to some, perhaps unconsciously, even to the king, that was an issue. No matter how people felt about him consciously, somewhere down deep inside, the moment he opened his mouth. Perhaps if you worked on your grammar, Cantor suggested. Indeed, in my infinite leisure time, he retorted as he pulled off the armor he'd worn to protect himself. He had been the assassin for all of this practice, and as such had worked harder than all of them combined. He was in good condition, as good as he'd ever been, but, ah, it had been a hard day, as well as a long one. At least he'd been too busy to think, too busy to worry. Today he had neglected all of the trainees, leaving poor Daythor and a couple of the older trainees to conduct lessons themselves. Tomorrow he would have to do the same. And the day after... And the day after that, he sagged down on the bench suddenly with an overpowering sense of guilt. He was supposed to be Daythor's second, to take the burden of all of this off of the old man. Ah, Cantor, what am I going to do? he asked plaintively. I can't be in two places at once. And if you were not here, who would be teaching the trainees? And who would have seen to it that Selene had bodyguards? And who would be drilling the king and heir's battlefield escorts? Cantor replied. Someone else, of course. Daythor and someone else. Someone who wouldn't have Alberich's experience. Someone else. If he could figure out who that someone else might have been, maybe he could recruit him, her, to train the trainees. 
This last lot of trainees won't see fighting, he said after a moment. We've put everyone who's even remotely ready into whites by now, but they're still the ones that are a year away from becoming full heralds. There must be a dozen of them, and I've personally taught all of them from the time they came in as trainees. I can put them to teaching the younglings while Daythor supervises. Good answer, Cantor approved. And I can see to it that Daythor stays here, no matter how much he wants to go south with the full army, he decided, clenching his jaw. He'll fight me on it. But if the king orders him to stay, then, no matter what happens to me, there will still be a weapons master at the Collegium. He won't like that, but it's a sensible course of action. Cantor sighed. Mind, all he has to do is try one night in a tent to know that he'd only be a handicap and a liability. One night spent in something other than a warm bed would leave him a cripple. By that? Alberich knew that Cantor and the other companions were already plotting ways to get Daythor to make the experiment. Quietly, of course. Without anyone else knowing, of course. There was no point in embarrassing the old man. Or hurting his feelings. Good answer, Alberich replied, and levered his own stiff, sore body up off the bench. A hot soak, something to eat, and then... Do you think I'd be allowed to sit in on any strategy sessions? he asked. Perhaps he wasn't a great general, but there was only one way to get that expertise, and that was to watch an expert in the craft of war. Just slip in and stay in the background, and we'll see to it that no one notices you, Cantor replied. Well, that was interesting, and he'd better take advantage of it. He limped toward the door to his shared quarters. It was going to be a long night. The first of many, he suspected. The first of many, Cantor agreed. But it won't be alone chosen. Never alone. Talamir clenched his jaw and told himself that it wasn't wise to contemplate strangling his king. He sat rather stiffly in the armchair that Sendar had nodded him toward. He knew that chair of old. It was seductively comfortable, and it was supposed to make him relax. He wasn't going to allow it to. And he wasn't going to strangle his king. Sendar, he said instead, I'm fully aware that you are an accomplished king and leader, and under most circumstances you are perfectly able to defend yourself. But may I be bold and point out to you that you can neither remain awake from now until this war is over— nor can you do everything that you refuse to delegate, even though there are plenty of your humble servants who are perishing for something constructive to do. Therefore, you can resign yourself to the fact that you will have to sleep now and again, and will require bodyguards while you do so, and you will have to learn how to delegate. He took a deep breath and waited for the inevitable reaction. The king growled under his breath, something inaudible, but it sounded unflattering. Furthermore, Talamir persisted, if you intend to persuade your daughter to put up with her bodyguards, you are going to have to set her a good example. That, Sendar said, clearly and distinctly, is blackmail. The blackest, Talamir agreed. It's also the truth. He neglected to tell the king that he had pointed out the converse to his heir. If each of them thought that the good example she or he was setting was the reason for the other behaving in a sensible fashion, it would make everyone's job much easier. Although Sendar looked sullenly at him, recalling to Talamir's mind the rebellious adolescent that he'd been as a trainee, he nodded. All right, I'll accept the bodyguards, but I want to train with them, he said stubbornly. I don't think you're going to have a choice in the matter— I believe Alberich was going to insist on it. Talamir had the satisfaction of seeing surprise on the king's face. He's a very thorough fellow, is Alberich. He realized immediately that having a bodyguard doesn't do you a great deal of good if someone attacks you, and you don't know what to do, but they do. The wrong move could put you in as much danger as if you didn't have them at all. Selene, Sendar began, and was interrupted by his daughter walking into the room. Selene has been training with her bodyguards, she said, flinging herself down into a chair with a groan and a wince. Talamir noticed that her hair was wet. She must have just come from the bathing room. 
six of them, and the so gentle Alberich promises that it's going to get harder from here. I have, in the course of the afternoon, been thrown to the ground, thrown on to Cario's back, hauled about like a sack of wheat, and taught how to dive for all manner of cover. Not to mention done just a trifle of fighting practice myself. I'm quite looking forward to facing the Tedrils. They can't be worse than this. Talamir decided not to disabuse her of that notion. He just caught Sendar's eye and nodded. Sendar grimaced. Well, I'll be doing the same tomorrow, the king said, to Talamir's pleasure. Though how I'm to squeeze more hours into the day I do not know. I've already told you, and done so repeatedly, by putting the council meetings and any other business that is not directly concerned with the war into the hands of your seneschal, Talamir told him with a little heat, because he had been advising this very move for months now. That is what he is there for. You can't be two places at once, and if we don't win this thing, there won't be a Valdemar for you to reign over. Your seneschal is competent, unflappable, and far better at obfuscation than you are. If it's something he can't do, he is supremely good at stalling things until you have the leisure to deal with it. And what is more, he knows to a nicety what he can and cannot do. Delegate, Sendar, how many times do I have to repeat that? Sendar shook his head. I don't... Uh, he began, then shrugged. I will, but... And don't tell me that you don't like it. Talamir snapped, deciding to show his king and friend the edge of his anger. After all, Sendar wasn't the only person in the kingdom who was doing things he didn't like. I won't, Sendar replied, in a way that told Talamir that this was exactly what he had been going to say. What else do you want me to put on my plate? A speech. You're going to have to tell the people, of Haven at least, what's coming and I've never been the speech-maker that you are. That was certainly something that needed doing that only Sendar could handle. I can't write it, and I certainly can't deliver it. A uh, speech, Sendar sighed. Yes, that will have to be me. Selene, I advise you that when you take the throne, find someone else to write the speeches for you. I think not, she replied so somberly that both Talamir and her father shot a look at her. Speeches aren't just something that we deliver, as if we were mere actors. They have to come from our hearts, father, and there has to be truth in them. If they don't resonate from inside us, and they don't have truth behind them, how can we ever expect people to believe in us and what we say? They both focused on her at once. It wasn't so much with astonishment as unanticipated pleasure. She sounded like an adult. She was an adult, and she sounded like someone who had learned all the right lessons from her father. She returned their looks gravely. Platitudes might satisfy for a short time, father, but soon or late the people will realize they are being fed form without substance. What I tell them must be the truth, and I must believe it and I must hold to it. That is what you have taught me. I have learned far more from you than that, but that is one of the important things you have taught me by your example. He nodded, and so did Talamir. She knows. We've done our job, haven't we? He asked Tavor. We have. She may not yet have all the skills, but she has the spirit and the heart. Skill will come with time. Now, if they could just be certain of having the time. Thirteen. Alberich stood behind Selene's chair in an attitude that was a hair less than rigid attention. That slight degree of relaxation, he had noticed, tended to make people's eyes slide right over him. He had taught Selene's six, as they were calling themselves, that same trick. It was very useful to be ignored, especially for a bodyguard. The fact that he was in whites rather than his own distinctive gray leathers was helpful there. People didn't notice that it was the infamous Alberich there, because they didn't expect to see him in whites. Talamir would have been standing the same guard behind Sendar's seat, except that he had his own seat on the council. 
In this case, his place had been taken by Harold Jadis. Jadis managed to look as if he was no more than an interested bystander, and his guileless expression reinforced that impression. If one didn't know better, and only a few people did, one might well assume that was the case. Jadis was something of a surprise to Alberich. He would have expected the bard-turned herald to be one of the lot remaining behind at the Collegium, not skilled enough in warfare to be of any use in the coming fight. He would never have guessed that Jadis was as grimly determined to strike his own blow against the enemies of Valdemar as any guardsman, nor suspected that Jadis was a deadly swordsman. His skill with a blade was not something that had come to light until recently, as he had been out on circuit all this time. Daythor had remembered it since he had trained Jadis himself. He was the one who had recommended Jadis as one of Sendar's bodyguards. There was an interesting twist to his talent with a blade. Jadis fought with a light rapier rather than the commoner broadsword, but such a weapon was much more useful in a situation of close combat. Useful, too, within four walls, or any other crowded situation. Daythor had called Jadis in to work with Alberich, and both of them had immediately suggested that Talamir assign Jadis as one of the king's six personal guards. The more heralds they had in those positions, the better. Sendar was more likely to listen to a herald than a guardsman. Not that the king was likely to listen to anyone if their advice went against something he felt strongly about, but a herald was more likely than anyone else to get him to stop and think before he acted. But Jadis was not the only surprise. Another of Sendar's bodyguards was a healer. In fact, it was the same mind healer, Krathak, who had mediated the transfer of all of those memories from Alberich to the Four Spies. Krathak was also a wicked bladesman, although he favored a two-handed style with knives instead of longer weapons, and his skill was such that he had been able to teach Alberich a trick or two. He came to Alberich himself to demonstrate his skills, and volunteer his services at something besides healing. You don't want a healer angry at you, he'd said when Alberich questioned him on whether he could bring himself to kill with those knives. A healer knows how you're put together, and what will hurt the most. I've been working with the severely wounded ever since all this started. His eyes had glinted. And this healer is very, very angry at the Tedrils. Alberich often wondered just what had made Krathak, a healer, into someone who could say that and look Alberich straight in the eyes while doing so. But he of all people understood a wish to keep one's past private and unless Krathak volunteered the information, he was not going to ask. He probably hadn't expected to be made one of the king's personal bodyguards, but he adapted immediately. And Alberich was not at all unhappy about having someone who was also a healer serving as a bodyguard, especially a mind healer who had ways of dealing with a king who was reluctant to rest when he needed to. It was a convenient assignment to have the healer taking the latest of the two night watches, along with one of Sendar's former squires, knighted just after Alberich had come to the Collegium. The lad had then been sent by his father on some mission or other, and hadn't come back to Haven until a few moons ago. Alberich had anticipated a certain amount of trouble from that one, but all he'd gotten was respect. Evidently the young buck had gotten some of the arrogance knocked out of him. Just as well, any arrogance the young bucks of Valdemar still had was about to get knocked out of all of them, and for some of them, the experience would be fatal. The less arrogance, the better the chance at surviving until all this was over. What Sendar and Talamir and the Lord Marshal were doing at this meeting was to give the rest of the council a thorough briefing on absolutely everything that they had all learned, from spies— farseers, foreseers, and anyone else whose word they thought was trustworthy. The Tedrils were in the process of establishing their final base for attack just across the border in Carsey, and the size of it made Alberich grow cold all over. So far they had done nothing but prepare. It was not yet a campaign, much less a war, and that did not bode well either. This was to be an invasion— and as such, the preparations were being taken with all of the care that decades of detailed planning could ensure. They had been working toward this moment for, well, years, decades at least. 
Alberich had known better than to hope that their focus had diminished over the years. Their shock troops might be a combination of the dregs of the mercenary trade, criminals who sought sanctuary in their ranks, and whatever young men they could recruit with promises of adventure, excitement, and easy money. But the core was the Tedral Nation, whose longing for a new homeland had only strengthened the longer that they went without a home. If anything, the increase had been exponential with the land of Valdemar in their sight. The bitterness of those thrown out of their homeland by their enemies had been distilled by the years. Now it was as much of a weapon as the swords, spears, and arrows in the hands of the army. And they had done something very clever this final season. Carsey was used to their strategy of making a base from which they could strike into Valdemar, and didn't think twice about it when, once again, the Tedril commanders had set about establishing yet another. But this time, with the Carsites lulled into complacency, they had built up their own troops and established a base that could be used equally well to strike at Valdemar or Carsey then made it clear to their erstwhile allies that they did not particularly care if further aid was delivered voluntarily or wrested from the sun-priests by force. The sun-priests must have been shocked to discover the monster they themselves had created sitting on their doorstep, not to be budged, reasoned with, or countered, demanding that it be fed, and fed royally. That much Alberich and the others knew from the spies. And although he could not know this for certain, he was fairly sure that the Carsite treasury had been emptied, literally and completely, into the Tedril coffers, until even the rapacious maw of their army was sated. Shocked and dismayed, utterly undone and perhaps in a panic when they realized the position they had put themselves in, their first thought would be of self-defense. The coffers could be refilled, but if the Tedrils came in force to take what they wanted, they probably wouldn't stop with taking the gold and silver in the treasury. They would go on to help themselves to the personal treasures of the high-ranking priests, at the very least. Supplies, the lifeblood of an army, were pouring in, and the means to transport those supplies, just as important, were not lacking either. If there was a cart or a beast in all of Carsey that was not in the hands of the Tedrils, it was not for lack of money or effort. Trade had slowed to a crawl as carters, draymen, and teamsters flocked to make a small army of their own in the ranks of the Tedrils. Merchants couldn't find anyone to carry their goods. Farmers were having to transport their own foodstuffs to market. The silver lure held out to recruit these notoriously independent souls was augmented by the guarantee that they would be sacrosanct, that no one could or would force them into the ranks of the soldiery. They would not fight. They would be guarded by fighters. The supply lines would roll, fat and heavy, with everything the Tedrils needed. This time they would not plunder the countryside because they had to. They would not need to worry about living off the land. Although Sunsguard's soldiers did not go into the ranks of the Tedril forces, there had been a movement toward the border, and now they had formed a line of defense on either side of the Tedril base, ensuring that the Tedrils could not be flanked, at least on the Carsite side of the border. Brilliant. It was all brilliant. He couldn't fault their strategy. Or their patience. They had waited all this time for their golden opportunity— and they were clearly not going to ruin that opportunity by forgetting that patience now. The Tedrils would move when the Tedrils were ready, not before, and not a candle mark later. Talamir and the Lord Marshal were revealing all of this to the Council now. It was new to most of them, but only because they hadn't been paying attention. It wasn't as if they hadn't been warned over and over again that the Tedrils were going to keep coming at Valdemar until it fell, or they were destroyed and dispersed. Alberich couldn't fathom it. It was as if the moment that the Tedrils retreated in the fall, the members of the council forgot they existed and would be back in the spring. True, there were plenty of pressing concerns, but none to his way of thinking, as the inevitability of the Tedrils making that final push. Perhaps, in the back of their minds, they hoped that eventually the Tedrils would give up and go away. After all, they had never yet won so much as a thumbnail's worth of Valdemaran land. But if that were so, 
than all of the things that all of the spies and foreseeing heralds and historians had been telling them had just gone right past them without being believed. If they'd been paying as much attention as they should have been to all of the reports that Talamir had given them over the last few moons, they would know most of this. On the other hand, the fact that it was all coming as a horrible surprise was going to work in Sendar's favor. The council could and would, as Talamir and Sendar worked together like a pair of clever shepherd dogs, be stampeded into granting Sendar whatever he wanted. One of those things was Alberich, no longer kept back in the shadows, ostensibly no more than a closely watched underling. Sendar wanted Alberich in the thick of things, at his or Selene's side, seeing and hearing everything that was most important, most secret. This greater danger would make the members of the council forget where Alberich came from and remember only the uniform, the quiet work on the seamy underside of Haven, the invaluable help in placing agents in Carsey, and presumably there would be no further objection to Alberich's presence wherever Sendar wanted him. Granting him authority? Well, that was another question altogether. Alberich didn't really need or want overt authority. He had all he could handle covertly. But he would get, by virtue of being Selene's most visible bodyguard, complete access to every strategy session. No one would think twice about it. If he really saw something important, and knew there was something that needed to be said, it would be said through Selene or Talamir or even Sendar himself. Ah, the advantage of being a mind-speaking herald. I think that the position of being behind the powers that be suits you better anyway, Cantor observed. Why? So that no one has to look at my face? he asked sardonically. Cantor pretended to be shocked. Why chosen? Was that a joke I just heard? As you know, I have no sense of humor, Alberich responded. Now hush, I want to see just how hysterical the council members get when Sendar talks about the leaks of what should have been council information and how much of it is feigned. Because he had some suspicions that there were a few, a very few, no more than two or three, members of the council who were not as tight-lipped as they should have been. He didn't suspect any of them of sending information to the enemy themselves, but rather that they gossiped about council doings to others. They probably thought that their friends and cronies were trustworthy enough, if they actually thought at all which was doubtful. These highborn Valdemarans seemed to take it as read that none of their friends, or their friends' friends, could possibly be untrustworthy, and never mind heaps of evidence to the contrary, and never mind all of the political infighting that went on between factions. That was probably where leaks were happening, and not an overt traitor. Of course, all of this chattering made them feel very important and in the know, and their friends would be feeding them information back so that in their turn they could impress the rest of the council members with their knowledge and insight. They thought it was harmless, and in any other situation than the one they all found themselves in now, it would have been. But now, such loose-lipped behavior was nothing like harmless. Even without the tedrils on the border, there were other hazards, outside and inside of Valdemar, that could and probably did, use this information to the detriment of poor ordinary folk. So Alberich was paying very close attention to the reactions of the councillors, and he wasn't at all happy with what he saw. Lord Garthazer. He was, oh, so very concerned, shocked, dismayed, and he was acting, Alberich was certain of it. Garthazer headed up a faction that had been particularly nasty about Alberich's presence among the heralds, but Alberich wouldn't have held a grudge if they hadn't been so underhanded about their opposition. Still, he'd have given Garthazer the benefit of the doubt, not with that bit of overacting. Garthazer was up to something. Garthazer knew more than he should. And where had he gotten that information? Hmm. Unfortunately, Sendar's old playfellow, or Thalan, is in Garthazer's coterie. That was Cantor, who actually knew far more about these people than Alberich did, which was saying a great deal. The companions had their own information tree, which was as flourishing as any gossip vine in the court, and was far more accurate. 
Alberich suppressed a grimace. That wasn't good. Lord Orthalan, a few years older than Sendar, had been kind to Sendar when the king was a lonely child in the court before he'd been chosen. Now Alberich was fairly well certain that the only reason the adolescent Orthalan had been kind to and protective of the grubby little child Sendar had once been was because he'd had an eye to the main chance even then. But you couldn't persuade Sendar of that. And as a consequence, as a child, he had made Orthalan into his hero, and as an adult, his close friend and compatriot. Orthalan had extraordinary access to the royals for someone who wasn't a herald. In fact, it was virtually a certain thing that Orthalan was going to get the council seat soon to be vacated by Lord Tholinar. Alberich liked Orthalan even less than Garthaser. Lord Garthaser was just pig-headed and prejudiced and interfering. He wanted things his way. He didn't trust anyone who wasn't high-born, and he wasn't entirely certain even of those jumped-up commoner heralds. But although he despised Alberich, he didn't mean any harm. And though he probably had friends who were not at all trustworthy, there was no way yet to prove that to him. To give him the benefit of the doubt, Alberich was fairly certain that if anyone could bring Garthaser proof of his friend's iniquity, there was no doubt that he would drop them without hesitation. Or Thalin, on the other hand, well, Alberich had no real evidence against the man, other than the evidence of his feelings, or perhaps his gift. Either way, there was something about Orthalan that put his back up, like a cat scenting a snake. He had no evidence against the man, and nothing other than his instincts to go on, but— But I agree with you. There is something altogether ruthless about my lord Orthalan, as if he doesn't care who or what is ruined, so long as he comes out with what he wants. Now that was an interesting observation, coming from a companion. Was this purely Cantor's feeling, or did he have some other source of information? What if you hooved fellows conspire to keep Orthalan safely occupied with something else? Do you think you could organize that? I can try, but I'm no miracle worker. The most difficult part is that no one seems to see anything wrong with Orthalan but me and thee. Cantor sounded discouraged, as well he should. My fellow companions don't like him either, but that could be only because he doesn't really like our chosen. Then thee and me will have to do what we can among a thousand other things. He pulled his attention back to the council meeting, and was pleasantly surprised to see that the council members, after their initial shock, were actually pulling things together. Surprised? No. Astonished. He truly hadn't thought they would bury their differences and get straight down to working together, burying feuds and sparring and jockeying for power so quickly. But they were. The horseshoe-shaped table buzzed with half a dozen overlapping conversations as the councillors dropped their political differences and settled down to the task at hand. Sendar somehow kept track of it all. Selene just kept track of who was in need of a page, of writing materials, or just another pitcher of drink. As the time candles burned down, Selene sent more pages for food and drink, while the council organized and coordinated the resources of their territories, guilds crafts, and associations. They were tallying up what could be brought down south immediately, what could be collected in a fortnight or a moon, what could be spared, and how much could be done and still leave just enough left to keep everyone from starving to death over winter, and no more. Because now, finally, they all realized that even if the entire kingdom was left impoverished, that ruthless stripping of resources still had to be done, in the face of the enormous threat that the Tedrils posed. Finally, finally, they understood. And at least now that they understood, they were prepared to act, and act swiftly with no argument. The shock over, they were showing their mettle. Even Lord Garthaser. Better hungry and cold than dead and cold, said Lady Donrevy grimly. That seemed to sum up everyone's feelings. Not before time, but at least it was in time. Alberich settled his face into a mask of indifference. It was time for him to observe and nothing more. As the candle marks passed, the daylight faded, and pages brought and took away laden and empty platters and pitchers, 
He watched and listened. His time to act would come later. No, no, and no! Selene was in a temper. Losing patience with her maidservant entirely, she pulled the useless gowns out of the traveling chest, wadded them up, and threw them on the floor. She did not want the creature to try and foist the blasted things off on her again. I will not take those gowns, or these gowns, or any gowns at all, she snapped, as the maid snatched the dresses up with an expression of shock and offense, and smoothed them hastily. Selene felt a pang of guilt over the crumpled and wrinkled state of the delicate white silks and satins, reims and linens, but not enough to show that she felt any guilt. How many times must I tell you? I'm going to a battlefield, not a fete, a ball, a state visit, or a festival. But, Highness, you will be surrounded by highborn young men, the maid protested indignantly. Your Highness cannot possibly wish to appear the hoyden. Great good gods! What part of battlefield doesn't she understand? Selene suppressed a groan, and wondered what demon had possessed her to accept this foolish woman as her personal servant. Because Uncle Lord Orthalan sent her to me, of course. And now I can't dismiss her because he'd feel as if he'd let me down. And I did need a proper lady's maid, one that knows about hairdressing and all that sort of thing. Unfortunately, the creature did not know about heralds, nor did she care. She cared only about the trappings of rank, the care of gowns, the importance of self-importance, and she could not seem to fathom that there was another set of duties of the princess and heir that went far beyond looking handsome, finding a husband of suitable rank, and following the appropriate court etiquette. Yes, she was sheer genius when it came to dressing well and looking exquisite, but that was all she was good for. On the whole, the woman was far more hindrance than help, especially now, and finally Selene sent her on a fool's errand into the attics just to get rid of her, knowing that she would be packed and gone long before the woman got back. Then she did something she would normally never have done. She pulled out everything the maid had packed and tossed it out, all over the furniture, the floor, wherever it happened to fall when she dumped the packs. The maid could do something useful for a change when she returned. She could pick it all up, see that the gowns were pressed and brushed, sort out all the hairdressing nonsense and cosmetics, and put it all away. Selene could braid her hair by herself very well, and the only cosmetic she was likely to use out there was soap. With the maid out of the way, it took just over a quarter of a candle mark for Selene to pack. It wasn't difficult. She'd learned how to pack for the field long ago, and had watched her friends as they packed up to go out countless times. Wistfully, she had watched them then. She had known it wasn't possible for her to go, but she had wanted to. So badly. Well, now she was going, and she didn't want to. Alberich probably thought that she would be excited about being in the front lines, and anticipate being in the thick of fighting— right up until she got her first real look at it, and only then would she lose her taste for war. He was wrong. She had already lost her taste for war, and she knew far more about it than she thought he realized. She had been making it her business to visit the wounded in the House of Healing ever since this all began, to thank them. They seemed to appreciate her attention, though why she couldn't imagine. Maybe it was just that for most of them it was their first and probably last, close-up look at one of the royals. Well, she knew firsthand what war really meant, and she was absolutely terrified, and was not under any circumstances going to show it. She rang for a servant to help her with her trunks, but carried two of her packs herself, and she outdistanced the poor servants in her haste to get down to the stables. Probably she should have waited for an escort of guardsmen, but she didn't have time, and if she wasn't safe at this moment, with the palace and grounds alive with guards, heralds, and the last of the regiments to leave Haven, she would never be safe anywhere. She popped out of the nearest door onto the courtyard in front of the palace, a place that was normally quiet and empty at this time of the morning. Not this morning. The sun was just above the horizon, a sliver of red in a dusky sky. 
The air was a little damp, with dew slicking the cobbles, rimming the pavement, and birds filling the air with their morning calls. It seemed too beautiful a morning to be riding out to war. The courtyard was awash in white. White companions, heralds in their white field uniforms. Selene fit right in. Her uniform was not a whit different from theirs. That was a conscious decision. There was nothing about their clothing to distinguish her or her father from the other heralds. Of course, the moment she crossed the threshold, she was joined by her two shadows, the heralds, Karen and Ilsa, who fell in behind her casually, as if they were just a couple of her best friends who'd been waiting for her to come out. She greeted them with a tense smile, and then spotted Cario, already saddled and bridled with field tack, waiting with Karen and Ilsa's companions who were completely ready, saddle-packs and all. Her father was already in the saddle, but she saw with a touch of relief that she was by no means the last to arrive. It didn't take long for her to sling her basic field-packs across Cario's rump and fasten them in place, less time to get into the saddle herself. Her remaining packs and trunks would go on the wagons, carrying the rest of the supplies with her tent and her father's. Cario with Selene's two shadows in close but unobtrusive attendance, moved to Sendar's side without prompting. The king nodded an acknowledgment to his daughter, but didn't stop reading the dispatch he'd just been handed. He held out his hand, and a page on horseback slapped a graphite stick into it. He scrawled a reply on the same paper and held out his hand again. The page slapped a pre-inked seal stamp into it, which he impressed across his signature. He blew on the ink to dry it, and rolled it up. This time he handed it to the dark-haired, somber-faced herald who'd brought it to him, who in turn slipped it into a message tube. Then the herald held the tube up at eye level, frowning at it. One moment he held the tube, the next his hands were empty. He looked a bit pale for a moment, but recovered quickly. Sendar slapped him on the shoulder. Well done, was all the king said, but the young man smiled, blushed, and backed his companion off to rejoin his fellows. The young fellow was a herald with the fetching gift, of course. Either he or a mind-speaking herald had told Talamir that there was a message, probably from the front, that needed a written answer. The fetching herald had brought it in a heartbeat, and sent it back again in the same amount of time. Now, with this all-or-nothing war to be fought, the heralds truly showed how invaluable they were. In fact, without them, Valdemar would have no advantage over the Tedrils at all. Heralds who were mind-speakers rode with scouts, and served to relay news, messages, and battle plans. Heralds who were far-seers spied on the enemy, without him even being aware he was being spied upon. Heralds with the gift of foresight tried to predict what would come next. The two lone weather witches tried to predict when rain would fall on the enemy and when on their own troops. And those with the rare gift of fetching sent things to and from their commanders in the distant south. There were other, even rarer gifts, which might or might not come into play depending on circumstances. At the moment, for instance, the only fire starters in the heraldic ranks were not very strong, which was, well, some would think it was a pity. Certainly, if they'd had a fire starter with the strength of the legendary Levan Firestorm, they would hardly need an army. On the other hand, the finale of the Battle of Burning Pines had very nearly incinerated both the Carsite and Valdemaran armies together. Selene was just as glad their fire starter couldn't do much more than ensure campfires from thoroughly soaked green wood. The mood was subdued as the sun rose a little higher, and the dew began to dry. The companions, unlike horses, were not restive. They stood rock-steady in their appointed places, with little more than the occasional head-shake or switching of a tail. The heralds themselves spoke very little, and only in a murmur. Perhaps most of them were occupied in mind-speech. Certainly Sendar was, for the king had that far-away look that Selene knew meant he was deep in conversation with someone. More like a series of someones, Cario said quietly. He's been talking to the others since he woke. Selene bit her lip. 
On the one hand, she wished very strongly that her own gift was powerful enough for her to hear what was going on. On the other hand, she wasn't sure she wanted to know. She was already afraid. If she knew what her father knew, well, she wasn't at all sure that she could keep up the brave face that she had to show. The last of the heralds to accompany Sendar to the war ran into the courtyard, packs over their shoulders, to finish kitting their companions and take their places among the rest. When the very last was mounted, Sendar held up his hand, and what little talk there had been ceased entirely. You all heard my speech for the people of Haven, he said, his voice sounding rough and tired to Selene, but strong nevertheless. He squinted into the morning sunlight. There were dark rings under his eyes, and she wondered how much he had slept, if at all. I won't bore you with repeating it, and besides, none of you need to be told why we are doing this. Before winter comes, some of us will die. Many of us will be injured. No less than myself, your king, you are primary targets for our adversaries. Our enemy knows very well how important the heralds are to our strategy, and as you have been aware, he has made it his business in his past campaigns to eliminate as many of you as he could. Only the fact that I have made it my business to withhold as many of you from the front lines as I could has kept our losses to a minimum. Selene blinked. She hadn't realized that. But of course it was true. It must be. There hadn't been more than four or five heralds killed in the wars for each year that there had been fighting. Now she knew why, and knew that Sendar had not been lulled into thinking that the Tedrils would eventually go away. He had believed Alberich, believed the spies, and planned for this from the beginning. This is the fight that I have been holding you for, Sendar continued. Now in my turn, I am going to ask you for something very, very difficult. You would not be heralds if you were not perfectly prepared to pay the ultimate price for Valdemar. So I need not ask you for courage. Instead, I ask you for caution. Caution? Selene thought, surprised, even a little shocked. She was not the only one. She saw eyes widen, lips purse, and brows furrow among those closest to her. You are a finite resource, Sendar continued, turning in his saddle so that he could meet the eyes of everyone near him. It will take four long years, at a minimum, to replace each one of you and that assumes that enough younglings will be chosen to do so. And each and every one of you is desperately needed for our strategies to work. You cannot be spared. So, I ask you for caution, care, and to remember that although your duty to Valdemar may mean that you face death, your duty also requires you to live and serve, no matter what the cost to you. His voice took on a hard and implacable tone. You must and will face the fact that there is worse than death on the field of combat, and be just as prepared to live with such a fate as you are willing to die. Valdemar can make use of a blind herald, or an armless or legless one, and all you need to do is to recall the story of Levan Firestorm's mentor, Harold Paul, to know that this is true. Valdemar can make use of even a herald who is confined to a litter with a broken neck, what Valdemar can make no use of is a dead herald. Selene swallowed and wondered what was going through the minds of those around her. She hadn't thought about that. Had any of the others? She glanced to her left and found herself looking into the grave and grim visage of Harold Alberich. He gave a slight, tight little nod. If no one else had, he'd thought of that, and probably reminded Sendar of it. The silence within the courtyard was so profound that the twittering of sparrows in the trees and bushes in the neat boxes around the courtyard seemed loud and intrusive. This is no war like any we have ever fought, Sendar continued. The Tedrils have nothing to lose and everything to gain. If they are defeated by us here, they will have lost their last, best chance at the homeland that is their only goal. They have nowhere to retreat to. 
After the way they have treated their allies in Carsey, the Sun's Guard will fall on them and destroy them if they lose. That, so Alberich tells me, is the message implied in the two flanking forces along the border. The Sun's Guard will not only prevent us from engaging the Tedrils in a pincer movement across the Carsite border, it will prevent them from coming back into Carsey, and never believe that they do not know this. They are probably counting on it to keep their own mercenary shock troops in line and under control. Oh! Selene repressed a shiver. Never corner an enemy who has nothing to lose. How many times had Alberich drummed that into her head, and now the enemy had been put into a corner? A bad situation had just gotten infinitely worse. Sendar paused to let all that sink in. No one moved. No one spoke. But we have everything to gain by defeating them, and not just for ourselves. When this war is over and we have defeated the enemy, no one will ever face a single Tedril company again much less the entire nation, Sendar said into the waiting silence. They will be finished, for all time, and we will defeat them. His voice took on a strength and a surety that suddenly made even Selene's spirits rise. We will defeat them, for although they call themselves and think of themselves as a nation, they are not. They have a body with no heart. They think that the land is the nation. We know better. We know that Valdemar is not the land, and it is not just the people. Valdemar is a spirit, a community of spirit, that binds a hundred disparate peoples with a hundred different religions and ways of life into a company and a greater whole. It is not a unity, for that would be denying our diversity, and in our diversity and our tolerance is our strength. Even if this enemy succeeded in driving us from this land, which he will not, Valdemar would live on. If he slew all of us, which he will not, Valdemar would live on. That spirit is what you fight for, and will live for, heralds of Valdemar, for you are at the heart of that spirit. A spirit of tolerance, compassion, understanding, and care. All things that our enemy cannot and will never understand. And in the name of that spirit, we ride. The cheer that rose was as spontaneous as it was heartfelt. Even Selene felt a cheer bursting out of her throat. And she was so used to the effect that the king's speeches had on people that she had thought herself immune by now. Even grim-faced Alberich was cheering, and his expression had as much of hope in it as she had ever seen. Karen and Ilsa cheered with tears running down their faces, and they weren't the only ones. Sendar and his companion surged forward, down the drive that led out the palace gates, buoyed on the wave of sound, and the rest of the heralds followed. And Selene with them, for once nothing more than another herald, another weapon, to serve Valdemar to the last of her strength, and even beyond. 14. The king and his company of heralds and bodyguards swiftly outdistanced the baggage train, those council members who elected to go to the front lines, and the royal regiment. They would have outdistanced anything, as Alberich soon discovered, because they were all mounted on companions, even the bodyguards, who were being carried as a matter of courtesy by unpartnered companions. Carried, just like sets of cooperative baggage, because these companions would not tolerate even the excuse for a bridle that the partnered ones wore. Alberich had known as a matter of theory just how swiftly the companions could cover ground. Now he discovered it as a matter of practice. They could have been performing a sort of precision drill, for they all used a pace that was as fast as a canter and as smooth as a running walk. So smooth, in fact, that it was perfectly possible to strap oneself into the saddle and doze if one were tired enough. Their hooves didn't pound, as Alberich had noted before this. They chimed. Not as loud as bells, and not precisely like bells, but the effect of so many of them hitting the ground together was a bit unsettling. Like being in the same room as a thousand wind chimes. Alberich was astonished. It was his first experience of this ability unique to companions. Or, to be honest, 
It was his first conscious experience of this ability. Cantor must have used this pace to get him across the border into Valdemar from Carsey. Now he knew why Daythor had packed his sleeping roll in his saddle packs and not with his tent. He wouldn't see his tent or anything else in the baggage train for days or weeks. Neither would anyone else in this group. They would have to depend on the army for shelter for a while when they got to the front lines. And he supposed that they would have to hope that the weather stayed good on the way. It didn't matter. Daythor had overseen his packing, and everything he truly needed was with him. He hoped that someone with similar experience had packed for Selene and the king. Selene and the king already knew how to pack for this sort of trip, Cantor said, and left it at that. Once out of the capital, they moved down the road with a purposefulness that was positively frightening. There was no way to properly convey the effect— they weren't menacing, but they seemed to exude a sense of needing to go somewhere in a hurry, a sense that somehow made everyone move out of their way without noticing that it was happening. It was uncanny. The first time he saw it working, he felt the hair go up on the back of his neck, and Cantor's wordless reassurance. This could have looked like some sort of parade, all of the companions and their uniformed heralds, with the single spots of healer green and guard blue among them. It didn't. Alberich could tell by the faces of those who gathered to watch them pass through their towns and villages that they gave no such impression. The expressions that the common folk wore were uniformly grim. Perhaps the people of Haven had not yet grasped the seriousness of the situation, but the people of the towns and villages knew it. There was no cheering, and the hope he saw in their faces was tinged with desperation. They know, don't they? he asked Cantor. Better than those in the cities. Everyone knows everyone in a village. When their youngsters go off into the guard, everyone knows every word in every letter that comes home. And everyone knows when someone isn't going to come home again. Ah. He shifted in the saddle, careful to do so with Cantor's stride so as not to throw him off. Well, that was something he wouldn't know about. Letters from the front lines and a village's interest in them. His mother couldn't have read a letter even if he'd been allowed to send her one from the academy. And he remembered for the first time in a long, long while the first line of the oath he had sworn when he joined the academy. The temple is your mother, and your father is Vakandis' sun-lord. It was still true, just not in the way that those who had listened to him swear that oath intended. They stopped for the night around dusk outside a village, which one he didn't know, they went past it too quickly for him to read the faded sign in the uncertain light. The herald in the lead broke off down a side lane, and the entire group followed, slowing as they did so. The lane was overgrown, entirely grass-covered, eventually bringing them to a tiny cabin set off in a clearing, with no sign of any inhabitant about it. That's because there isn't an inhabitant. This is one of the way stations, Cantor told him. We're two days' journey from Haven at my usual pace, three or four by horse. Feeling stiff, though not as stiff and sore as he had expected, he slowly dismounted. He had read about the way stations, though he had never seen one. This one, a little stone hut with a thatched roof, looked solid enough, though it wasn't very big. But sheltering no more than two heralds at a time, and then not for very long, it didn't need to be, he supposed. The walls were thick, and so was the door. There weren't any windows, but inside he saw that the floor was slate and there was a stone fireplace. It was a better structure than the one he and his mother had shared before she got her job at the inn. The building itself was given over to Sendar and Selene as their shelter. Six of the other heralds returned to the village for provisions, while the rest, Alberich included, made camp and saw to the comfort of their companions. Even the guards and healer Krathak put in the time to groom and feed and water the companions they rode. They completely exhausted the stores of food for the companions in the waystation bins, but at least there was plenty of grazing. It was fully dark by the time the six heralds who had gone after provisions returned, and by then there were a couple of small fires going. Sleeping rolls had been arranged according to friendships or pre-arrangements. Alberich's would be across the door of the cabin, and the other bodyguards would be in close proximity, 
and the steady munching of companions through grass was as loud as the insects and night birds. Alberich had expected that they would be cooking some sort of communal meal, but what was brought back from the village was both unexpected and touching. The villagers had given up parts of their own evening meals to send them to the heralds on their way to the front lines. Ham, cold chicken and bread, cheese and fruit, cold-boiled eggs, sausage rolls and sweet cakes, jars of pickles and packets of tea. Parcel after paper-wrapped parcel came out of the saddlebags and net bags that the six had taken into the village to be divided equally among the lot of them. Sendar and Selene taking no precedence in what they got. There was a bit of trading as people swapped items they didn't care as much for. Then things quieted down rather quickly. Draw straws over who washes up tonight and who does in the morning, Sendar suggested, as conversation ceased while jaws were otherwise employed. Most everyone was probably as starved as Alberich. They'd all eaten while on the move, taking out provisions that had apparently been packed by palace servants, since Alberich didn't recall packing the contents of the little bag on the front of his saddle, a paper-wrapped pair of sausage rolls, and a skin of cold tea. But it had been candle marks ago, and it had been a very long day. Someone collected enough black and white beans from the way station to equal the number of riders and put them into a bag. Alberich was not unhappy to find his was a black bean, and when he was done with his ham and pickled beans, joined the queue of those who were cleaning up now. Water straight from the well felt refreshing after the hard and sweaty day of riding. It was going to feel cursed cold in the morning. Sendar and Selene got black beans as well, and Alberich insisted they go ahead of him. There was method in this. They were in the way station and probably asleep by the time he finished— and he was able to stretch himself out across the door without worrying that he'd be inconveniencing them. But he wondered, just before he fell asleep, if there was even the faintest likelihood that a village of Carsites would sacrifice portions of their own meals to a troop of sun-priests and sun's guard under similar circumstances. On the whole, he thought not. The next day followed the pattern of the first— except that they had to stop at midday in a large town, and several heralds went to each tavern and inn in turn to collect meat pies for all of them. Alberich had an idea that he would be heartily tired of meat pies and sausage rolls before the end of their journey. But of course that was the least of his worries, and it was better fare than he'd ever gotten with the sun's guard. The contrast between their grim purpose and the placid, lush countryside they rode through could not have been greater. Alberich tried not to look too closely at the folk who came out to see them pass, but he couldn't ignore them altogether, and it wrung his heart to see them. Middle-aged men and older, women either with children or as old as the old men. There were a great many children, and not very many young adults. He knew what that meant. Those that could be spared, were unattached, had no families to support. They were gone. In the army, facing the Tedrils and who knew if they'd ever return. He saw that in the faces of those that they rode so swiftly past, in the fear they tried not to show. But if the Tedrils broke through, these same people would be taking up whatever arms they had to defend their lives, or fleeing back up that road to Haven. And try as he might, he could not but help look at those peaceful villages, and imagine flames rising above the roofs, and bodies sprawled in the streets. It was better when they were riding through the countryside. And maybe the others were cursed with the same sort of imagination as Alberich, for their pace seemed to increase just a trifle when they were going through a center of population. So it went, sunrise to sundown, league after league of it, and no end in sight. It almost seemed to him as if he was caught in a peculiar nightmare, riding inexorably toward a dark and dreadful fate. Selene had longed for a day when she might ride out like any other herald, taking to the road with her packs behind her, leaving the palace and all of the stuffiness of the court behind. Now that day had come, and she thought, often, that it might have been a good idea if she had never made that particular wish. She would rather have to suffer being laced into a tight gown and listen to dull speeches every day for the rest of her life than face the tedrils.
and it didn't matter that there would be an army between them and her. She was as much afraid for the people she knew, her friends, the people she'd been with as a trainee who would be in that army, as she was for herself. What was more the reason why Alberich had assigned bodyguards to her for day and night was real now. She understood that her life was in genuine, serious danger, and worse than just her life. She had learned in several sleepless nights following a long and somber talk with Alberich that there was a fate worse than death. The Tedrils had every reason to want to take her alive, and many more reasons to want to make sure that she was alive and outwardly well, but not in possession of her wits any more. And there were a great many ways to ensure that she wasn't sane once they got hold of her, the most obvious being to murder Cario. She was used to a Valdemar where the king could walk unguarded among his people, but her father wasn't going anywhere without his six shadows either, and that shook her to the core. He no longer trusted his own people— or at least no longer trusted the ones he didn't personally know. It would have made her weep if she hadn't been too frightened to cry. The heavy, leaden feeling of fear increased day by day. It hung over all of them, making conversation stilted and unnatural, punctuating the silences, and making it impossible to enjoy the fragrant, picturesque countryside through which they rode. The enforced, close presence of her father— quiet and grave with worry, or absent altogether as he mind-spoke with the heralds, relaying a moment-by-moment -moment summary of what was going on with the enemy and with their own forces, was a greater burden than she allowed him to guess. She couldn't lean on him for comfort, for Alberich and Talamir were right. He was already taking on more than he should. She could only thank all the gods that ever were for Cario. At least she had someone to turn to, even if that someone couldn't actually do any more than she could. It helped immeasurably when in the dark of some way station, unable to sleep, she could unburden her heart to another who would understand. And in moments when she could steal away a little, with Karen or Ilsa pointedly not looking at her, that she could pretend to groom Cario and cry into her soft shoulder. There were times when Selene wondered if they would ever reach the army, but more times when she hoped they never would. So long as they rode, she could put off the day when everything would change. So long as they rode, she was safe, safe as only a herald in the company of heralds could be. So long as they rode, the army had not yet met the enemy, and she could pretend that they never would. Nevertheless, the companions— even her beloved friend, carried them inexorably to that confrontation. And it was almost a relief when that day did come. Almost. The waiting might be over, but now she was here. She heard the army long before she saw it. The hum of a city many times the size of Haven transported to the rolling hills of the Southland. And long before she heard it, there were other signs of it provisioning wagons going toward it full and away from it empty, messengers pounding up or down the road. There were other signs, more ominous signs. The countryside was empty. It was empty because insofar as it was possible to get the people to leave, it had been evacuated. There wasn't a sheep on the hillsides or a farmer in the fields. The fields that no longer held sheep did hold something else— grazing on the rich emerald grass, grass that the Tedrils desired for their own herds. The horses, the oxen, the mules of the army grazed there. Not the horses of the cavalry, which were kept within the camp, but the horses that drew the carts that supplied the army, the horses that carried messengers when the message was not urgent enough for a herald. Common horses, but for the most part better by far than any that these hills had seen before. But when they finally reached the outskirts of the encampment, it was something of an anticlimax, for it looked like nothing more than an ordinary army camp. They topped a hill and saw the edge of the camp below them, across the slow river that split the valley in half on the other side of a stone bridge. Sentries guarded the road there, the visible token of the ones Selene could not see. Beyond the sentries, rows of pale canvas tents, rows of tents that were as even as furrows in the soil, that marched up the other slope and crowned the top of the hill, 
a strange and martial crop of spears and pikes planted in stands beside them. And yet, it was no larger an encampment than ones she had seen before on the edge of the city. She knew abstractly that it wasn't possible to see all of it from any one point, not in these hills. She knew that in her mind, but the emotional impact of so great a force as they had gathered together should leave her breathless, or so she felt. So as the sentries barring the road demanded and received passwords, she felt oddly disappointed. But then they followed the sentries' directions down the road, with properly arranged ranks of whitewashed canvas tents on either side, each section with a central campfire, each four sections serviced by a larger cook tent. And as they continued to ride forward, the ranks of tents went on and on and on until she began to lose count. Over the next hill and down the other side, the tents ranged on before them, interrupted only by trees and hedgerows, the racks of pikes and spears piercing the sky beside them. Then the tents were interrupted by a drill ground full of guardsmen at practice, followed by another hill, another little valley, and yet more tents and another drill ground. Then a farmhouse, taken over by officers, full of comings and goings, with the yard crowded with horses, snorting and switching their tails at flies. And when they didn't stop there, at what she had thought was the command post, that was when it hit her, just how big their army was. Selene tried to imagine it, and failed. She had seen several hundred people at once many times, even several thousand, crowded into one of the huge public squares in Haven for some speech of her father's, but never more than a fraction of the number that must be assembled here now. And that number didn't include healers and heralds either. And there were probably a lot of bards here too, for you couldn't keep a bard away from something like this. Then there were all of the support people, cooks and carters, laundresses and tailors, the servants of anyone highborn. No wonder her father had put off assembling this huge a force until now. Where would he have housed them? How long could he have kept them fed? The logistics were mind-boggling. She couldn't imagine the amount of coordination it took just to feed this army for a single day, let alone care for it for the past several fortnights. How could it have been organized in the first place? Who was doing the training? Who was keeping the place clean for the haven's sake? No wonder Talamir kept telling her father to delegate more. Now she knew why Alberich couldn't be jollied into a better humor. He knew this was coming, of course. Well, so had she, but unlike her, Alberich had known very well how large a force the Tedrils had when they decided to commit all of it for their army was just equal to the one that the Tedrils were fielding, and only just. Her heart went cold, and she was suddenly, desperately, urgently wanting to run away, to turn Cario and go so far north that not even the Tedrils would find her. There were places up there, the Forest of Sorrows for one, where you could lose an entire regiment of cavalry and not find them for years. One girl on a single companion could stay hidden until the rivers ceased to flow. The truth of it was, she could do that, and no one would blame her if she did. Some people would even applaud her wisdom in giving the Tedrils one less available target. But if she did that, some people would lose heart, and she had no way of knowing how many. It might be enough to make a difference, and she could not take that chance. She could not do much here but this, by her very presence, one slim girl facing down the enemy, daring him to try and take her. She might give heart to those who were actually doing the fighting, and she could take some of the burden, not much, but some, from her father. So she couldn't run away, and she dared not show how afraid she was. But she was very glad that she had reins to hold. They kept her hands from shaking. She had thought that they would stop at that farmhouse, but no, they went on past more tents, more drill grounds, until she wondered if they would ever make an end. The practice grounds were all in use. No slacking going on in this army, and well drilled these fellows were, too. Alberich's practiced eye ran over the troops, and he was pleased with what he saw. Better than anything in Carsey, eh, Chosen? Cantor asked smugly as the men lunged and recovered in time to their leader's chance. Spears this lot had, 
with cross braces like on a boar spear that kept the enemy from coming at you once you'd stuck him. It made them a little awkward to handle in a group, but that was what practice was for. Not better trained, but better motivated, he admitted. That's as important a factor as food and weapons. The trouble was, of course, that the core troops of the Tedrils were just as highly motivated, but not the shock troops, and that just might make the difference. The shock troops, the ones meant to take the brunt of the attacking, were the flotsam that the Tedrils had lured to their ranks with promises of loot and blood. Once it was their blood that got shed, the question was how well they'd stick. Valdemar had that working in their favor. In numbers, if all of their foreseers and spies were right, Valdemar and the Tedrils were evenly matched, but not, perhaps, in motivation. Greed might be motivation enough, Cantor said soberingly. Don't count on them to turn once the fighting gets bloody. Most of them have seen plenty of fighting. It's not as if they were a lot of sheepherders dragged in by fast-talking drummers. His eye lingered on a group of spearmen and pikemen training. Spears in the first two ranks, pikes in the next two. Pikemen were traditionally the positions of the least trained. Although there was some skill involved in handling a pike, it was not much different from handling a boar spear, and involved more following orders than thinking. There was some clumsiness, but not enough to make him think that they were entirely fresh. There was a great deal of determination. Their clothing, beneath their Valdemaran tabards, told him that they were farmers. Other men might deride farmers turned soldiers. Not he. Farmers knew what they were fighting for. Farmers were used to death and killing, for they did it every autumn when they killed the cattle and swine that would feed them through the winter. The average city dweller might never see meat that was not already rendered into its component parts. The farmer had raised that meat from a baby, and had resisted his children's efforts to name it and make a pet of it. Killing a cow was easier than killing a man? Not when the farmer had delivered the cow as a calf, had agonized over its illnesses, had called it to its food every day for all of its life, brought it all unaware into the killing shed, and stared into its eyes before killing it. Whereas the man he faced was a stranger, was hidden in his helm, and wanted to kill him. Then wanted to take his land, his goods, and his women. A farmer would have no difficulty in making the decision to kill a man. No, he was happy to see farmers here. It was the city dwellers, the craftsmen, that he was concerned about. It was one thing to train and look proficient. It was quite another thing to hold yourself together in combat. He glanced at his charge. Selene was looking white about the lips. He wondered why. She understands now what we're facing, Cantor replied. It's hit her in her gut, in her heart, just how big our army is, and by extension, how big theirs is, and all that this implies. Ah. Well, he felt sorry for her, but better now than later. Better now, when she would have time to gather the courage she knew she had and compose herself before the eyes of those who would fight for her sake. For the sake of Valdemar, Cantor corrected. It is the same, he countered, as he spotted the convocation of larger, fancier tents that marked the center of the army, and the seat of its leadership. What with bodyguards, sentries, servants, and all, it had been too big a convocation to house in any farmhouse. A philosophical difference, perhaps, Cantor replied, to you, a real one to us. They reached the periphery of the tents, a boundary marked by another set of sentries stationed every few paces around the edge. The edge was defined by what appeared to be ornamental swags of rope hung between stakes. It wasn't ornamental, and it was a device suggested by Alberich. Hidden amid the fringe and bullion were bells, very loud bells, and anyone who so much as brushed against those ropes would raise a very audible alarm. One couldn't climb over it or crawl under it. A small thing, but one more barrier between his charges and harm. The Lord Marshal was taking no chances. It was the Lord Marshal who had suggested the second innovation, a layer of black felt lining the inside of the tents, so no one would be silhouetted against the canvas by lights within. 
another small thing, but it would make the king, his heir, and the officers less of a set of targets once night fell. Unless a spy was able to watch them closely, one wouldn't even know when they were in their tents. The Lord Marshal himself was there to greet them, and Alberich moved closer to Selene as they all dismounted. This would be another good time to strike at her, in the moment when everyone was a trifle relaxed at the end of the journey. But Cantor had made a statement that needed to be answered. She is not Valdemar? Then let her become Valdemar, he said fiercely. Men fight better when the symbol of what they fight for is before them. Why do you think we carry a shrine of Vacandis before us when we wage war? He actually took Cantor aback for a moment. An interesting observation, the companion replied, and left it at that. It was well that he did, for Alberich's attention was elsewhere now, scanning every face and every body around them, even, no, especially, among the servants of the highborn. That was the place for a traitor to slip in among the servants. He watched without seeming to watch, a good trick he had acquired in the taverns of the worst part of Haven. There were a great many tricks he had acquired there, or learned from Daythor, and he had taught most of them to Selene's six and Sendar's too, or at least as many as he could impart to them in the short time he had to school them. He was pleased to see that they were using those lessons, pleased to see that the ones guarding Sendar were doing likewise. They were more obvious in their watchfulness, but there was no harm there. They drew attention to themselves, and if there was anyone watching them, he would spot the watchers. Layers upon layers of care and misdirection, of planning and deception, and upon them Selene and Sendar's lives might depend. The moment passed, the king and heir moved into the circle of guards and canvas. Thin protection, or so it seemed, but stronger than one might guess, for they were out of the milling crowd, where a knife could be employed suddenly and without warning, and into a more controlled place where more watchers watched the watchers. He joined them in the background, always in the background. Now more than ever, he needed to be unnoticed. How ironic that he, who had trained for most of his life to be a leader, should now require of himself to be insignificant. How ironic that he should find, as he dropped back to be a shadow herald in his dark gray leathers, that he preferred the place in the shadows to the one in the light. He watched young Selene as, white-lipped, but with her head held high, she took her place beside her father at the planning table. And then he turned his attention to those around his king and his charge. He knew what the strategy for the initial stages of battle would be, at least for now. It had been discussed and discussed until it was tattered. He knew, and he feared that the enemy knew. But it had been too late to prevent them from knowing when the strategy was decided, and as he himself had told Daythor, no strategy survives the first engagement. You could plan and plot all you liked, but when your plans depended on the enemy doing what you thought he would do, it wasn't likely that he'd cooperate with you. Now all they could do was see what he did, and trust that they could move to counter it, whatever it turned out to be. Chances were it wouldn't be anything they had planned for. The Tedril warlords had not survived this long by being stupid. If anything, they were entirely too clever. That very cleverness had caused any ruler who might consider hiring them to take a good long look, and realize that they were in many ways as much a danger to the one who had hired them as they were to the enemy they were sent against. So no one, in all the time they had been roaming, had ever before hired the entire nation. Broken up into companies, they were safe to have inside your borders. Only the sun priests, in an act of monumental hubris, had gathered all the companies together in one place. Now the sun priests were well aware of their folly, too late to do them or Valdemar any good. We cannot simply turn them back, he thought with anguish. If we do, they will only turn on my people. And of all of those here in this camp, he was the only one who would care if they did. But what else could he have done except to act as he had? He hauled his divided attention back to where it belonged, and kept it on Selene and those around her. The tents were dark thanks to the felt lining them. The only light came from the entrance and the unlined canvas tops. 
The bases had been rolled up to ankle height to allow air to circulate. The interior of the one they were in was sparsely appointed. That would change when the baggage train caught up with them. And for now, the only seating was on folding stools. Sendar was offered one of these and refused it. Selene did not. Talamir called for food and drink, and when it came, made sure that both the king and heir availed themselves of it. Sendar was, of course, completely immersed in all the reports of the commanders, even though there was nothing new in them. Selene was looking wan, but Alberich did not suggest that she retire to her own tent. She had to harden herself. They all had to harden themselves, to go beyond what they thought they could do until there was no more strength left, then find more strength somewhere, somehow. As if she had heard his thought, she turned her head toward him and met his eyes. Then she rose and took her place at her father's side, paying every bit as much attention to the reports as he was. Although the king did not even glance at her, Alberich watched as he placed his hand on her shoulder, tacitly welcoming her presence, and showing any who doubted that she belonged there. Good. Now no one would suggest that she get some rest, dismissing her as irrelevant to their discussions. A movement, an odd movement, caught his eye. Without turning his head, he identified the movement as someone pulling slightly away, rather than leaning toward the group. His peripheral vision was excellent, better perhaps than anyone guessed, for he had no trouble telling who it was without betraying his interest by looking at the man. It was Orthalan, who was serving as the commander for the militia of his sector. His brows were furrowed, his posture tense, and he was frowning at Selene. Fifteen. Orthalan. There were some singular holes in Alberich's intelligence regarding Orthalan. At that moment, Alberich wished that he'd spent a little more time trying to fill them. But in the very next instant, Orthalan's frown vanished, to be replaced by his usual affable expression, apparently leavened by worry. And if Alberich hadn't seen the transformation, he would have thought that the expression was genuine. Now, however, he was aware that it was a mask, one that Orthalan could don in the blink of an eye, and very seldom dropped. A mask over what, one wonders. Alberich forced himself to be charitable. All he saw was a frown, which might have been occasioned by anything. That Orthalan didn't approve of anyone as young as Selene being privy to every bit of war planning going on. That Orthalan didn't like the prospect of a queen instead of a king. That Orthalan didn't approve of a female being involved in war planning. That Orthalan had indigestion. Perhaps not that last although being on the doorstep of the final campaign of a nasty war was enough to give anyone worse than indigestion. The likeliest was that Orthalan had suddenly been confronted with the fact that he would one day be serving a queen instead of a king, and given the urgency of the current situation, one day might be a great deal closer than he thought, and he didn't like the prospect. It had been some time since Valdemar had had a queen. There wasn't anyone now alive who remembered the last one. It had been a good long time, after all, and she had been a co-consort, ruling with her king, Sendar's grandfather. Sendar's queen, who'd had no interest in being co-consort, had died when Selene was a mere infant, and Orthalan had a good reason to be wary of the problems associated with a female ruler. Women did die in childbirth, and even if Selene wedded someone chosen who could be a co-consort, there could be trouble if she died. The kingdom had been left to the council to rule, while Sendar had gotten over his beloved wife's death. If that had happened when there was a crisis like this one looming, the result could have been a disaster. Could have been, but would not have been. Perhaps Orthalan couldn't understand that. He wasn't a herald, he didn't know what deep wells of comfort the companions were, and he might not understand just how totally heralds were driven by duty. If Sendar had had to deal with a crisis, even in the moment of his beloved's death, he would have. That he gave himself over to mourning was only because he knew he had the luxury of doing so. Nevertheless, Alberich did not like that frown on Orthalan's face. There was something about Orthalan's expression that he couldn't pin down, 
and his instincts said it was more than just one older man concerned about the possibilities that a young woman heir represented. It must have come as a distinct shock to him, seeing her here, seeing her being briefed instead of being sent to a tent to rest. It's one thing to see the child sitting at a council table. It's quite a different thing to see her sitting here. After all, just because Selene had a council seat, it didn't follow that she was truly a part of the council's deliberations. The seat could have been nothing more than show, for certainly Selene's vote went with her father's every time. Given Ortholan's patronizing attitude toward the heir, the shock of realizing that she was a power to be reckoned with and had a mind of her own must have been unpleasant. But was it unpleasant enough to cause that particular kind of frown? It hadn't been the look of a man surprised and a little offended. It had been the expression, calculating and angry, of one who had not realized that there was a roadblock to his plans. Or so Alberich thought. But everything he thought he'd observed was all in retrospect, for the expression hadn't been there more than a moment. It was distinctly frustrating not to be able to quantify his feelings, but since he'd been working in the slums of Haven, his instincts had sharpened and he'd come to depend on what they told him. Therefore, he would keep an eye on Lord Ortholan. So he delegated a portion of his mind to doing just that, and turned the rest of his attention back to the briefing that Sendar was getting. The Lord Marshal and his herald Joyeuse were getting to the end of things Alberich already knew, and they looked as if there was more to say, a great deal more, and that it was bad news. The four seers are reporting difficulty, Majesty, as are the far seers, Harold Joyos said. Her thin face was set in an expression of solemn thoughtfulness, for this development was something new, though not unexpected at least, not to Alberich. The fact was he was surprised that it had taken so long for the Tedrils to block attempts to far see what they were doing. Possibly they had not realized that the heralds could do such a thing with the amount of accuracy they had. Possibly they had been blocking attempts to scry magically, and had not until now reckoned on the gifts. Possibly they had been saving their mages for this moment. Or possibly it had taken them this long to buy or coerce magical expertise. It seemed to take the rest by surprise, though, all but the Lord Marshal, who looked grim. Exactly what do you mean by difficulty, Joyeuse? Sendar asked. Joyeuse's mask didn't slip, but Alberich didn't have to be an empath to know that she was very worried. As you know, Majesty, my own strongest gift is far-seeing, and although when I look elsewhere I have no difficulties, when I look across the border I might as well be looking into fog. In concert with two others I made further attempts, but we managed no more than glimpses, which were confusing at best. The foreseers tell me that they are unable to see anything when they attempt to scry into the future. But as we all know, foreseeing is chancy at best, Sendar finished for her. The most probable answer to that is that there are so many possibilities branching from this moment that they are unable to see even one clearly. I'm more concerned by the report from the farseers. Can farseeing be blocked? Officers and counselors began murmuring nervously among themselves and shifting their weight. Alberich pulled at his collar feeling stifled suddenly, and wondering if he was the only one who found the rising tension in the tent to be edging close to panic. I... Joyos hesitated. Alberich was astonished that she did so. How could she not know that it could be blocked? How could she not have expected that enemy mages would do so? And yet from the way she looked, and the way Sendar acted, it seemed that the possibility had never even occurred to them. Alberich didn't want to step out of the shadows and draw attention to himself, but he didn't seem to have a choice. No one else saw the blindingly obvious. He cleared his throat. The sound was shocking in the silence that had followed Sendar's question. Every head in the tent swiveled in his direction. Harold Alberich, Sendar prompted. Senior, high-rank sun priests such powers have, he said carefully and unscrupulous others with magic for higher R in the southern kingdoms. Among the Tedrils there may be magicians, though specifically I have not of such heard. They looked at him as if he had spoken in Carsite, not Valdemarin. 
Maybe in a way he had. He cursed his lack of fluency and the need to speak without composing what he was going to say. He tried again, this time coming directly to the point. Assume you must that others than heralds gifted are. Surely some priests are, for this I know. Surely tedrils are, for they are a nation, and some must gifted be. Yes, blocked your gifts can be. Joyeuse blinked and looked as if she was coming out of a daze. He's right, Majesty, she said. We have been remiss in assuming that only heralds are gifted, and that just because we don't know ways of blocking gifts, it doesn't follow that someone else hasn't found a way. So the gifts are useless, asked one counselor, his voice sounding strained. No, no, only farsight and foresight, Joyos hastened to say. Mind speech works perfectly well, and fetching as well, at least as far as we can tell. We've never depended on foresight. It's too rare a gift, and too erratic anyway. I can vouch for that, Alberich thought grimly. And we've never depended entirely on farsight either, Selene put in, her high, young voice carrying over the muttering, and yes, there was rising panic in those voices of those around her. We'd be fools to depend on any single source of intelligence, gentlemen. You may depend upon it. There are other ways of finding things out at a distance, including, she added with a touch of irony, common spies. Animal mind speech, replied someone. Alberich couldn't tell who precisely, for the background chatter distorted the sound. The voice was female, though, and very confident. The chronicles say that the Hawk Brothers of the Pelagiris Forest use animal mind speech with their birds as spies. Surely we can do the same, or listen through the ears of a horse or hound? The muttering subsided, and what there was of it sounded less panicky. Sendar turned to Joyeuse. Deal with it, Joyeuse. Find the heralds with animal mind speech. See what you can do. Ask Misty what's in the chronicles. Perhaps the heralds of our generation have not needed to worry about their gifts being blocked, but there's no reason to think it hasn't happened in the past somewhere, and if anyone will know where, when, and what was done about it, it will be misty. Sire. Joyeuse bowed and edged her way out of the crowd. No wonder the voice had sounded familiar, and he felt that familiar apprehension whenever he thought of the half-blind herald chronicler in training. Well, at least he'd given her enough skill to get herself out of trouble if she had to, and he could count on her strong instinct for self-preservation to keep her out of the fighting itself. Unless, of course, there was no other choice. But if that happened, everyone in a white uniform with a mount that was even vaguely pale in color was going to be in danger. The Tedrils knew better than to let a single herald escape alive. It has to be sun priests that are helping them, though. No mage worth the name would serve the Carsi or the Tedrils. No mage worth the name will serve where the mercenary guild won't. Even one of the Bloodpath mages wouldn't serve the Tedrils, in part because the Tedrils themselves would know better than to trust one of that sort. You didn't want a Bloodpath mage around. When sacrifices ran short, they tended to grab whoever was closest. That didn't make things any better, however. The sun priests had power. Everyone knew about the invisible creatures they commanded that stalked the night, able to see into a man's very soul and discern if he was a heretic and a traitor and thus their lawful prey. He himself had heard them howling in the distance. Then why didn't they take you? Cantor asked, with none of the ironic humor he might have put into such a question. Because I am no heretic, he replied, with none of the sharpness he might have put into a reply, because Cantor was not teasing him and deserved candor. I follow the writ as well as I may, and though I often fail, failure does not make a heretic. Blasphemy does. They hunt those who would defy the Condis, not the sinner. If they hunted sinners, there would be no man or woman safe in Carsey, and precious few children. And as for their other prey... I am no traitor to Carsey or my people. There was heat in his last sentence, though. He couldn't help himself, and Cantor reacted to it. Peace. I only asked to see what it was that these creatures that haunt your darkness might seek, he said soothingly. I suspect in part it is a feeling of guilt, 
and in part the fear that such guilt would cause, especially in those who think that such creatures can read their souls and know that the sun priests would not approve of what is there. Well, that was a novel suggestion, and it was one he would think about in depth, and perhaps discuss with Misty since she was here. But later, for now, since the mere mention of the fact that other peoples had as much or more magic at their disposals as the heralds did, seemed to cause Sendar and the others to act as if they were momentarily stunned, he had other things to worry about. Take it as read, you and the other companions, that the sun priests are going to try to block whatever gifts we use, he advised. I don't know how well Sendar and Joyos understood what I was trying to tell them, and even now, he truly didn't understand how the possibility hadn't even occurred to them. We probably can't do anything about farsight and foresight, but I defy them to block mind speech with the companions boosting it, Cantor said with determination. And we might even be able to boost the other gifts on an irregular basis. Good enough. Now for the rest. He waited until there was a gap in Sendar's orders and interrupted. Majesty, he said clearly, with a touch of sharpness. If blocking farsight the enemy suddenly is, when until now he has not, then is it not that he does not want to be seen, and steps his taking of that to be certain, and that would be why? Sendar stared at him a moment, his brow furrowed, and again Alberich cursed his lack of expertise in Valdemarin but it would have taken him a quarter candle mark to work out how to say it clearly, and they didn't have the time. The others just stared at him, probably trying to untangle his mangled syntax as well. Selene, who was far more used to the way he spoke, uttered an oath that would have made one of the muleteers blush. They're moving, she said, no, shouted, before her father could rebuke her for her language. Father, the tedrils! They knew we'd be watching them. They didn't care until this moment, since all we'd see is their troops building. But now they don't want us to see them because they're moving. Sendar swore, in language even stronger than Selene's, and there was no doubt in Alberich's mind where she'd learned to curse so fluently. But he put up his hand to quell the raised voices around him, stilling an incipient panic with a single gesture. Alberich hoped that Selene was taking note. This was the sort of thing a monarch needed to be able to do by sheer force of personality. Even if they could fly, which they cannot, they could not be at our border before three days have elapsed, Sendar pointed out. Since they must move on their feet and those of their horses, it will be longer than that. We have a dual task, to find another way to gain the intelligence that Farsight would have given us, and to prepare the army to meet them. The former is in the hands of Joyos and Misty, and if any two heralds can find what is needed in the past, they can. So, my friends, let us bend our minds to the latter, for it is time to finish our strategies. That is what we can do. Alberich withdrew a little, for at the moment he was best as an observer. No battle plan survives the first encounter with the enemy, he reminded himself. He'd reminded Misty of that truism often enough as well. With luck, she'd remember it, and she and Joyeuse would add several more layers to their plotting. And if he paid a little more attention to Orthalan than the rest, well, that was also part of his responsibility. It was not only an enemy that could do damage. Sometimes the danger came from within, and the one who brought it could even have all of the best intentions in the world. It was a very small tent, more like a pavilion, actually, showing old and much faded colors on its canvas, pitched among the slightly untidy cluster of those belonging to heralds assigned to the king and his officers. No two of these tents were alike, taken as they were from whatever was available after the guard, the officers, the king and his servants were done picking over the available canvas. But this one stood out for both its inconvenient size and its shabby state. As the sun dropped toward the horizon, Alberich looked at it askance. Surely not. My home away from home, Misty said, gesturing at the canvas square with its peaked top. She held the flap open to let him in. This must be the oddest campaign tent I've ever seen, 
Alberich remarked, as he squeezed himself into the tent that Misty had taken, ducking his head to avoid the low crossbeams. It's certainly the smallest. Misty shrugged. That's probably why no one else was particularly eager to take it. I think it must have been cut down after the canvas around the bottom started to rot and stitched together with replacements, because the floor is newer than the sides and top. He had expected something entirely different, a tent that was more a semi-portable library. Well, there were books, but nowhere near as many as he'd expected. His glance at the neat packing case that served as a bookcase as soon as the cover was unstrapped made her smile. I brought copies of the War Chronicles and some odd bits and nothing more than would fit in that case, she said. Only copies. If the army retreats and I have to flee with nothing more than the uniform on my back, may the Tedrils have joy of them. He didn't tell her what he thought the Tedrils would use the paper for. He just folded his legs under him and sat on the canvas floor. And this is interesting. He pointed at the arrangement where anyone else would have had a cot or a bedroll. He thought there might be a cot under there, but one third was propped up to serve as a chair back and the opposite end dropped down, and the rest had a strange tray raised over it on some sort of folding legs, with everything needed for writing arranged atop it. A brazier no bigger than the palm of his hand, stacks of very cheap wood pulp paper, graphite sticks, and pen and ink and a lantern she could hang on the tent pole overhead, which she did at that very moment, raising the chimney after it was hung to light it with a coal from the tiny brazier. And a moment later she sprinkled the coal with a powder that sent up a haze of insect-repelling incense. She grinned as she saw what he was looking so closely at. That's my invention. Bed, chair, and table in one, and it all comes apart and fits together. It even makes part of its own case. My clothes and bits are packed in the back half under the cot, and the desk is the top. And since we've got messengers going to Haven twice a day anyway, they take what I've written with them whenever they go. No matter what happens, we won't lose more than half a day's rough notes from meetings and anything else I know about. And if everything goes pear-shaped, Elkarth will at least have a record of what led up to it. She swung the desk away on a pivoting arm and sat down. He hoped that losing a half-day's rough draft would remain her only concern. For all that the bed thing was amazingly compact, there wasn't much room left in her tent. He'd seen her rooms at the Collegium. She was a woman addicted to clutter and a collector of things. This sparse minimalism was totally unlike the Misty he knew. She gave him a side glance as if she guessed what he was thinking, and a half-smile which swiftly sobered. Joy and I have had our little conference, and we have some plans. And you were right, there have been times when gifts have been blocked. And, oh, do hold back your surprised look. Buy car sites. But there are things we can do, and they have never managed to block mind speech on our side of the border. Or battle line, whichever came first. Another point of interest, if you will, is that since Levon Firestorm's time— Apparently, they've been unable to coax those night-stalking things you were talking about anywhere near the border because they haven't appeared at all over here. Now, can I count on that continuing, do you think? Alberich chewed on his lower lip and considered what he knew. He had only heard the things in the distance and had never asked any sun-priest about them. But then one didn't ask them. Interest in what they sent out might cause them to suspect guilt, or worse, heresy. But it did occur to him that although he had never heard them too near the border, the reason for that was probably less than arcane. The sun-priests would not risk themselves anywhere near the border, and they probably had to be within a certain proximity to their charges to control them. And if the Tedrils were providing a screen of bodies, they wouldn't hesitate to follow. However, the situation at the moment suggested that the sun-priests had a great deal more to concern themselves over than their ancient enemies. I think... I think perhaps that even if the sun-priests could send their servants across the border, at this point they wouldn't. I believe that they hold them back in reserve to make certain the Tedrils, after conquering Valdemar, do not turn on them as well. He raised an eyebrow. Consider, if you will, the troops we know are flanking the Tedrils the ones my spies said are not to cross the border. 
No, I think the night demons will stay within Carsey. That is a distinct relief. She made a note amid the rest on the desk at her side, then closed her eyes for a moment. She looked tired, and he wondered how long she had been here, for he hadn't noticed her among the heralds around the king. It is one small blessing, he replied. Another is that our troops have limited choice of ground, given where we think they must come, and a greater blessing is that our troops will be fresh. All they have to do is stop overnight. Their troops will be just as fresh as ours, she pointed out. They know we won't cross the border. But frankly, all I know about battles and war is what I've read, and everything I've read just makes me want it all to go away. Unless he is a madman, Alberich said soberly. I believe you will find that even the great generals feel the same. She looked down at her hands. May I ask you a horrible favor? He was going to say, it depends on the favor, but something about the way she had asked that question made him answer unequivocally, yes, instead. She fixed him with that glittering gaze of eyes shielded behind thick glass lenses, Shielded was a good thought. She probably used those lenses as shields to hide what she was thinking. May I stop pretending that I'm brave and cheerful around you? I feel as if I can trust you, more even than the rest of the heralds. I mean, you've seen me at my worst, I suppose, and you seem to know, somehow, why I have to be here. She shrugged helplessly. And I do— it's important that a chronicler be here, and it can't be Elkarth, since he can't make himself detached enough. But it's also important that someone be here who knows history, because things that have been done in the past are likely to solve a problem now. I daren't pretend I'm anything other than insanely optimistic around anyone else. Joy is not entirely certain I should even be here, or at least she wasn't until this afternoon. And if they have any idea how terrified I am— They'll be certain I'll freeze up at the worst moment and try to send me back. He felt his expression softening, and for once he let it. How odd to see her looking vulnerable. It wasn't that she ever attempted to look warrior tough, but she wore this facade of cool indifference even when he'd been training her, when she wasn't wearing an aura of annoyed irritation. He didn't think he had ever seen her look so helpless, much less on the verge of tears, he held up his hand to stop her. Of course you can, he said, with sympathy that surprised even him. And although I did not expect to see you here, I understand what you can do that no one else can. The amount of information you must carry about in your mind is astonishing. Not so much that, as I know where to look for things. I can ask Elkarth to find what I need, and he can fetch handwritten notes down here. She shook her head. I can't do that from up there in Haven. It depends on being in a meeting and seeing a problem and knowing where to look for an answer, and telling people that there is an answer right then before they get hysterical. You have to be there to know what priority to put on the problem. Reports don't tell you that. But nobody wants me here. They look at me and see a half-blind, clumsy liability who's likely to be in the way, or worse, need rescuing so I have to put up a facade so they don't find another reason to send me back. He hesitated. As the weapons master, I'm concerned that you are the person least able to defend herself here. Which is why I'm petrified, she replied in a very small voice. And I want to go home. But I can't and I won't. And I won't ask anyone else to look out for me. I never thought for a moment that you would. The tent was so small, he could easily reach over and pat her shoulder, which he did, awkwardly. Her face crumpled, but she didn't cry. Just as well. Women in tears unnerved him. She did put her own hand up to hold his on her shoulder, though, and he didn't mind. Bollocks, you liked it. You stay out of my head, he said sharply. Or at least be quiet about being there. Cantor wisely did not reply. Don't think I want you to take care of me either, she continued, even though she was shaking. I don't. I can take care of myself, even if I'm not a good fighter. I won't freeze up, and will be sensible and be the first to run away if the time comes to retreat. 
I didn't think you would ask, not for a moment. As your weapons master, although I am concerned, I am certain that I have trained you well, and I trust you to be intelligent enough to do what you must. He tightened his hand on her shoulder. But as your weapons master, you need not be brave with me. In fact, if you have concerns and feel you cannot voice them to others, do tell me. The Night Stalkers, for instance. That was a reasonable thing to consider. She sighed, and some of her shaking eased. I'm not a brave person, she said reluctantly. Actually, I'm rather a coward. I'm afraid of so much, it's easier to say what I'm not afraid of. I think about what can go wrong all the time. It keeps me awake at night, and it makes me want to dig a hole and hide in it. And even if things don't go wrong, it's still going to be horrible. People dying and blood and pain. It's one thing to read about battles, but it's something else to have one happening around you. There were so many things he could have said. That she was right to be afraid. That she would be less afraid if she stopped thinking so constantly about all the dire possibilities. He said none of them, for none of them seemed quite right. And after a moment she let go of his hand and he took it back, with a touch of reluctance, which felt a bit odd. Because you don't know how to act around a woman who might be more than a friend, but isn't either out of bounds or a whore, Cantor said bluntly. Well, that was true enough. But this was no time to try and learn how. Later, perhaps, if there was a later. And now who's dwelling on the dire possibilities? She took a deep breath, squared her shoulders, and turned those glittery lenses in his direction with a wan smile. Thank you for being my friend, as well as my weapons master and fellow Harold Alberich. It helps to have someone human I can be at ease with. He nodded. As you help me, think of the relief I feel, not only to drop my mask, but to have someone with whom I can speak my native tongue. He managed a wry smile. Perhaps you can help me with my Valdemaran, so we don't have a repetition of that scene in Sendar's tent. Only Selene understood me. Misty shook her head. At least it made her look very competent, and gave her credit a strong boost. Poor little Selene. I hope she can find someone to take her mask off with. If no one else, it will be me, he promised, reading the request for exactly what it was. Then he deemed it time for a change of subject. Now what else have you found in those chronicles? All the routes that your people have ever used to come at us. She reached under her cot and pulled out a roll which proved to be a map. I traced them all on this. Very useful. The hilly, sometimes mountainous terrain along the border only permitted so many practical routes for an invading force, and here they all were— or at least as much about them as the Valdemarans knew, since most of Carsey was unknown land to them. But he knew the border, if not as well as he'd like, certainly better than anyone here, and perhaps with the help of some of the far-seeing heralds, or the ones with animal mind speech who could see through the eyes of a high-soaring hawk, he would be able to fill in the terrain on the other side a bit, and they'd know which paths and passes to watch. Misty, I shall be sure and let it be known that you are monumentally useful, he said, and he was rewarded with a genuine smile. Now I shall go and present this to Sendar so that I can do it, and I shall write up the next lot of notes to dispatch. She tucked her legs under the tray and pulled it toward her, and that was how he left her, head down, lamplight shining down on it, an island of peace in the midst of frantic preparations for war. But his night was not yet over. He went to Selene's tent and found her toying with the remains of her dinner, a dinner which for the most part looked uneaten. Her two guardians were right with her, and her tent was ringed with regular guardsmen. He nodded with satisfaction as they challenged him, then sent one of their number to fetch someone from Selene's bodyguards who could verify his identity. That was quite right. They should never assume that someone was who he said he was if they didn't know him on sight. One of the two bodyguards recognized him the moment she put her head out of the tent, of course. Only then was he allowed inside the perimeter they had established. Selene gladly put aside the plate at his entrance. There were several lamps suspended overhead here, 
which didn't matter, since the felt lining the walls made it impossible for anyone to see silhouettes on the canvas. He noted the arrangement of the cot in the middle of the tent, now folded, with approval. Is there any news? she asked, her expression somber and a little pinched. He shook his head. That I have heard nothing, but for you, a task I have. She actually brightened at that. Good. I feel as if there is something I should do, but I can't think of anything. She reached up and tucked a strand of hair self-consciously behind her ear. I don't think there are many people besides you and father who think I should even be here. He regarded her gravely. Come, among the troops we must walk. Speak to them you shall this night and every night. Of their homes and families must you ask. Speak you must as your heart tells you, to put heart in them, to put a face, your face, on Valdemar. You mean make myself some kind of mascot? she asked, as he gestured to her guardians to take up their weapons and follow. Create a symbol. Of a sort. Speak of Valdemar you must, not just of the evil that comes to tear her, not of fear alone, but of hope. Hope. He hoped she was up to this. Sendar would likely be making his own forays among the troops, but there was a limit to his time. Selene had more of that available to her, and Selene was a handsome young girl, golden blonde and fresh-faced, and not unlike the pretty girls the men and women wearing the uniform tabards of the Valdemaran army would see at home. He wanted to put that face on the abstract notion of my land, Valdemar. He wanted them to see that their leaders served them as much as they served their leaders. When they saw their leaders, remote and at a distance, he wanted them to remember the night this one walked and talked with them. But what should I say? she asked, sounding a little desperate as they left her tent. He motioned to the sentries to stay in place. Mounted on companions, they were as safe as they would be in a knot of guards. Cantor waited for them. Cario came out of her lean-to, and Alberich helped Selene throw her saddle on her. Ask first. Ask of home and family. Ask of their welfare. Then think, and as your father would, speak. She had spent all of her life listening to her father's speeches. It was time she learned to make some of her own. In fact, there was very little she could say that would be wrong. Her mere presence out here with the troops, asking after their well-being and their background, would be enough. She would be showing the concern of their monarch, putting a face and a voice under the crown, and word of that would spread. They rode down the torch-lit paths between the tents at a walk, so that the two bodyguards could keep pace afoot, until they came to the first campfire of common foot soldiers. As fighters did the world around, they had gathered around their common fire, and there was talk, some rough joking, a small cask of beer to be shared. It all stopped when two companions loomed up out of the darkness. It ceased altogether when they dismounted. Their officer, good man, thought Alberich, recognized Selene and scrambled to his feet, then tried to drop to one knee. Highness, he stammered, as Selene prevented him from going down by taking his elbow and keeping him erect. Just Selene, uh, lieutenant, she replied, her cheeks going pink. Lieutenant Choran, ma'am, he said, his cheeks pinker than hers his eyes anxious under an unruly thatch of dark hair. Well then, Lieutenant Choran, would you make me known to your men? She replied with admirable composure. If Alberich hadn't known this was her first foray out into an army camp, he would never have guessed it. She stood, hands clasped gravely behind her back, as Lieutenant Choran introduced her to every one of the round-eyed men encircling the fire. When he was done, she picked one at random. So, Nort Hafton, what part of the world are you from? She asked, as if his answer was something she burned to hear. Borston, ma'am, east of Haven, he replied, looking as if he was having to concentrate to keep from tugging his strawberry blonde forelock at her. I know it, good grain country. She smiled at him, and he looked about to faint, yet couldn't help beaming with pride. And perfectly lovely morel mushrooms in the forest in the spring. Aye, ma'am, 
he enthused, losing a little of his shyness. That there be! She gave him a nod of encouragement, and he warmed to his subject. Why, there's a copse just out by our duck pond that— That was all it took. He was off about his father's farm, and that led her to single out others who looked as if they were losing their awe of her to want to boast about their own lands. A leading question or two was all it needed. She just gave them a cue and let them run on. This lot was all farm folk, though from differing parts of Valdemar. Companies were made up of men, and women, though it would have to be a sturdy wench who was in the pikes, who came into the force at about the same time, so that they all worked through training together and got to know one another well. Alberich approved of the arrangement. It created cohesiveness. When Selene showed interest in their lives, their homes, and their families, they swiftly warmed to her. When she showed them that she was not that different from them, they took her to their hearts. The firelight shone on their young faces, and Alberich tried not to think about how very young they were, how it was certain that some of them would not be going back to those homes and families. It wrung his heart. He reminded himself that they would only be worse off if war had come to their little farms, and they had to face it all untrained. But what about now? she asked finally, looking around. Your lieutenant is obviously a fine officer. The best, ma'am, said one stoutly, and young Choran blushed. She nodded with earnest satisfaction. If there is anything you need, then, I'm sure he'll see to it. But are you getting enough to eat? Well, no one and nothing is going to fill up cone there, said one fellow slyly, and the rest laughed. This was evidently a joke of long standing among them. But, barrin' that, it ain't home here, but we're all right, ma'am. She looked at each earnest, friendly face in turn, and Alberich watched them watching her, intent on her. It was clear that she had it, that subtle charisma that marked her sire. She had more than their attention. She had won their loyalty. My father and I want you all to get home again, she said softly, as the firelight made a golden halo of her hair, giving her, had she but known it, a slightly ethereal look. We want that more than anything, and we want you to go right on gathering mushrooms every spring, chestnuts and patan roots every fall, telling tales beside the fire every winter but that isn't going to happen if they win. Nods all around, each of them looking as if they were hearing this for the first time, even though it was hardly news to any of them. But we have what they'll never have, she continued, holding her young head high, her pride in them showing in every word. They don't have a home, and they don't want to trouble to build one for themselves. They want to steal ours. They don't have families, even. So Alberich says, she gestured at Alberich, who contented himself with looking somber, and I'd feel sorry for them. I'd even invite them to come settle if they'd just asked us. That's what we're all about as Valdemar. We don't keep people out if all they want is peace. That's the way we've always been, haven't we? Murmurs of assent with a growl under it. Good. But since these Tedrils don't want peace— don't want to build, and only want to steal our land and homes from us. There's only one way we can meet them, she continued, with a look of fierce pride that would have been incongruous on such a young face, but for the circumstances. We didn't begin this war, but by all that is holy, I swear we will end it. It wasn't the best speech he'd ever heard, but it did exactly what Alberich wanted it to. It galvanized them. Partly it was Selene's personality, partly it was that they wanted to find a figurehead for their cause. They cheered for her, and that was what counted. She thanked them in a way that made them cheer for her again, and when she mounted Cario, she was glowing with enthusiasm and flushed with pleasure. Then it was off in another direction, to another campfire, wandering in a random fashion, skipping some groups that seemed to be intent on some business or entertainment of their own, going on to others who might need her speech more. Selene was beginning to run out of energy and wilting a little when Alberich called a halt to the visits for the night and led her and her guardians back to her tent. Did I? 
she asked quietly, as the encampments quieted and the fighters around them let their fires die down and sought their bedrolls. Well, you did, he assured her. Very well, and tomorrow again you will do so, and the next night and the next, each time a different direction, a different set of fires, and know all will that their princess cares for them and thinks of them, and their king cares for them, and his daughter sends to see they are well. So for you they will fight. Not for me, she exclaimed. For Valdemar. But Valdemar you are, he countered. A face they need upon the idea. That face you are. She might have continued to voice her objections, but they had reached her tent and he bundled her inside without standing on ceremony as soon as she had unsaddled Cario and rubbed her down. Sleep now, he told her. Think and argue on the morrow. And there he left her, too tired, really, to do more than he had told her to do. She let the tent flap fall shut behind her. Cario ambled into the lean-to that served as her stable, and he mounted Cantor again. She has the spirit in her, he told his companion with intense satisfaction as they reached his tent, and he dismounted to free Cantor of his burden of gear. And she found words enough that were right to do the job. Cario helped. But you're right, and this is something that's needed. Cantor flicked an ear back in his direction. She's putting heart in them. He heaved the saddle onto its stand and hung the bridle up beside it taking up a wisp of straw to give the companion a quick rub-down. And they in her. That was the beauty of the thing. Even as she gave them something tangible to fight for, they gave her confidence and helped her to find her courage. The more courageous she felt, the more heart she'd put in them. There, that should hold you until morning. The companion gave himself a brisk shake and walked into his own lean-to. You're wasted as weapons, master, Cantor said thoughtfully, from out of the shadows under the canvas. You should have been a counselor. The Countess forbid, he exclaimed indignantly. I would rather muck out stalls. There, it's a similar occupation, countered Cantor, and his mental chuckle followed Alberich all the way to his bed. Sixteen. For days there had been nothing but drill and drill for the men, plan and replan in the commander's tent. Every day Selene sat at her father's side and listened, putting in a word or two that was always apt, always to the point. Every night she and Alberich and her bodyguards went out to another set of campfires, talking to another set of fighters. He tried to see to it that she had words with every sort from the young knights of the heavy cavalry to the archers and pikemen, from the half-wild hill folk serving as scouts to the massive brutes of the heavy foot. He had his own ears to the ground, and he was satisfied with what he heard. As he'd hoped, the men and women she spoke with talked, and soon it spread like wildfire across the entire army that the king and his pretty daughter were right folk worth fighting for who knew their people and cared for their people and would be right in there slogging it out with their people when the day came. The mood in the army shifted imperceptibly and took on a focus. That was what he wanted. Selene had helped to make it happen. Now there was a sense of the rightness of the cause and a certainty of purpose. Now their leaders were not some impersonal images somewhere. The king and heir had personalities and faces, and were well on the way to becoming beloved. Beloved was excellent. Men, and presumably women too, fought fiercely for something that was beloved. And should anything happen to Sendar, his daughter stood a fighting chance of being able to take up the reins without a pause or hesitation. Nor, should the worst happen, was there now any chance that another contender could take the throne away from her. Not that any herald would try, but he had to operate on the assumption that there could always be someone willing to attempt a coup. Certainly the common people, the guard, and the army would support her without a second thought, should a would-be usurper appear. He hadn't revealed that part of his plan to anyone, not even Cantor, though he had the feeling Cantor had guessed it and approved. 
as Sendar would approve if he ever learned it himself. Selene, of course, would be horrified, which was why she would never hear of it. Now he sat in Cantor's saddle, under a clear summer sky with dew still wet on the grass. The planning was over. It was too late now to wonder if they had overlooked anything. For now, it all came down to this. Two massive armies both rested, facing each other across firm ground. The Tedrils had taken their time getting here, and they seemed unsurprised to find the Valdemaran guard waiting for them. Seemed was the operable word, since there was no way of knowing for certain if they were surprised or not. When the Tedrils began to move, Sendar ordered the spies out and back home. And they made it. Somehow they all made it, though not entirely intact. A couple were injured escaping, but escape they did, and the last of them had come over the border two days ago. Alberich hoped that was a good omen. He could use a good omen, for he was not at all confident about this final confrontation. Of all the times to have some handle on the future, this would have been the best, for the sake of his own spirits, if nothing else. So, of course, he got no inklings at all. If the Tedrils or the Sun Priests were blocking foresight, they were doing a good job of it, if he couldn't even get a hint of what this day would bring. All he felt was akin to having an enormous wave cresting a furlong above him, about to crash down on him, and the sense that nothing he could do would get him out of the way, which was, in a figurative sense, exactly what was about to happen. He wouldn't describe the feeling as impending doom precisely, but it certainly was a sense that events were about to overwhelm him. Last night the Tedrils had camped just over the horizon. The glow of their campfires had been clearly visible from the edge of the Valdemaran camp. It had made for an uneasy night on this side of the border. Alberich doubted that anyone had gotten very much sleep. There had been scouts of all sorts out all night, and double the usual guards. The tedrils were not altogether predictable, and a night attack had not been out of the question. A lot of people had slept, or tried to, in their armor. This morning there they were, having marched into place in the pre-dawn, deliberately arranging their ranks on the other side of the valley, quite as if they were setting up for a review or a parade, looking as if they'd shown up for an appointed meeting. It might just as well have been an appointed meeting. Alberich had no doubt that they had known since they began moving in this direction exactly where the Valdemaran army was. There was no reason why the Tedrils should not have spies of their own and every reason why they should. Alberich had done his best to find them, but he doubted he'd made more than a significant dent in the population. And when it all came down to cases, it was rather difficult to hide the movement of the entire Valdemaran army from much of anyone in a country that had as much freedom as Valdemar. The Tedril spies had no doubt counted most of the Valdemaran troops and reported them on the move. Alberich could only hope that the Tedrils believed those troops were made up of old men and inexperienced boys and girls, basically the last possible lot of conscripts left out of a depleted population. Working in Valdemar's favor, of course, there weren't many options open to where the Tedrils came across the border, given where they had made their base deep in the hills. The fact that Valdemar had known where that base was, and had moved to block the only real access point right at the border itself, might, he hoped, have come as a slight surprise. Or not. If the Tedrils really truly thought they had superior numbers, there was no reason why they should care where the battlefield was, as long as neither side had a critical advantage. Alberich surveyed the Tedril nation from his place at Selene's side, and hoped that his sinking heart didn't make itself known in his expression. They filled their side of the battlefield from one side of the valley to the other, and there seemed no end to them. A hundred thousand? Two hundred thousand? More? Surely not more. Sun Lord, help us if it is. Beside him, with Selene's silver and blue battle banner streaming above her, Misty sat stock still, the mask of her lenses making it impossible to tell what she was thinking but her skin was nearly as white as her companion's hide. Misty had volunteered to take Selene's banner, and Alberich had agreed, given that it was unlikely Selene's party would see real combat.
and if they did it was because they were fighting their way to retreat. Talamir had the king's battle banner, much larger than Selene's. Both were affixed in a socket behind the saddle, and didn't need a free hand the way Carsite banners did. It was easy to tell which were the real Tedrils and which the mere recruits. Behind those shock troops, whose mounted officers had to constantly ride their lines to keep them in their places, the real Tedrils had formed up, rank on rank of them, unmoving and unmoved, silent, waiting. Their armor glittered in the morning sun, each man a minute scale upon the body of some massive beast poised to claw and rend its way to Valdemar's heart. So far away as to be just barely visible to the naked eye, fluttering above the heads of the enemy at the top of the next ridge, were the purple battle banners of the Tedril commanders. Alberich hoped that the king and Lord Marshal were proud of their fighters, who stood rock steady in the face of so numerous a foe. Two or three moons ago many of these young people had been following plows, sweating at a forge or tending beasts, or hauling nets, tending shops, working at a craft. Now they stared at the enemy, knew they were about to fight for their lives against battle-tested and hardened mercenaries, and did not flinch. There was no sign of sun-priests. Alberich strained his eyes in every direction, to be sure, but they simply weren't there, and his heart— which had sunk down into the soles of his feet, rose as far as his ankles. Thank you, Lord Vicandus, giver of life, awful in majesty. Sire, the Lord Marshal said quietly at Sendar's right, your orders? This side of the valley is Valdemar, that side is Carsey, said Sendar in a low but clear voice. We will not provoke this fight. Though they have attacked us every summer for the past three years, we will not provoke them, and we will not cross the Carsite border. If they insist on having this confrontation, they must break the peace and the border, for we will not. Sendar sounded completely calm, quite composed, as if he did not care whether the Tedrils came or not. Alberich glanced at Selene's six. All were mounted, surrounding her, the guards on ordinary horses rather than companions. Well, not quite ordinary horses. These were the big, ugly fighting horses out of Ashkevron Manor, trained by horse-talkers who were trained by Shinain, or so it was claimed. Knights of Valdemar dreamed of being able to own a single one of these beasts in a lifetime, and Alberich had never seen more than three in all of the time he'd been in Haven. But Ashkevron Manor had sent enough of their finest to mount every one of the bodyguards that wasn't a herald. They carried their armor, a set of hinged plates that protected vulnerable head, chest, and flank, as if it weighed no more than a bit of barding. Each of the guards had been schooled by one of the horse-talkers in how to handle their brutes, and had not just learned to ride them, but had bonded in a sense with them. The results were impressive. They were pleasant enough in corral and under saddle but Alberich pitied the man who met them in a fight. A single touch of the knee and a shouted command, and an enemy would be pulp. And if the horses were attacked first, their attacker would be pulp without the signal or the command. Those horses were much heavier than any companion, save Cantor. So the guards, and Krathak the healer, were in the point position for both the king and heir, carrying wide shields to ward off missiles coming from the front. The companions wore lighter armor of chain and leather, probably proof against arrows, probably not against axes. Everyone was armored, even lean Jadis. Everyone had a shield, even though Jadis wouldn't use one in a fight. If, no, say when, arrow storms fell, they'd all trained in locking those shields overhead in the formation called the Turtle, to protect Selene and Sendar. The archers would have to be in range first, though. That was what the heralds, used to judge their firing distance, would be watching for. Where's their cavalry? he wondered suddenly, as he realized that the only mounted troops in sight were the officers commanding the front ranks. I know they have cavalry, they've had them before. So where are they? No time to say anything about his sudden thought. 
At that moment a far-off trumpet sounded, and with a roar the Tedril shock troops flowed down the side of the hill, carrying with them a wall of sound, their running feet making the ground shake. In a moment they had crossed the little stream at the bottom, and so broke the peace and began the war. As they pounded toward the waiting lines, the Valdemaran front ranks braced, spearmen butting their weapons on the ground and kneeling. Behind them the pikemen also braced their longer weapons and stood fast, and behind them the archers waited arrows to bow for their officers to call the first volley. Hoy! The call came a little ragged as the first line of shouting men, their running feet pounding the meadow grass flat, set foot on Valdemaran soil. The sound of a thousand bows snapping, a thousand arrows swishing into the air was like a wind, a perilous wind. The archers aimed up so as to clear their own ranks, and not at any specific targets, for with the enemy so thick enough arrows would hit to make a difference. The wind went up, the deadly rain came down, and hoarse battle cries turned to screams of pain as arrows found seams in plate, or chain mail insufficiently fitted or tended, heads without helms, or helms without visors. And some men went down, and the ranks behind them stumbled over their bodies, but it wasn't enough to blunt the charge. Screams of pain joined the sound of battle cries and pounding feet. Now Alberich entered that singular state of hyper-awareness that a fight put him into. He saw everything, but was affected emotionally by nothing. His feelings just vanished for the moment, leaving his mind clear and his body ready to act or react. He knew he would pay for this later, when all of that suppressed emotion hit him. But for now, he tightened his hands on his weapons and watched, and waited and in a terrible sense, enjoyed. The noise was incredible. It battered the senses, and it had a strange effect on the mind. He knew this of old, knew that the quickening of his pulse and the sudden surge of bloodthirstiness was due to the very noises that assailed his ears. Whether any of the others were affected in the same way, he didn't know for certain. But he suspected they were, more or less. Certainly the men of his company had been, some more than others. At the first sound of battle, some of them had nearly gone mad with bloodlust. But those did not last very long. They were first into the fight, charging in with no care for themselves. Spearcatchers was what seasoned commanders called that sort. Oi! The best archers of Valdemar were good, none better. They could, if need be, get off two more volleys while the first was hitting the enemy. Again, the whirring as much like the sound of an immense flock of birds as a wind, again the death-dealing rain rattled down, and still they fell, and still they came. Behind the ranks of charging men, their archers walked in slowly, and now it was their turn to come into play. The spearmen and pikemen were protected by their armor and helms and stood fast. The Valdemaran archers dropped back beneath shields on orders from their officers, and the first of the Tedril troops hit the line of spears and pikes with a shock. The avalanche of sound as the two lines met was incredible, and even Alberich winced, screaming, shouting the clash of weapon on weapon. There was nothing as dreadful as the sound of army meeting army. Some of the Tedril fighters ran right up on the spears like maddened boars, screeching as they died. The rest hacked at the shafts with heavy broadswords and axes, shouting furiously, while more pikemen came up from the rear to take the place of those who'd lost their weapons. A rain of Tedril arrows fell on the pikemen and the archers behind them, but the pikemen had good armor and helms meant to defend against arrows, and the archers were under their shields and the moment the hail of arrows stopped, the archers popped out from under cover and let fly a volley of their own. This volley fell on the Tedril archers, who were lightly armored and not as fast as their Valdemaran counterparts. This time the hail of arrows took a higher toll, more screaming, and louder now. Men of both sides fell and died, or fell wounded, crying out in agony. The innocent little rill that marked the border went from muddy to bloody. 
Though Sendar watched it all, it would be up to the Lord Marshal to issue orders. Wise man was Sendar. He knew he was no more than a fraction of the strategist under actual battle conditions that his underlings were. The Lord Marshal had faced these troops in his own person for the past three years, while Sendar had only gotten his reports. The Lord Marshal had the direct experience of the battlefield that the king did not, and Sendar knew it. And at the moment, as the sun climbed into the sky and then reached its zenith, the Lord Marshal was looking for something, peering down at the battlefield with a frown on his heavily bearded face. The cavalry! Alberich heard him saying as if he was thinking aloud. Where are their cavalry? And in the same moment he turned to his herald, and there was urgency in his voice. Alberich felt both relief that the Lord Marshal had noted the same thing he had, and a heart-sinking moment of dread. Mind speak the flanks, the Lord Marshal ordered, and ask the ones with the birds. Find out if the cavalry is behind their lines still, or if they're trying to get us in a pincer. Alberich strained to hear the answer which came within the instant. No and no, my lord, the herald replied. There is no sign of mounted troops of any sort. Now Sendar turned his head to fix the Lord Marshal with a look of surprise. Then where are they? he demanded. Surely they haven't put all of their mounted troops afoot. The hair on the back of Alberich's neck stood up, and he got a sick feeling in the pit of his stomach. It traveled rapidly over his entire body, and at that moment he knew his gift hadn't deserted him. In fact, it was about to come down upon him with a vengeance. He slid down out of his saddle as dizziness engulfed him, so that he wouldn't have as far to fall when it hit him, which it was going to in less than a heartbeat. He clutched Cantor's saddle as his companion turned his head to look at him. A flash of blue came between him and the rest of the world. A woman, barefoot, bareheaded, running, but she couldn't outrun the horseman behind her. Another flash. A man, looking up from his weeding, eyes wide, then unseeing, as the lance took him through the heart. Like blue lightning, Children screaming, being herded into a pen by a dozen horsemen while the rest set fire to the village. Sun Lord, save us, he muttered in car sight, automatically reverting to the language he knew best. The visions, thank the god, were silent, silent, and he could still hear dimly the sounds of the battlefield and the people around him. What? Misty snapped behind him in the same tongue. Thank the god she did. He wasn't sure he could even understand Valdemaran at this moment, much less respond in it. The visions shook him like a terrier with a rat. The visions caught him up again and threatened to pull him in so far he would not be able to tell the others what he saw. He struggled against them, against a gift that was running away with him. Cantor, he cried, and a steadying presence held him out of the chaos of a hundred, a thousand disasters playing out at once inside his head. He could still see them, but at least he could manage to get a few words out. The cavalry has flanked us on either side, but not to attack us, he babbled in car sight, thanking Vicondis yet again that Misty was there. Misty, who knew car sight, who could tell the king, tell the Lord Marshal. They're clearing the countryside, burning the villages, killing the adults, rounding up the children. He knew why, but he didn't have time to explain. The visions took him again, despite all of Cantor's help. A man pinned to the door of his own house by a spear. A child being wrenched from its mother's arms, and the woman tossed into the flames of her burning barn. The Tedril cavalry, riding across the land like a wave of locusts, clearing it for its new masters, keeping only the young children, whom they would then take into their own ranks and turn into Tedril's. He struggled to speak, but his throat and mouth were not his own, not now while the visions held him. He knew dimly that he had gone rigid as a plank, jaw clenched, unable even to whimper. Fire, murder, fear, death. It went on forever. He was the helpless observer, unable to do anything save, sometimes in brief moments when the visions released him, babble a report of what he saw and where it was. Names came to him 
the names of villages, villages that were not going to exist shortly, but he called them out anyway. How much was now, and how much soon? How many places were far enough distant that help might come in time? He was engulfed in a sea of horror, until, without warning, the visions let go of him entirely, and he dropped back into his own time and place. Head swimming, he looked up through streaming eyes to find that he was clinging with both hands to Cantor's stirrup and the pommel of the saddle, that he had buried his face in Cantor's shoulder. Sendar and the Lord Marshal were arguing at the tops of their lungs, while Selene's gaze switched from one to the other. Her face was white and pinched, and her hands in their armored gauntlets shook. But then we'll have no reserves! the Lord Marshal shouted. And what good will reserves do us if every creature older than a child on this side of the border is dead? Sendar shouted back. He whirled and turned to Talamir. This is a royal command, King's Own. You heard where the attackers are. Now deploy the reserves and every herald not in combat to the rescue. Talamir bowed his head and closed his eyes for a moment, while Tavor stood as steady as a statue. Done, Majesty, the herald said in a perfectly calm and slightly distant voice. But do you realize that this will leave us seriously outnumbered on this field? Alberich was aware of movement, massive movement, behind them. The reserve troops were moving out, to the right and the left, the cavalry first. Ahead of them, on the swiftest steeds of all, two wings of heralds, already speeding out of sight over the crest of the ridge like a flock of swift white birds. Behind them the troops pulled out, leaving their rear unprotected. Of course I realize it, Sendar growled, and drew his sword with a bright metallic scrape. It glittered wickedly in the sun, matching the hard gleam in the king's eyes. We need to end this, now, or we won't have a country left when we win the war. There was something wild in the king's eyes that Alberich recognized, something he had felt himself down in the taverns of Haven. That feral look matched the savageness that he felt when he let himself work out his frustration on the bodies of those two-legged beasts that populated Haven's criminal underground. But he was only one Carsite herald, and replaceable. Not easily, perhaps, but replaceable. He could marginally rationalize risking himself. This was the king of Valdemar. He's not, Alberich thought with sudden terror. He is, said Cantor grimly. No, Sendar couldn't. Someone had to stop him. And as Alberich struggled to pull himself up, the companion gave a kind of twist and a shove with his nose just under Alberich's rump. That got Alberich most of the way into the saddle, and a gut-wrenching effort of arms and legs got him seated securely enough to turn and try to stop Sendar before he could move. But the king was already gone, halfway down the hill, though Alberich had no idea how he could have gotten that far in so short a time. Too late. He could do nothing for Sendar. But Sendar was Talamir's responsibility. Alberich had another. Stay here! he roared to Selene and her bodyguards, who were only just starting to react. The king's six had, the Countess be thanked, acted in concert with the king. They must have realized the moment he drew his blade what he intended to do. They rode with him knee and knee, with Talamir at Sendar's right and Jadis at his left, a flying wedge that penetrated the ranks of those between them and the struggling front lines. A roar went up as the king, his banner-bearer, and his escort of heralds and guards, and healer, entered the zone of fighting. Alberich and Misty imposed themselves as a barrier between Selene and the path to her father's side. The rest of her escort crowded in, hemming her and Cario in among them. "'Stay here!' he bellowed at her, trying to get her attention. "'Selene, heed me!' She had no intention of doing any such thing. He could see it in her eyes, wild with fear and grief beneath her light helm. She hit out at them with mailed fists, flailing at them as she sobbed and cursed. She sawed at Cario's reins. She even tried to fling herself off Cario's back and follow on foot, 
but there were no divided loyalties among those who were protecting her. However suicidal Sendar's action might be, however much their hearts and minds cried out to follow him and protect him, their duty was with Selene, to keep her safe. And if there was one thing that a herald understood, or a guardsman, or the sun's guard, it was duty. She wept and fought their restraining hands. She hit and screeched at them, with the background of the chaos of battle nearly drowning out her screams. She actually caught Alberich a glancing blow across his chin, and Harold Karen a direct hit that would leave her with a black eye soon. She called them cowards, traitors, and worse. She ordered them to let her go, pleaded with them, threatened them with imprisonment, whipping, death. He paid no attention to what she said, not because she didn't mean it, because of course she did, but because it was irrelevant. No matter how much she cursed them now or hated them later, they would keep her here, out of the fighting. Satisfied that her bodyguards had her pinned, if not under control, he edged Cantor out of the tangle and let Misty take his place. The danger to her was not less with Sendar down on the battlefield. If anything, it was greater. He pulled his own sword and stood lone guardian for a moment over the group, his eyes raking over the hilltop looking for help. He was in luck. There were still a few of the royal guard who stood hesitantly nearby, milling a little in confusion. They were not mounted, not swift enough to follow Sendar on his headlong plunge toward the fighting zone. They were torn between trying to battle their way toward him and staying to guard the air. Alberich solved their hesitation for them. To Selene, he roared at them. Given clear orders, they gratefully obeyed, and made a second line of defense in a half-circle around her, weapons at the ready, a line of four archers kneeling in front of another five swordsmen. He turned back to the group around Selene. She was still in danger if the enemy archers took it into their heads to shoot. Perhaps only the fact that the Tedril commanders wanted her alive had kept them safe so far, for they were the only members of the command group still on the ridge. Everyone else, the Lord Marshal included, had followed Sendar. He wanted to look, but Selene's safety came first. Get her down, he shouted, on the ground, and enforced his order with mind speech. No telling which of them would hear, but the companions would. Cario would. On the ground, unhorsed, get her down, form the turtle. The others fell back a little, as Misty half lunged and half fell off her companion, taking Selene and the banner with her, while Cario helped by giving a buck and a twist to dislodge her rider. Misty and Selene disappeared as Karen and Ilsa slipped off their mounts and formed the turtle over them with their shields. The guard's women looked uncertain for a moment. You four a horse stay. Help me, he shouted at them, and they stayed mounted. Cantor, I want the companions and us between the enemy and Selene, but behind the royal guard. Make a circle. Right. The companions, now without riders, made a square of their bodies around the turtle. Yourselves space out, Alberich ordered. Bunch not, but need a flank, go. Companion, guard, companion. Garbled and heavily accented as his words were, they evidently figured out what he wanted. With riderless companions between them, they wedged themselves into the circle facing outward. Under the turtle of shields, there was still a lot of movement and raised voices. But nothing was coming out, so Alberich dismissed the struggle from his mind. He looked sharply toward the battlefield. In the middle of the fighting, where it was at its most heated, the king's banner still waved, but, but their lines were now on the verge of the little stream, not behind it. Sendar's charge had carried the entire line of battle forward. Insane as the move had been, it looked as if it might have had the desired effect. He saw the faint movement above the heads of the milling fighters on the other side of the stream, behind the tedril lines, and acted on instinct. Shields up, he shouted, and put his over his head as example. The others did the same, just in time. Arrows clattered down on them, force in no wise spent by their long journey. The movement he'd seen had been the arrows arcing up to clear the battle lines from the tedril side. 
The arrows fell harmlessly thanks to his instincts. The shields, their armor, their mount's armor kept anyone from being hurt. And under the turtle, Selene was completely safe. It sounded like being caught in a terrible hailstorm, however, and the first volley was followed within a moment by a second, a third. She's stopped fighting. I think the arrows have scared her, said Cantor. Good, one less thing to worry about. The turtles stay under, shields up, he ordered, as another rain of arrows clattered onto the upheld shields. He did not look behind him to see if he was being obeyed. He knew that even if Selene rebelled, the heralds would make sure she stayed put. Misty would sit on her to make certain of that. An unfamiliar mind voice touched his inward ear. For once being clumsy paid off. If I'd tried to hang on to her and pull her onto my saddle, she'd probably have gotten away from me. But she couldn't do anything about my falling off with her. Misty? He was astonished. She'd never tried to mind-speak to him before. Don't worry, she can't get away from me now. I outweigh her by quite a bit. She might be a little squashed, but she can't get me off of her. Although he was nothing like an empath, he was astonished by the complex emotional overtones that came with her words. Amusement at her own expense, pain, anger, grief, frantic worry for herself, more worry about Selene and Sendar, and overall, terror held rigidly in check. And yet her thoughts were so clear he could hardly believe it. Even if they get this far, they'll have to get through me to touch her, and there's a lot of me to act as a shield. He didn't ask if she was all right. She wasn't. None of them were. Are you hurt? My lenses are broken, and I think I broke my ankle. But that's the least of our worries. Don't call anyone, and don't try and get me out of here for now. I won't be moving anyway until this is over, or until you have to haul her out of here and run for it. Promise me, though, if that happens, make sure I get back in my saddle. I'm curious about these tedrils, but not that curious. You have my word. He wanted to try and summon a healer for her, for she must be in excruciating pain. But she was right, and with luck her armored boot would hold her ankle well enough in place that no further damage would occur until they had the luxury of worrying about it. Given the kinds of terrible wounds being inflicted out there in the zone of fighting, a broken ankle counted as minor. There was no doubt that Misty knew what the right answers were, and was giving them, even though she probably was howling inside with terror, and the right answers were the last thing she wanted to supply. Probably. Given the level of terror and pain he sensed, she was howling deep in her own heart all right. Years ago, when she refused to learn weapons work, this was the last thing he would have expected out of trainee Misty. And in that, he had done her a tremendous disservice. And I'll make it up if we live. He turned his attention back to the battlefield, and for the first time felt his heart rise just a little. The tide of battle was turning. Sendar's charge had paid off in unexpected ways. The Tedrils had given up whatever battle plan they'd originally had and were concentrating on trying to take him down. This had the effect of concentrating all of their attention on the center of the line and gathering in fighters from the rest of the field as they all tried to be the one to take the king. Those who had been hired or recruited were the worst, for their motive was profit, not the gain of a new homeland. Even if the true Tedril commanders had not put a price on King Sendar's head, these men would think there was, and anticipate a golden reward for killing him. In the meantime, pulling away toward the center meant that the Valdemaran forces were able to draw in to enclose the Tedrils on three sides. The thick press of tedrils toward the king gave the Valdemaran archers somewhere to aim for, and they were taking advantage of that, those that were not already aiming for the tedril archers. When the enemy is in range, so are you. And there was only so much room in the king's immediate vicinity. The vast majority of those struggling to get at him could not actually fight anyone because of the press of their fellow fighters. They were tied up without being of any use. But the long Valdemaran pikes could reach them, and so could the spearmen, the archers, and the warhammers. 
The sight of their king in danger was enough to put extra strength in the arms of Valdemaran fighters. The sight of the king within reach had drawn the Tedril leaders down off their hill. And when you are in range, so is the enemy. The Lord Marshal was in the thick of the fighting, and so was Talamir. There was no one to ask permission of. He hesitated, but only for a moment. To the hells with permission. I'll apologize later. Are there any heralds with bows and the fetching gift left here? He asked Cantor, with an idea so impossible it just might be able to work. Ah, uh, Cantor paused. It was going to take a lot longer for Companion to speak to Companion in all of this mess. And he didn't want to distract anyone who was right in the middle of the melee either. He waited, watching the line of fighting swaying slowly like a sluggish snake, retreating a little there, bulging a little there. Four, and they've pulled out of combat for the moment. Have them shoot for the Tedril commanders and put fetching gift behind it. Whether they could even do that, he had no idea. But if they could, it would be something no sun-priest would think of guarding against, if it even could be guarded against. If there are any sun-priests still helping them. He had to wonder in the back of his mind if the reason his gift had suddenly broken through was because the Carsite sun-priests had abandoned their erstwhile allies as soon as the Tedrils were fully occupied with Valdemar. He hoped so. If the priests decided to mix in with this, it would make things so much worse. At this distance he couldn't see anything other than the dark purple blot under the purple Tedril battle banners. He couldn't make out individual arrows, and he wouldn't see anyone fall if they were hit, so he didn't even trouble to try to watch for it. He would know if anything happened by the tide of battle. If there are any animal mind speakers still here, ask if they can spook the Tedril horses. One more bit of damage. The officers were all a horse, and even if his arrow trick didn't work, if he could drive them off, there would be less control on the battlefield. He didn't want to interfere any more. The rest of the heralds were the only way the various parts of the Valdemaran army had to communicate with one another. Things were falling apart on their side badly enough as it was. Instead, he kept his shield above his head, although there were no more hails of arrows. The Valdemaran archers were doing that much, forcing the Tedril archers to duck under cover or even into a full retreat, and he kept Cantor turning in a slow circle, watching not only to the front, but to the rear and the sides, looking for a suicidal charge into their ranks, assuming that there could still be an attempt to capture or kill Selene. Of course, the Tedrils might not realize Selene was still here, her battle banner was on the ground, dropped when Misty lunged for her, and the only white uniform on this hilltop was Alberich's. All the more reason to keep the four of them on the ground. Then it came, a flash of blue. On the left, attackers, fresh, unwounded, and seasoned, hidden in a ditch full of bushes and about to emerge. It wasn't much warning, but it was enough. He turned to the left, spotted movement, and shouted, pointing with his sword to get the attention of Selene's guards. And they just popped up out of nowhere. A band of twenty, thirty, forty? More? Suddenly materializing, as if conjured. But they hadn't been, of course. They'd found cover and slipped through the lines, avoiding detection by avoiding fighting. It was a trick he'd used himself, and so had the bandits he'd fought. And now, at last, he had something he could vent his own anger and fear against. His blood pounding in his ears. He howled a curse at them. Cantor didn't need the touch of a heel. Cantor was just as eager for blood as he was. What Sendar could do, he could do, and for as good a cause, keeping Selene safe, buying some time for her guards to react. Before the guardsmen on foot could rearrange their line of defense to meet the attackers, he was racing toward the ambushers. Not so far to go after all, ten of Cantor's long strides at most, before he crashed into the first knot of them. Lightly armored, of course, much more lightly than he, to facilitate slipping through cover. First mistake. He got a brief glimpse of a swarthy face beneath a light-cap helm. A true tedril, then.
This was a group sent to capture the air. He swung his blade at the same time as he got that glimpse of target, and he felt the shock of his sword meeting flesh as he slashed across the line of the eyes. The man fell. Cantor made a ferret quick turn to trample him. Then he and Cantor were among them, and for the first time he learned what it was like to fight with a companion as a partner. He gave himself up to it. In fact, he gave himself up totally to it, to the terrible joy of killing for the first time in his life. He would probably be sick later, but now, now, these beasts, these fiends, were here to murder his friends, his brothers and sisters, to enslave his country. They were going to take or murder that sweet, cheerful girl he'd come to admire so much, who was so very old for her few years, and yet so charmingly young. They and others like them were killing innocent, ordinary farmers like those boys and girls he and Selene had met around the fires, old men like Daythor and women like Misty, mothers like his. Now he and Cantor would kill them. He felt Cantor's rage along with his own. Cantor reveled in the shock that traveled up his arm with every good blow. He rejoiced in the impact of Cantor's hooves on flesh. They moved as one in an awful and glorious dance of death, as Cantor's white hide and his white uniform and armor were spattered, splattered, drenched in red, as red blood ran down his sword arm and soaked into Cantor's legs. Cantor danced on bodies that crunched and screamed. He reared and kicked, hooves connecting with heads and bodies, before and behind. They were surrounded. Alberich didn't care. Let them waste their force on him. He was expendable. Selene was not. He used his shield as a weapon as well as protection, the heavy metal frame as a club and his sword made short work of those two light cap helms when he struck them at all. Mostly he went for the faces, the eyes, those dark and fierce eyes that held no pity and no remorse, only a flicker of terror when the blade came at them. He reveled in the terror. He wanted more of it. He howled in protest when they slashed at Cantor's rump. Cantor screamed in rage as they cut through his armor into his leg. They fought as he had never before fought in his life, without effort, with endless strength and energy, and in a white heat of rage that slowed time and sped his reactions. And still they fought, and continued to fight. The briefest possible flicker of blue hazed his vision for a moment, but not even his gift could conquer this unbridled rage. But something was going to happen. Something... Awful was going to happen. Then a sickening blow to the soul, that should have sent him to his knees, told them both that Sendar, Sendar his patron, Sendar his king. For a moment, just a moment, he leaped skyward out of his body and found himself looking down on the field of battle where tiny creatures fought and died. There he was, the sole target of a circle of Tedril elite, who had forgotten their primary mission in the face of his attack. He continued to fight like a night fiend, despite the fact that he wasn't there anymore. Another blow, nauseating and disorienting, struck him. His attention snapped to the battle line. Sendar was cut off from the rest of the Valdemaran forces, with only his bodyguards for protection. He fought like a demon, and so did they. But even as Alberich realized what peril they were in, Three of the bodyguards went down, leaving only Krathak, Jadis, and Talamir to fight with him. There was a blur of motion just under the noses of the companions, a shriek of pain that came up from the soul of Tavor as well as the body, and Tavor flung up his head. Then a burly hulk with an axe swung at Talamir. No, not at Talamir, at Tavor, at the exposed neck of the king's own companion. Nothing could have survived that blow to the neck, no matter how heavily armored. Tavor went down, blood gushing from the severed throat, neck snapped, Talamir with him, leaving the king's right flank open. No! Alberich howled in protest, uselessly, silently. But suddenly Jadis was there between the king and the axeman, and the axe came down. This time not across a companion's neck 
but across Jadis's leg. The companion, reacting to his chosen's agony, shied sideways, leaving Sendar unprotected. As if in a nightmare where time slowed to a crawl, yet nothing could be done to stop what was happening, Alberich saw a hundred fighters moving at the same time, saw the mob close in, like a pack of rabid dogs shoving Krathak into Sendar's side, hemming in the horse and companion so that neither could move. Watched as too many weapons to count pierced first Sendar's companion, then Sendar. Flicker of blue, and a wave of sickening horror smashed him back into his body. But he knew what he had seen was real. Sendar, the king of Valdemar, was dead. That was when a shriek of berserk rage tore the throat of every man and woman in the army and sent them against their foes in a killing frenzy, such as no Valdemaran had experienced in three centuries or more. He and Cantor rode that wave of bitter, mindless hatred, rode it and used it and let it use them until it ran out, and the foes ran out, and left them, like every other surviving fighter on the Valdemar side, exhausted and sickened, blinking at the carnage around them, peering at death through eyes that streamed with agonized tears, in grief and mourning that would never entirely be healed. Seventeen. The taste of blood was in his mouth, the sweet sickly stench of it in his throat. His nostrils felt choked with it, he thought vaguely that he should be on his knees, throwing up what little there was in his stomach, but instead all he could feel was grief and numbness. Selene, prompted Cantor, with unutterable weariness, turning his head in the direction of the air. No, not the air, he reminded himself, with a stabbing sensation in his heart. The queen... He wiped blood and sweat away from his eyes, and peered through a haze of exhaustion toward her circle of protection. He hadn't prevented all of the tedrils from getting to her and her guardians after all, just a great many of them. Another clot of bodies marked where the royal guardsmen and her bodyguards had taken care of the ones that had gotten by him. Four of the royal guardsmen were dead, the rest wounded, two of the four mounted bodyguards were down. Cantor stumbled to them. He half fell out of the saddle. His leg slash and half a dozen other wounds burned with a fire of their own, but he knew from the way they felt that though they hurt like demons were poking him, they were relatively minor. He wasn't going to bleed to death any time soon, and his injuries weren't going to incapacitate him. Therefore, as he had countless times when he was injured, he would carry on if need be until he dropped. Berda and Locasti were on the ground with their great-hearted horses standing over them like guard dogs. Locasti sat up just as he got there, holding her head in both hands. A dented helm told him what had happened to her. It was a good helm, that, double-walled with extra space between the inner and outer wall on the top of the head. A helm inside a helm, so to speak. Good job it was built that well. It had saved her from a cracked skull or worse. Berta rolled over on her side, moaning, and Lottie slid down off her mount to help her. Blood spewed from the knee joint of her armor. But she was still alive, and Lottie was down beside her, tearing off the thigh armor to get a belt around the leg, even as he reached them. Lottie had a slash of her own down her arm that she didn't seem to notice, or else she didn't care, knowing that it was minor compared to that leg wound. She's going to lose that leg, he thought dispassionately, looking at the joint laid half open. Better that than her life. Much better that than losing Selene. They're telling me all over the field that what's left of the tedrils are routed, said Misty into his mind, with a deceptive calm that overlaid hysteria. The others are telling me that they're disengaging and scattering to the four winds and our reserves have caught up with their cavalry, and they're cutting them to finely chopped bits. I think we can get up now. That was when he realized that she was mind-speaking Karen and Ilsa, and the companions, as well as himself. 
The companions spread out, and the little armored shell at the heart of their circle opened up. Your guard drop not, he croaked as Karen and Ilsa stood up, Ilsa hauling a weeping Selene up by main force. Misty stayed where she was. We don't intend to, Karen said grimly, and put her back to Selene, shield up, facing out. Alberich dropped heavily to one knee before the queen, who stared at him without comprehension, her face contorted with grief, tears pouring down her cheeks. Perhaps it was without recognition as well. His whites were saturated with drying blood, the white leather and plate armor over it blood-streaked and crusting. He must look like something out of a nightmare. Majesty, he said in a harsh voice from a throat made raw with screaming. Dear people, you must show yourself. Now, your banner must fly. No, they have a queen they must. He really, truly didn't expect her to understand him. He didn't think she would even hear him, much less realize what he had just said. But as Ilsa's armored hand fell on her shoulder in a gesture as much of comfort as a hand in a gauntlet could convey, he watched sense come into her eyes, watched with awe and wonder as she somehow, out of what reserves he could not even begin to imagine, pulled herself together. She pulled off her gauntlet and wiped her streaming eyes with the back of her hand, then straightened. You're right, of course, she said in a flat voice. Misty? Working on it. He saw that Misty had holed herself to her feet. No, foot, for the other one was held clear off the ground, and her companion was lying down on the ground so she could get into the saddle. She did so with a grunt of pain, leaned over and picked up the bloody, muddy battle banner by a corner of the fabric. Her companion heaved herself to her feet, rider and all, and Misty manhandled the banner back into its socket. In the next moment, Selene mounted Cario and pulled off her helm so that her golden hair shone in the westering sunlight. Heralds of Valdemar, Misty Mind called the voice echoing painfully in Alberich's skull. That was a strong mind call. Behold, your queen. Alert remain, Alberich growled to the remaining bodyguards and dragged himself back up into the saddle, though a gray film of exhaustion seemed to fog everything. He made a trumpet of his hands and shouted what Misty had called out to those with mind speech. He was used to bellowing battlefield orders. He put every bit of that into his shout. Valdemar, behold, your queen. From that vantage he watched as slowly, slowly heads turned toward them, in a wave of motion starting from those nearest the group on the hill until it reached even to where there were knots of fighting still going on. Misty was right, though. From where he sat there was more fleeing than fighting, and as combat broke off those who could still move took advantage of the momentary distraction of their opponents to escape. There was still a pool of purple between the Valdemaran lines and the hilltop, but it wasn't moving, and the battle banners were nowhere to be seen. Could the Tedril High Command actually be dead? I think so, Cantor told him after a moment. Yes. Your idea worked. The fetching heralds did it when Sendar died. He winced. For a moment he had difficulty breathing. If only they could have done it before. So many if-onlys. Never had a victory felt so much like a defeat. The Lord Marshal? he asked Cantor. Coming. A strange silence fell over the battlefield. The sunlight glittered on helms, but there wasn't a single raised sword or spear point to be seen. The pressure of thousands of eyes was a palpable force that even Alberich, in his exhaustion, felt. Then it began, weakly at first, but gathering strength, a sound, a cheer. Wordless, inarticulate, torn from the throats of exhausted men and women, grew and grew from a thread to a river from a river to a torrent, to a wall of sound that surrounded them. They came, walking, then running, sometimes dropping weapons, but all, all cheering, some weeping while they cheered, but all of them saluting her, their queen, Valdemar incarnate. And when they reached her, they reached for her, hands outstretched to touch her, 
touch Cario, assure themselves that she was alive, was real. She reached out to them, touching hands, faces, and as each one of them got that assurance, he made way so that others could discover for themselves that their hope still lived. Cario began to move forward, one slow and infinitely careful step at a time, taking her through the sea of upturned faces and reaching hands. Alberich and her remaining four bodyguards followed, though what they could do in this press of bodies if anything happened— let anyone so much as breathe harm on her and the army will tear him to pieces, Cantor said. She's safer now than she has ever been. The Lord Marshal's horse swam through the river of humanity to meet them, and Alberich was immensely grateful to see him. Alberich knew nothing of courts and politics, and without missing a beat, he and Cantor dropped back to ride just behind and to her right, as the Lord Marshal took the place on her left. He wasn't sure where they were going, except farther into the battlefield, until they got there, and he was having enough trouble staying alert and concentrating on Selene's back to think about it. It was slow going, wading through that surging sea of humanity. It must have taken at least a candle mark to get from where they'd been to where they were going, and by that time the handful of men and women who had not been pressing toward the young queen had accomplished a great deal. They passed through a protective ring of guardsmen into a clear space. The men working there among the fallen stopped what they were doing and respectfully dropped to their knees. There was another pile of tedral bodies laid to one side, a very large pile. The bodies of several guardsmen had been laid out respectfully in a neat row, their weapons in their dead hands clasped onto their chests, and the blood-drenched white bodies of two companions Idiot. Of course she'd come here first. Selene slid from Cario's back to kneel at her dead father's side. They'd already laid him on a stretcher, with his banner draped as a pall across his body. She pulled the fabric down to reveal his face. Alberich couldn't watch. He felt as if he was intruding on what should have been a private moment. He wondered if she hated him for keeping her away from her father's side, if she would ever forgive him for keeping her safe at the moment. But as he turned away, he caught sight of Healer Krafik sitting on the churned-up bloody ground, with Talamir's head in his lap, both hands resting on the herald's forehead. Cantor stepped carefully to the side to stand over them. Krafik looked up as if he had felt Alberich's gaze on him. His eyes were haunted, but fierce. He wants to die, Krathik said in a low voice, hoarse with shouting, screaming, and weeping. He wants to follow Tavor, but I won't let him, not now. Selene needs him. We can't afford an untrained queen's own, not now. She needs someone with every bit of international, court, and political experience possible. Hold to him, then, Alberich agreed. Jadis? They've already taken him to the healer's tent. There's nothing left of his leg to save, but he'll live, Krathik growled. Bloody hell! Those bastards knew exactly what to do at the worst possible time. We were holding our own until they got us too crowded together for the hooves to come into play, then sent a man in to hamstring the companions. Alberich bit back an oath. No wonder the two companions had gone down so easily, and no wonder Sendar had faltered just long enough for the fatal blow to fall. Stand fast, can you? he asked. As long as I have to. The new Groveborn should be coming as fast as he can. I just have to hold until he comes. What he was saying made no sense to Alberich's weary mind, but it was too much to try and think about. Jadis and Talamir were going to live, that was all that counted. A pair of stretcher carriers came up, then, and Krathik let them take Talamir up, though he kept one hand on the herald's head the whole time. They carried the herald away, with Krathik, as it were, attached. Alberich found himself swaying in the saddle, and dragged his attention back to Selene. She had drawn the fabric over her father's face again, and now she stood up. Gently bear him away, and prepare him for his journey was all she said. But there was a rush of volunteers, most of them still weeping, 
and when the stretcher was picked up there was not a finger's width of it that did not have an eager hand supporting it. As the body was taken through the crowd, men fell silent, removing their helms and standing with heads bowed until it had passed them. Selene stood looking after it, with the last scarlet rays of the sun turning her golden hair to a red-gold crown. Then she mounted Cario again, summoned Alberich and the Lord Marshal with a glance, and rode from the silent field back to the encampment. For a moment a curtain of grey haze came between Alberich and the world. It cleared up in the next heartbeat, but it was a sign he couldn't ignore. Alberich signaled Cantor to drop back a pace, putting him even with Ilsa. You and Karen, he began. We've already figured you're in no shape to protect anything, the rangy herald told him bluntly. We're on it, and what's more, the minute she dismisses you, there'll be a healer waiting to take you off. Ah, my thanks, he managed. Let them decide for themselves what he was thanking them for. He urged Cantor up again. They passed through the camp, and as they did, it was through another corridor of battered fighters. Some wanted to touch her or Cario, some just saluted her respectfully. Some murmured things like, The gods bless you, majesty, and others gazed in worshipful silence. A tiny shard of Alberich's mind that was still able to think was both pleased and sorrowful at these demonstrations. Pleased because his work with her among the fighters had borne such fruit, and full of remorse because the harvest had been gathered too soon. They moved now through a blue haze of twilight. He was grateful for it cloaked the injuries, hid the wounds of men and beasts in soft shadows from which the color had been leached. And he was grateful, too, for the fact that he needed only to sit Cantor's saddle for the moment. He wasn't certain he was up to much else. When they reached the command tent, she paused and did not dismount, as he had expected she would. Instead, she turned Cario so that they faced the crowd of quiet men and women who had followed her. Someone brought torches and stood to either side of her so that she was clearly illuminated. Her young face looked years older than it had this morning. Her cheeks smudged and armor and surcoat dirtied from the struggle to escape from Misty, Karen, and Ilsa. And still she looked, he thought, every inch a queen. We have fought a terrible foe today, and we have won, she said to all of them, her voice carrying across the stillness. And it has been at a cost that none of us would willingly have paid. I do not speak of the loss of my... my father only. I do not speak of your gallant friends and comrades only. But many, if not all of you, know that our battle plans changed without warning, and that King Sendar made a strange, and, some might say, suicidal charge toward the enemy that ended in his death, and that of many, many others. There was a reason for that, and I believe that you should all hear why my father acted as he did today. She told them all then what had happened up there on the hillside, why Sendar had sent away the reinforcements, and why he had subsequently made of himself such tempting bait that the main Tedril army threw away their own plans and strategy and were lured into defeat. All this was new to those straining to catch her every word, and there was one telling a mission. She did not say it was Alberich who'd had the visions. She let them think it had been Sendar himself. He was astonished, amazed. It was a brilliant stroke, for it made Sendar just that little bit larger than life, that more of a hero, while at the same time it kept Alberich's gift a secret among the very few that he knew could be trusted with it. If he'd thought of it himself, it was exactly what he'd have asked her to say. Since she thought of it, he could not have been more proud of her. We have lost a great king this day she said, when the murmurs of wonder had died away. We have lost a king who cared so deeply for the lives of his people that he flung his own down to save them. We have lost a wise and compassionate leader, and a great-hearted man as well. And I have lost not only a father, but my best and truest friend. Her voice caught on a sob, but she stopped for a moment, wiped her eyes, and went on. But Valdemar lives, and I live, 
and together we will make certain to be worthy of his sacrifice. There is much to do now, and much that will need to be done in the future. But we have proved today that together there is no foe that can stand against us, and no matter the odds, we will prevail. A great roar went up as she dismounted and gave Cario into the willing hands of waiting aides. Karen and Ilsa were a fraction of a moment behind her, flanking her as she walked into the command tent. Alberich did not so much dismount as fall out of the saddle, and he had to cling to it for a moment before his head cleared. Cantor swiveled his head to peer at him, but before the companion could say anything, more aides came to take Cantor away with the other three companions. Alberich set his jaw, swayed for a moment, and followed Selene into the tent, intending to stay discreetly on the sidelines. That gray haze clouded his vision, but he had fought it away before, and he would fight it away now. That was his intention, anyway. What happened was that he got three paces inside the door flap, that grayness turned to blackness, and he passed out cold at Selene's feet. He came awake all at once and blinked up at white, sun-washed canvas. It's about time, Misty said dryly, as he realized he was not alone and this was not his tent. Lay about. Come on, get up and get out of that cot. They need it for someone who's really hurt. He sat up. It was a big tent and it was full of more cots like his. He had been put in one right beside the tent wall. His nearest neighbor was... Jadis he said. The lean herald turned to face them without raising his head from the pillow, and grimaced. In the flesh, most of it, they had to take the leg. Jadis's eyes had that half-focused look of someone powerfully drugged. Alberich was surprised he could speak at all. The saying should be, better the leg than the life. He shouldn't have said that. He knew it as soon as the words were out of his mouth too late. Better mine than his? Jadis replied, voice thick with sorrow. But I didn't get to make a choice. Seldom does anyone. Alberich reached across and put one hand on Jadis's arm. He didn't have the words of comfort he wanted, not even in his own language, but Jadis seemed to understand that he meant to offer whatever support he had without words. Thank you. Jadis told him, in a tone that said he meant the words. You know, they just dosed me. I believe I need to sleep now. His eyelids dropped, and in a moment he was asleep. Poor man. I hope we can find something he can teach at the Collegium, Misty began, but Alberich interrupted her. Bah, a sad day indeed it will be, the day a herald needs two legs to do his duty. He would not hear of it, a healthy man, certainly no older than the late king, being given make-work just because he lacked half a limb. And of legs speaking, he looked down at hers. One of them was in a rather odd boot, a very thick boot. I note that you manage, having not quite a whole leg, unless a phalanx of slave boys you have to carry you a litter upon. She smiled faintly. Yes, I broke my ankle. No, I'm not letting it stop me. Though let me tell you, it still hurts like seven hells. And it's only because the healers are very good that I'm not screaming now. Between their off-and-on magics and some truly vile concoctions, even if it hurts, I tend not to care, if that makes sense. And this plaster boot they've granted lets me get around. She looked wistful for a moment. Though, come to think of it, I wouldn't mind a squad of litter-carrying slave boys. Ah, never mind. I'm supposed to tell you that Selene sent me for you. Me? He stared at her. He wasn't certain he'd heard her correctly. One of his last thoughts before he passed out, after all, was how long she would hate him. Of course you. You saved her life. She knows that. Everyone knows that. You did it twice over, in fact. Once by keeping her from following Sendar, and again when that lot of infiltrators popped up. She spoke matter-of-factly in such a way that he could not doubt her. And you did more than that. 
although there aren't too many who know it was you that caused Sendar to send the reinforcements out to save the countryside. Ah, she hesitated. Just so you know, Selene wants to keep it that way, except for those of us who were there. He didn't feel up to stumbling his way through Valdemaran anymore and reverted to Carsight. Misty, I have no objection to that. He might just as well have had the visions as I. What did or could I do about them? I just blurted them out to you, and not even in a tongue he could understand. He understood what they meant, and in his great-heartedness, elected to save his land rather than his own life. He charged the front line, knowing what he was doing, and knowing full well that he had less chance of surviving that charge than a rabbit charging a pack of foxes. Let his people think whatever they want. He deserves all of it. I told her you'd feel that way. She nodded. Anyway, Selene did indeed send me this morning to stay here with you until you woke, and tell you to come to her when you did. A bit melodramatic, that, passing out at her feet, wasn't it? He winced. I hope I was discreet about it. You weren't. But I don't think anybody cared. Actually, those of us who were still able to think were trying to figure out if we'd have to get Krafik to mind-blast you to get you to stop being so infernally noble and self-sacrificing. She lifted an eyebrow at him. He saved us from that by neatly falling over. Well... He was cleaned up, at least. Someone had done him that tremendous favor and left him to sleep off his exhaustion in a clean white shirt and trues. The rest of his whites were beside him on a chair. He started to reach for them. No, he said aloud. I put them on for Sendar, but I do not think I will wear whites again, not unless there is a pressing reason. Misty pursed her lips but looked curiously satisfied, as if she thought she had been particularly clever. I thought you might say that, so I stopped by your tent and brought these. She pulled a basket out from under his cot, and there were his form of the heraldic uniform, the dark gray leathers he had worn up until they had left Haven. Are you certain you're not an empath? he asked. No, I'm a herald with work to do, and now that you've been informed that Her Majesty wants you, I need to go do it. She softened her words with a slight smile, then suddenly reached out and took his hand. But I won't always have work to do, she said, giving it a slight squeeze. And I find you excellent company, because I don't have to pretend or mince words around you. Then she picked up a crutch from beside her stool, stood up, and hobbled off. He stared after her with bemusement. You really don't know what to do with a woman who isn't either untouchable or a whore, do you? said that familiar, faintly mocking voice in his mind. Well, why don't you teach me? he shot back, stung, and reached for his familiar gray leathers. I might, but you'll have to ask me nicely. His ears burned. Changing swiftly, he headed out of the tent, intending to pause only long enough to tell one of the healers that he would not be needing that cot beside Jadis any more. But the first healer he ran into was a very familiar face, and one he had not expected to see tending to the wounded. Krathic, he exclaimed, and seized the man's arms, grasping him by the elbows with both hands. But, Talamir, come see for yourself the healer said, taking him by the elbow. Krathic led him out of the ranks of the healer's tents and into the ring of command tents. Alberich could not help but notice some gaps where tents had been and felt a stab in his heart. But one tent still stood. Krathic led him to it. As with many tents used by heralds, it was fully large enough for a companion to fit inside for heralds sometimes preferred to know that their partners were as comfortable as they were. Inside, Talamir lay quietly in his cot, and lying beside him on a worn rag rug was a companion. For one moment, Alberich's heart stopped. There was only one companion that had that special look, that faint aura of otherworldliness. Taver. He stopped himself from blurting it just in time. The companion lifted his noble head and looked into his eyes. 
Not Tava, Weapons Master. I am Rolan. Your pardon, Alberich murmured, a little unnerved. The Queen's Own's new companion nodded his acceptance of the apology. It was a natural thought, and no harm was done. I am pleased to see you. We will probably be seeing a great deal of each other in the future, but if you will forgive me, I have my charge to tend for now. The companion turned his gaze back toward the quiet figure on the cart. Talamir no longer looked like a corpse, but he had aged, and aged greatly in, what, less than two days? He had looked no older than Sendar, middle-aged at worst, before the battle. Now he looked old, thin and worn out with long struggle, his face etched with lines of pain, and he looked fragile. Alberich felt his heart ring with pity, and wondered if perhaps it would have been better for him if he'd been allowed to die. But that was not his decision to make. Vikandus be thanked. Krathak tugged at his sleeve, and they left the tent to the companion and his charge. He did what I could not, Krathak said. He got here in so little time, well, I can't guess. But he did what I couldn't. I could only hold him just out of reach of death's gate. Roland dragged him back to life, then full awareness, and made him stay. He is awakened, then? Alberich asked, still in a murmur with a glance back at the tent. Several times. He's quite sane now, and he doesn't seem to want to die. But he's fragile. Alberich, very fragile. I've told the Queen that he's not to do much for a while, and she agrees. Krathak tilted his head to one side and gave him a penetrating look. Hmm. Alberich traded him look for look. Then... Until you say, so shall I sit upon him if need be. I knew I could count on you. Krathak slapped him on the back. Now I think the queen wants you. So I believe, and I shall my leave take of you. He hoped Krathak would say something that might give him a clue to the queen's mood. But Krathak didn't seem to have any more idea than he did. Ever since Rolan arrived, I've been too busy to go near the command tent, he replied and sighed. And at the moment, my services as a healer are in far more demand than those as a bodyguard. Alberich grimaced. Wish I could, that otherwise it were. Krathak nodded. And I. It is good to be able to use one's gifts, but... He could only shrug helplessly. They parted then, but having seen Talamir alive, if not exactly well, Alberich's heart felt a little lighter. But now it was time to face the Queen, and he was not looking forward to that. For no matter what Misty said, he was not at all sanguine about his reception. Surely Selene would never want to see his face again, after what he'd done to her. If nothing else, she would never forgive him from keeping her away from her father's side. And who could blame her? Probably she wanted to see him only so that she could tell him she wanted him to return immediately to Haven and confine himself to the Sal from now on. It was in this mood that he presented himself at the command tent. The guards, his choice he saw with pride, let him pass. He tried to slip in unnoticed, but Karen spotted him and bent down to whisper in Selene's ear. She looked up sharply. Harold Alberich she said. Silence descended like a war hammer. He cleared his throat awkwardly. You summoned me, Majesty. I did. Come here, Harold Alberich. Queens did not say, if you please. Queens issued orders, and their subjects obeyed, as did he. He made his way between two ranks of officials and highborn who parted to let him pass, thanking his luck that the tent was not all that large, for to have to pass a gauntlet of only a double handful of watchers was bad enough. She was sitting in her father's chair at his table, and she watched him with a measuring gaze as he approached. Don't kneel, she said sharply as he started to bend, and look at me. She tilted her head to one side and looked him up and down. You've gone back to your shadow greys, I see. Good. If you've no objection, except when we need you in whites for, uh, formal occasions, I should like you to keep to them, 
It will serve very well to make it clear that while you are taking Talamir's place for some little while, you are not the Queen's own. He blinked. Surely he had not heard that correctly. Majesty? He faltered. I'm... what? Krathak tells me that Talamir will not be fit for duty for a while. Until he is, I wish you to take his place here at my side. She smiled wanly. At least until you resume your duties at the Collegium, that is. Krathak thinks Talamar will be ready by the time we reach Haven. I should like Karen to go back to what she does best in my bodyguard. Meanwhile, I need someone here beside me in the capacity of advisor, as well as guard. Someone with a level head who knows when his queen needs to be dragged out of her saddle, and sat upon. Yes, Majesty, he managed, and changed places with Karen, who looked only too happy to relinquish her position. She resumed the business that he had interrupted, which seemed to concern those enemy fighters who had thrown down their weapons and scattered. Some of them, it was thought, had come north rather than south, and were trying to hide themselves in Valdemar. There were several arguments ongoing as to the best way to hunt them down. Brutal, savage plans, most of them. Apparently it was not enough that the entire command structure had been wiped out. There were plenty who wanted every single person who had so much as carried a bucket for the tedrils hunted out and strung up on the nearest branch, high enough to haul them off the ground and the corpses left to hang there until they rotted away. Selene listened impassively until the various angry speeches had been made, then looked at Alberich. Well? she asked. Have you any suggestions? He supposed that, by all rights, he should have been just as full of righteous anger. But he wasn't. He was just tired. Tired of death. Sick of the stench of it in his nostrils. He didn't want any more deaths, not if he could help it. Real tedrils, if any live, dare not the border to cross, he said slowly. And I think the sun priests a most unpleasant fate will accord them. Should they foolish enough be in Carsey for to stay? For heretics by the measurement of the sun priests the tedrils most surely are. Say I would, that their welcome will not be warm, except, of course, that it rather too warm will be. It took a moment for the others to realize what he had said, and more to figure out what he had meant. The fires, of course. There wasn't a chance that any real tedrils would be spared the fires. Someone in the back snickered, although he had not meant it as a joke. As for the rest? He shrugged. The worst of mercenaries and the most foolish of fortune hunters they are. Perhaps some are here in Valdemar. The first will swiftly run afoul of constables and guards, or even of farm folk, and in trouble they soon will be, and have them you will. Now, how to tell are we which are those that fought here, and which mere outlanders? Arrest all who with an accent speak? He raised his eyebrow. Then without acting Queen's own you will be... She blinked but nodded, and some of the muttering stopped. He had to say this much for most of the people she had about her now. They weren't stupid. What is Valdemar if not just? He asked rhetorically. Leave some guards, perhaps, to deal with them as found they are. But I think you need not hunt them. Live off the land they cannot. When their swords they cannot hire out, leave they shall, or break the law. And so you have them as lawbreakers which can be proved. The second, either a lesson will have learned, or will not, and thus also, he spread his hands. So you're saying we shouldn't just track them down? Lord Orthalan asked smoothly, as if the question was of no matter to him. Just leave them as a menace to the countryside? I say find them you will without hunting. Hide they cannot, and with nothing more than what on their bodies they have. Little have they to live on, and only one trade they know. But what if they try and pass themselves off as laborers? Someone asked angrily. Alberich raised an eyebrow. To escape labor it was that most turned to sell sorting. Wish them joy of it, I do, and find they may only the hard-hearted as masters. Please, said Selene, in an exasperated tone of voice. Do think this through. 
Do any of you want to keep this army together, spending the treasury dry to feed them and keep them in wages, just to frighten the locals by riding over their fields and interrogating anyone who looks the least bit out of place? And how do you propose to tell one of these tedrils from, oh, say, a hillman out of Rethwellen looking for work, or a poor brute of a car site who's taken advantage of this to cross into Valdemar for sanctuary? Or are you actually proposing, as Alberich said, to string up every man with a foreign accent from the nearest tree? I repeat, begin with me, you would have to, Alberich pointed out gently. There were some embarrassed coughs. I won't even begin to point out how my father would have responded to such an idea, she continued, looking at all of them and making a point of staring each in the eyes, until he either dropped his gaze or met hers with agreement. It is so totally foreign to everything Valdemar has always stood for. I agree with Alberich. If anyone has crossed to our side of the border, the likeliest thing is that they'll try to get over to Rethwellen and be of no concern to us. If any stay, they will either settle and fit in, or not, and break the law, and we can deal with them on that basis. Well, Majesty, Lord Orthalan began, but he was interrupted. Damn it, I will see her majesty, snapped a querulous, aged female voice that he knew and had not expected to hear. And a moment later the owner of that voice, someone he knew, as well as he knew himself, pushed her way in past everyone. He should know Harold Lyca, though he'd last seen her just before she left to infiltrate the tedrils in her guise of an old washerwoman. After all, he'd helped form half of the memories that now made her what she was. And given that fact, you shouldn't be surprised that she's as stubborn as a mule and as intractable as a goat, Cantor put in, as she bullied her way right past the Lord Marshal, made a pretense at a courtly curtsy, then stood glaring at Selene with her hands on her hips. Selene stared at her blankly and without recognition. Well... She wouldn't recognize Lyca, though she might know the name, for as far as Alberich knew, neither she nor Cario would have seen Lyca before. Harold Lyca, Majesty, Alberich said carefully. One of four Herald agents behind Tedral lines she was. Within the camp, infiltrated was she as a washerwoman, and very valuable. Damn right, the old woman grunted. And that's why I'm here. I want to know what the hell you're going to do about the children. Selene blinked. I beg your pardon, Harold Lyca, but we do already have people, healers and others, out trying to find the children whose parents were killed by the Tedril Cap— Not those children, Lyca exclaimed. Not the children of Valdemar. I'm talking about the Tedril children. What are you going to do about the Tedril children? Eighteen. What Tedril children? Selene asked blankly. Alberich was going to explain, but Lyca saved him the effort. This wasn't just a mercenary company. This was a nation, she said with the irritation of a teacher whose student hasn't studied her subject sufficiently. Granted, they'd made a vow never to wed or have families until they had a land of their own again, but that sure as hellfires didn't stop them from breeding. Selene's eyes widened, and her mouth made a silent O shape. What's more, they used to pick up every stray boy chick they could get their hands on and throw him in with the rest, Lyca continued. Not to mention the ones they kidnapped, not a few of them from our own people. They didn't have much use for girls until they were of breeding age, but boys, oh my yes. That's why they were taking such pains to keep our littles alive, so they could turn them into tedrils. Now you've got a camp full of orphans and other youngsters over there that the car sites are not going to want. You've killed off their fathers and protectors. If they even have mothers, their mothers are probably halfway to Rethwellen by now and might not have waited about for them. And what are you going to do about it? Won't the car sites just take them? Selene asked, looking to Alberich. Probably no, he said reluctantly. Carsey needs no extra mouths that come not with hands that can work. And 
They are heretics, and the children of heretics, and what is more, even their own blood, to the sun-priest's eyes, they are not, or no longer are, Carsite. He did not elaborate on what that meant, but there was something very unpleasant stirring in the back of his mind, something like a protovision, an intimation not of what would be or what was about to be, but what might be, a vision of the fires of cleansing and the fuel that fed them. I don't want to sound utterly callous and hard-hearted, Harold, but not to put too fine a point on it, what can we do? the Lord Marshal asked. They're on Carsite land, in Carsite hands. She looked at him as if he was an idiot. And this stopped Vanuel? This stopped Levon Firestorm? The Lord Marshal wasn't about to back down. That was in another situation entirely, he retorted. And if you're referring to the Demon's Bane legend, Vanuel was on Hardorn land, not Carsite. Alberich cleared his throat. A uh, herald like a, a question. Suppose I must that you have these children been among. Think you they can be anything but Tedril? Most of them aren't now, she replied and shook her head. Some of them, in fact a lot of them, are Carsite orphans. Some of them are camp followers' children. And dare I repeat myself, some of them are ours, grabbed every time they hit Valdemar in the past three years. But like I said, they don't have much use for girls that aren't breeding age, so they don't pay any attention to them. And boys aren't useful until they're thirteen and old enough to take into a Tedril Lodge for training. So they're all right up until then. Basically, they're not Tedril, they're not Carsite, they're not anything, really. When I was in there, they had a lot of the camp followers that were tending to all of them, and most of those girls were out of Rethwellen, CJ, and Ruvon, with a couple of Carsites. So that's what they've been raised as. Raised as nothing, then, Selene ventured. Pretty much. A pretty weird mix. They all speak a kind of Tedril pigeon with words from all over. The girls don't ever get taught pure Tedril tongue. That's a man's mystery. The kiddies have got some little religious cult they've made up on their own that isn't like anything I've ever heard of. Like I said, they aren't Tedril. They aren't anything. She sighed. What they are is dead needy for adult attention. Even an old hag like me they swarmed over. But babies without mothers, someone put in doubtfully. Babes in arms, she shrugged. That little the Tedrils don't take. The ones born to the camp followers, well, they may be whores, but they're still mothers. The ones that'll bolt, they'll take the children they can manage to carry and run for Rethwellen. That leaves the orphans, or ones whose mothers don't care, and there's a couple hundred anyway of an age we could rescue, no more than a thousand— Selene glanced at Alberich, who was thinking furiously. Carsey, I think, might be busy elsewhere. Elsewhere hunting down all the escapees on their side of the border, and either conscripting them as bound slaves or making sure no one else ever does. And, he continued, if the rescue and evacuation were made quickly, might not know it had been entered at all. And a thousand children, Selene gulped. It's not an unmanageable number, the Lord Marshal put in. It's not as if it would be a thousand captives. Most of them couldn't run far. Laika snorted. Show them food and smiles, and most of them won't run at all. And don't forget, some of them are ours. And if word gets out that we left Valdemar and children to starve, or hope for the mercy of the sun priests... She let that particular statement sink in without elaborating. What's more, they aren't more than a day's march inside Carsey. When the Tedrils moved this time, they were preparing the full-on invasion, remember? They thought we were going to go over with just a push, and they had everything and every one set to move straight across the border. Surely not, Lord Orthalan said skeptically. Surely they were not going to put all of that so close to the battle lines. Lyca smiled grimly. And what makes you think they were unaware that the moment the fighters left the base camp, the Carsites were likely to grab everything? Believe me, that was the talk all over the camp. Everyone wanted to be sure that they didn't get left behind. The last camp they made would be where they left all the non-combatants and the baggage and all. In fact, there was talk about setting it less than a half-day's march from the border, figuring that the closer it was to Valdemar, 
the less likely it was that the car sites would come calling. The campfire glow we saw in the farther sky last night was probably from their full camp, not their battle camp. I thought they looked rather too well rested, murmured the Lord Marshal. Then that means we won't have to break the border so much as bend it a little, Selene said speculatively. I suppose one could consider what is in that camp to be legitimate war loot. Now it was the Lord Marshal's turn to smile grimly. One could, Majesty, the Lord Marshal said. And in fact one should. Why, after all, should the Carsites have the benefit of this war booty when it is Valdemar that suffered? Alberich merely raised an eyebrow. How can we, calling ourselves civilized, leave children to suffer, and welcome in Carsi they will not be? Now Selene looked to the rest of her advisers and commanders. I, honestly, gentlemen, ladies, I think we should do this. I know we can. I think we should. Bringing life out of death? asked the chief healer. I don't think there is any doubt. Send our wood. Selene smiled wanly. My father would have been at the head of the expedition, she said softly. That seemed to decide them all, and the prospect of having a positive task to organize also seemed to galvanize them, lifting them somewhat out of the slew of depression that most of the encampment had sunk into. The mood in the tent suddenly lifted, and even Selene's voice took on more life than it had held since before the battle. We'll need wagons to carry the children, won't we? She asked breathlessly. How many? Where will we get them? We already have them, Majesty, said the chief healer, catching fire from her enthusiasm. We were going to send some of the wounded north, leg injuries not so serious but needing some recovery, but they'll gladly wait for a little to save these children. The horses are harnessed right now, the wagons are provisioned. We haven't loaded the wounded yet. Why, we can be ready to go on the instant. She turned to Alberich. Would you? Of course he would, the Lord Marshal exclaimed. Great good gods, who else? You used to patrol here, didn't you, man? And you won't be doing without him for more than a day or two. What about us? Laika interjected. Oh, good gods, not as leaders, but we know the Carsite language and we came across here to get out, and the children know me at least. Give me a moment and I'll send a messenger about the wagons, the chief healer put in, and they were off with the bit between their teeth. Alberich simply stood there while all the decisions were made for him. They seemed to accept without question that Alberich should serve as the leader, and that Laika and the other three spies should be in the rescue party, and that it would consist of heralds, healers, and wagons. Heralds to act as eyes, ears, and, if need be, guards. Healers to soothe the children and wagons to carry them. The decision to go was made so swiftly that if, as Laika asserted the camp was no farther than a half-day's march away, Alberich reckoned that they might get there and back by this same time on the morrow. And it slowly dawned on him that no one, no one at all, even thought about the question of his loyalty. Of course he would lead the rescue, he was the best person for the job. Of course he would bring these children, some of them Carsite, back to Valdemar. And of course he wouldn't even consider taking the opportunity to defect back to his homeland. He was a herald, wasn't he? Divided loyalties didn't even come into it. Perhaps there were a few who thought differently, but there always would be. There would have been had he come from Hardorn, or Menmeleth, or Rethwellen, or anywhere else other than Valdemar. Within a candle mark the whole thing was organized and ready to go, with plenty of volunteers. He hadn't been surprised by the ones among the heralds or even the healers, but the fact that the teamsters had lined up to a man had come as a bit of a surprise. He was a little uneasy about leaving Selene on her own, though. Still, she was essentially on her own from the moment her father died. She has trained for this for years, hasn't she? If she couldn't handle the reduced council now, when there was so little opposition and she was the darling of the army— what would she do back in Haven? And as for her bodyguards, they were taking their job just as seriously now as they had before the battle. If any true Tedrils had survived, now would be the time for an assassination attempt. For now, whoever still lived had nothing to lose, 
and such men were the most dangerous of all. Selene saw them off, but she kept things brief. Go safely and swiftly, she said, and impatient to be off, they took her at her word. She didn't linger to watch them rattle across the little stream at the border either. When he looked back, she was gone. Not only was he not surprised, he was pleased. It wasn't as if she didn't have more than enough on her hands, for the aftermath of a war generally left both sides in shambles. There were hundreds of decisions to be made, and in the end only the queen could make them. Then, when one factored in all of the messages and dispatches arriving from Haven moment by moment, every one of them requiring her attention, he was certain she would be getting very little rest between now and when he returned, which might be just as well. It would give her very little time to brood, and might exhaust her enough that she would actually sleep instead of lying awake, staring at the darkness behind her eyelids. It was a strange sensation crossing onto the Carsite lands of the hills, where he had once ridden at the head of a troop of Sunsguard. A close watchkeep for bandits, he warned everyone when they first set out. Driven away by the battle they were, perhaps, but like vultures, return to feast upon the slain they shall. He had to wonder, though, as they rode through empty valleys and over hills bare of the usual flocks of sheep and goats, if the sun's guard had actually sealed off this area. If that was the case and bandits had fled the coming conflict, they could easily have run right into the sun's guard. He hoped so. He truly hoped so. Not only because it meant that they would not encounter any trouble going there and back, but because the scum that had fattened on the misery of the shepherds of these hills for so long well deserved to be cut down like the plague rats they were. It was easy enough to know where to go, despite the fact that there was no road to follow. The marching feet of so many thousands of men had left a road across the landscape. The tough and wiry vegetation hereabouts pounded flat, then into dust. This was a tough country, of scrubby vegetation and endless hilly moors, punctuated, as he used to tell Daythor, by endless rocky hills. Yet it had its own beauty. The gorse was in bloom, and the heather— and drifts of purple, white, and yellow spread hazy blotches of color across the face of those hills. The weather elected to smile upon them today, or the Sun Lord himself did, for the sun beamed down upon them, neither too brazenly hot nor thin and chill, out of a sky whose blue was interrupted only by the occasional white, fluffy cloud like one of those missing sheep. Once or twice they caught sight of wild goats on the ridges, or heard the bray of an equally wild donkey but otherwise it was nothing but wind and bird song. He had no idea how low his spirits had been in the wake of the battle until they were well away from the battlefield, and he could allow himself to pretend it had never happened. But the clean wind swept through his heart and soul. He was going to a rescue, not a battle, and he felt as if the wind was carrying away his sadness a little at a time. And this was home. The breeze felt right. The hills smelled right, they were the right color of gray-green, and the right sort of rocks poked up through the thin soil. He might never see these hills again, so he absorbed the changing landscape, stowing it away in his memory to take out on those nights that would surely come when he felt himself to be entirely alien in an alien land. Finally he had to remind himself to stay alert. This was no pleasure jaunt, things could still go wrong at any moment. If the Sun's Guard wasn't busy picking off former Tedrils, they could be here at any moment. This is a handsome land, Cantor observed, ears pricked forward to catch every sound. Hard, but handsome. I think so, he agreed, secretly pleased by Cantor's compliment. Ah, we'll be coming up to a spring here shortly, if my memory of this area is any good. There aren't a lot of good watering places here. Warn the others that we'll be stopping for a moment. His memory was good, and, interestingly enough, the Tedrils had not made use of the spring he recalled, for they had to deviate from the track and go over a hill to the east to get to the half-hidden water source. When they did, they found no sign that anyone had been there, and the Tedrils would surely have trampled the bank of the stream that the spring fed and muddied the basin but Alberich was taking no chances. Just to be sure that they hadn't been here and tampered with the water, 
which would have been entirely like them, he called over one of the healers. Test this, for fouling or poison, can you? he asked the green-clad woman. Hmm. She gave him a sidelong glance, but bent to test the water, taking up a single drop on the end of her finger and touching it to her tongue. That would have been like those bastards, wouldn't it? she said absently. Spoil what's behind them so the car sites couldn't follow. My thought, he agreed gravely. Well, it's clean. You can bring them all in. She stood up. He waved at the wagons, and the teamsters brought their charges in to drink at the stream fed by the spring, while the humans drank at the source. Toothachingly cold, the water tasted of minerals. The horses adored it. Fortunately, they were not so thirsty that they were in any danger of hurting themselves by drinking too much too fast. He kept an eye on the crests of the hills around them. The disadvantage of stopping here, or anywhere, for a drink was that doing so made them very vulnerable. But this spring, flowing as it did out of the side of a hill, at least was not as exposed as the stream it fed that ran along the bottom of the valley. He put a lookout on the crest of the hill, which was all anyone could reasonably do, and trusted also to his gift and that of the farseer that was with them to warn of any danger approaching. But all that appeared was a herd of sheep and a dog, and a very brief glimpse of the shepherd, who turned his flock aside and back over the hill when he saw them. At least he'll know the water's safe, Cantor pointed out, as he rounded everyone up, anxious to be gone now that they had been spotted. I don't think he's likely to say anything to anyone for a while. Days, probably. Considering the taciturn nature of the lone shepherds here, Alberich was inclined to agree. The sun priests hated them, for they could not be controlled as easily as villagers. They thought their own long thoughts alone out here, for moons at a time, and could not be compelled to come for the regular temple services. You could not leave sheep to tend themselves while you hiked to the nearest village for sun descending, sun rising, solstice, and equinox, after all, and sheep tended to run astray when they felt like doing so, not on any schedule. If there was to be wool for the wheel and the loom, and mutton and lamb for the table, the shepherds had to be left to their own ways and thoughts. The priests were not amused, but they could do nothing about it. On a rock, beside the mouth of the spring, he left the thank token for whoever actually owned the resource. It might even be that shepherd. But whoever laid claim to the water rights would find the proper toll for the use of his water. Alberich had packed several such needful things in Cantor's saddlebags before they'd left. In this case it was something virtually every hillman would find useful, the more especially since the confiscation of so many weapons by the sun priests. A tedril crossbow and a quiver of quarrels for it, all wrapped in oiled canvas to keep them safe. There was nothing about any of the tokens Alberich had brought that said Valdemar, and nothing, such as, for instance, a bit of gold, that would be difficult for a poor hillman to explain. These were, after all, his people still. He would have a care to what happened to them when he was gone again. And on they went taking to the pounded track once again, as the sun sank on their right and the light edged into gold, and golden orange and the shadows of the hills grew long and stretched across their path. That was when he sent Lyca and a younger herald out on a long scout ahead. If Lyca was right, they should be getting near to the camp, and he began at the usual futile attempt to probe at the near future, like a man probing at an old wound to see if it still hurt. As usual, his gift was silent, which was in a way a good thing, since it wasn't warning him about anything. The sun was dropping nearer the horizon now, and the sky to the left had turned a deeper blue, while the sky to the right, with long banks of cloud across the path of the sun, was turning red. It would be sunset soon, and they still hadn't found that camp. He was beginning to be concerned. They would have to decide very shortly whether to go on under the full moon, able to see all right but risking ambush, or make camp themselves. Alberich, came a mind call. It jerked him out of his preoccupation with scanning the hilltops for trouble, and made his heart race in sudden alarm. Steady on, Chosen. That wasn't trouble, Cantor said. And in the next moment he knew that his companion was right, of course. If it had been trouble, there would have been warning and alarm in that mind voice. 
It was from the youngster who had gone out with Laika, and the next words that came were excited, not fearful. Albrich, get up here. You have to see this to believe it. The excitement communicated itself to Cantor, who tossed his head in sudden impatience to be gone, ears pricked forward, muscles tensing. Laika and Kulin something have seen, he called to the rest. Keep to the track. Summoned I have been. Cantor evidently felt that was enough. He launched from a swift walk into a flat gallop, speeding over the top of the hill, down across the next valley, and over the next hill, and the next, and the next. And that was when Alberich saw why there had been so much excitement in Kulin's mind voice. Because coming slowly toward them, flowing over the hill like a dusty moving carpet, was an army. An army of children. Not just children, he saw, after his first astonished look. There were some adult women among them, but not many, and they were burdened with infants, slung across their backs and their chests, carried in baskets even. It was clearly the children themselves who were in charge here, and it made Alberich's heart leap into his throat to see how carefully they were tending to each other. There were carts pulled by donkeys and ponies full of the very smallest, led by those old enough to control a beast. There were more carts that the tallest and strongest were towing themselves, and those old and strong enough to walk by themselves were doing so in little groups, each shepherded by one older child. And now that Alberich was here, Lyca was not going to wait any longer. She and her companion raced toward the oncoming horde, and after an initial reaction of alarm, several of the children recognized her and dropped the bundles they were carrying to race toward her, cheering as they went. Cantor? I've told them, Cantor replied joyfully. They're putting on some speed. By the time Alberich and Cantor got to the front of the mob, Laika was engulfed in children, all babbling in that strange polyglot tongue she had told him about. He remembered what else she had told him as they rode on the way, that these poor children were starved for adult attention, that she used to tell them stories, and had made herself a kind of extended grandmother to a great many of them. The dry, bare bones of her narrative did not prepare him for seeing this, and he felt his eyes stinging with tears. At least he had had his mother, lonely though his childhood had been. He felt a tugging at his sleeve, and looked down at a little girl who had the features of one of his own hill-folk. "'Auntie Laika says you were of the people of the Sun Lord,' the child whispered in car sight, peering up at him hopefully. "'And that you are of the white riders of the ghost horses now.' "'I am both,' he told her, immediately dropping to the ground to put his eyes on a level with hers. "'This is my ghost horse. His name is Cantor.' Ghost horse? Where did she come up with that? I like that a great deal better than white demon or hell horse, Cantor said, lowering his nose to touch the hand she stretched out to him. Have you really come to take us somewhere safe? she asked, as he marveled that a child of Carsey should ever reach toward a companion without fear. We have. But who told you of all this? he asked, trying to make sense of the puzzle. Who told you about ghost horses and white riders? If it was Laika, he was going to have a few choice words with her. That sort of story could have gotten her killed and the other three heralds exposed. Oh, it was Cantus, of course, the child told him blandly, in a tone that put the emphasis on, of course. Cantus has told us about the white riders forever— and he promised us that some day they would come and take us where there are always good things to eat, and a soft bed to sleep in, and no one would make us walk when we're tired, and that we'd all have a mum and a da, though we'd have to share. Before he could ask her who Cantus was, much less where he was, and how he had come up with this unlikely tale and convinced them it was going to be true, she caught sight of something past his shoulder, and with a squeal of glee ran off. He looked around. What she had seen, and what had set the rest of the children running, was the first lot of heralds and wagons topping the hill, brushed by the scarlet and gold of sunset. And in a moment he was nothing more than a rock in a flood of children who found a little more energy in their weary bodies to run. They flowed around him like the largest flock of sheep in the world, 
faces transmuted by hope, and it was all he could do to hold back his tears. And of course, faced with this oncoming flood of children screaming, not in fear but with delight, the heralds and healers and teamsters reacted just as any decent human beings would, tumbling out of the seats and off their mounts to open their arms and their hearts, to open the boxes and bags of provisions they had brought, to stuff little hands and mouths with food and drink, and toss little bodies into wagons padded with blankets, even as more little bodies were helping even littler ones to climb up as well. They couldn't understand what the children were saying, but they didn't need to know to understand what was needed. And many of them were smiling with tears in their eyes. How could they not? After leaving that grim scene of battle aftermath behind them, how could they not want to ease their own aching hearts with the warmth of a joyful child? And it was all sorted out in a remarkably short period of time. Those carts that had been drawn by children were fastened to the backs of the wagons. With the children themselves sharing out the provisions in a generous way that made Alberich marvel, everyone got enough to fill his empty belly. The few camp followers who had come with the children rather than fleeing, burdened with abandoned infants, were provided with seats and clean linens for the babies, and in lieu of milk, sugar water for them to suck to at least stop their crying and ease their hunger. The last of the teamsters, finding no need for their empty wagons, asked permission to go on under guard and see what they could get out of the abandoned camp. After a moment of thought, Alberich gave his permission, although with unchildlike forethought, the little ones were all carrying loot in their bundles, whatever was small, valuable, and light. They gave it up to the heralds without a second thought, and that pained him. Did they think they would have to pay for their rescue? No, Lyca said when he asked her that. No, this is just something that this mysterious Cantus told them to do. He relayed that information back to the army via Cantor, along with his recommendation that at least a portion of it be kept in trust for the children themselves. That was all he could do about it, but they seemed far more interested in eating and sleeping than in the jewelry and coins they'd lugged along, so he dismissed it from his mind. As if the one god had decided to ease their way further, the full moon rose before the last light of twilight faded. With the broad track to follow, there was no chance of getting lost, and not much chance that a horse would make a misstep and hurt himself. Accordingly, there was never even a thought but that they would turn around and head back to the border. Bit by bit, as Lyca and the other three talked to the older children, a broad picture began to form of what had happened. One of the first Carsite orphans, scooped up by the Tedrils when they first made their alliance and moved into Carsi, was a boy they all called Cantus. It was he who had somehow concocted the odd cult that Lyca had noticed among the children, a cult that admitted no adult members, and whose members were sworn to secrecy with a solemn oath that apparently not even the boys who were later initiated into the Tedril lodges ever broke. Most of the cult that Cantus had created had a very familiar ring to Alberich, for it was virtually identical to the simple forms of Vacandus's rites that he had learned as a child from his mentor, Father Kentrock, even to calling the god by the name of Sun Lord. But there were more interesting additions. Cantus had, from the beginning it seemed, included a kind of redemption story, told whenever times were particularly hard for the children. He told them all that some day the keepers, as he called the Tedril adults, would abandon them and never return, and on that day the white riders and their ghost horses would come for them and take them all away into a new land. This would not be the home of the Sun Lord, he had assured those who, out of bitter experience, had feared that this meant they would all have to die. No, this was a very real land where they would all make families with a shared set of parents, where they would always have enough to eat and a warm, safe place to sleep, and where they would never have to follow the drum again. The children stolen out of Valdemar only reinforced Cantus's stories when they identified the White Riders as heralds. Somehow, he had impressed upon them the need to keep all of this utterly secret, even more so than the redemption story. And somehow he had known the very moment when the Tedrils lost their battle, 
for even before the remnants of the army came running back to the camp to take what they could carry and flee, he was telling the children that now was the time. He organized them, told them they should get what they wanted and whatever shiny things they could find in the adult camp, hide the ponies and donkeys until the last of the adults were gone, and prepare to march north themselves as soon as the last of the keepers fled away, which was exactly what they had done. Those camp followers who had not run off with skirts stuffed full of valuables and some protector or alone had been bewildered by the stubborn insistence of the children on their goal, but had gone along with it, seeing no other options before them. Most of them were heartbreakingly young by Alberich's standards, and not yet hardened from camp follower to whore. They must have set out from the remains of the camp about the same time that Alberich and his group set out from Valdemar. The entire story was mind-boggling, and he wanted very badly to meet this boy, this so clever, so intelligent boy, calling himself Cantus, and speak with him. But though he rode up and down the line, he could not actually find the boy. One child after another asserted that, yes, Cantus was certainly with them, somewhere, but no one could tell him what group Cantus was with or where he'd last been seen. He might have been a figment of their collective imagination. He might have been a ghost himself. For he had somehow utterly vanished from among them the moment that they spotted Lyca and Kulin. 19. The wagons loaded with the most portable of the Tedril wealth caught up with them much sooner than Alberich had anticipated. This was in part because the portable wealth was very portable indeed— and in part because the section carrying the children was moving slowly. The poor things were exhausted, and even packed together like so many turnips in a sack once stuffed with food and water, they fell asleep. So, since the treasure wagons were going to have to catch up with the main part of the group anyway, Alberich took their pace down to a steady walk. Lyca came up beside him. Now that night had fallen, he was able to relax his guard. Lyca, sharing his memories of Carsey, was similarly relaxed. Nighttime held no terrors for Alberich now, not after so many years in Valdemar. If the sun priests unleashed their demons, and given how quiet the night was, he rather thought that said demons were fully engaged in pursuing stray tedrils at the moment. He didn't think they would bother to do so here. So far as the sun priests knew at this point, there was no one in this part of the hills but the children and why waste their most dangerous and powerful nighttime weapon on a lot of children? Children who couldn't escape on their own, and would soon be facing the fires anyway. He had to unclench his jaw over that thought, and he sent up a silent prayer, not the first, and he doubted if it would be the last, that one day the sun priests would be answering for their transgressions, and one day it would be priests like his old mentor, Kentrock, and like Father Henrik and Gary, who would be ruling in Carsey again. One of the other heralds came riding up, looking nervously over his shoulder. Harold Alberich, shouldn't we be putting outriders all around? he asked. I mean, peace. At ease be, protected we are by the priests themselves, Alberich said, and exchanged a glance with Lyca. She laughed. Carsites won't stir out of their doors after dark she said, with the air of one who knows. Their priests have a habit of sending some sort of creepy howly thing out at night to make sure nobody's out doing something they shouldn't. Even the sun's guard stirs not, Alberich added with sardonic amusement. So that now, should even a priest order them out, they will not go. Caught in their own trap, Lyca said. And serve them right. So by the time the sun's up, we'll be so close to our people that even if they catch on we're here, our folks can mount a big enough rescue to squeak us across without losing so much as a hair. Alberich considered how much the tedrils had drained from the country, and sighed with pain. If they scout or far see us, we take, so far as they will know, useless mouths only. We leave, think they will, the camp unplundered. Privately, he doubted that even the sun priests would trouble themselves with far-seeing this part of Carsey. They would use their power to track down the Tedrils and Tedril recruits. They must know that Sendar was dead, 
but they must also know that now was not the time to attack Valdemar themselves. Valdemar had just fought a terrible battle, and were exhausted, yes, but the Carsite Sunsguard was drained and weakened by the demands of the Tedrils. The current Son of the Sun, he set bandits against Valdemar, then hired the Tedrils to do his work for him, Alberich thought somberly. And now, thanks to the drain that the Tedrils put on his resources, the Sunsguard must be even more depleted. He hasn't got the means to attack us. No, the Sunsguard would be mopping up what was left, with the priests assisting. Then they would all descend on the Tedril base camp, with an eye to getting back what had been drained from them. Believe me, there is no way the plunder in that camp can be exhausted, even by us and the Tedrils that were left, Lyca told them both. There will be enough there to satisfy priestly greed even after our wagons come back. It isn't only the Carsite treasury they've been draining. They've got the accumulation of some twenty or thirty years' worth of loot from other campaigns they've fought. And they've been saving it all, waiting for the day when they'd have their own land again. She scratched her head, thinking, and added, I'll give the bastards this much. They had discipline, almost a quarter century of honest pay, extortion, and booty, and they didn't spend a clipped copper coin more than they had to. Every fighter had his own store of loot, but beyond that every true Tedril war duke had a treasury tent, waiting for the day when he could finance the building of his own fortified keep in the heart of his own principality. Alberich was greatly pleased to hear that. If the wagons sent onward came back so well loaded, then perhaps the children's little hordes could be kept solely for their use when they were older. If the ride out had been a mixed pleasure— the ride back was an unalloyed, if bittersweet, one. With all worry about encountering Sunsguard gone, under a glorious full moon and a sky full of stars, and buoyed on the energy of the successful rescue, there was nothing in the way of opening themselves up to pure aesthetic enjoyment of a tranquil ride through peaceful countryside. The Teamsters, once the situation was explained to them, relaxed and sat easily on the seats of their wagons. Even the babies only whimpered a little now and then. Timeless and dreamlike, they moved on across ground that seemed enchanted and drunk with peace. It was as if the one God was granting them all a reprieve from their grief, the sorrow that would confront them when they crossed back into Valdemar, giving their hearts a rest so that they could all bear it better when at last it came. Just about the time when the moon was straight overhead, he heard the wagons coming up behind them, the sound of the wheels echoing a little among the hills. Since they were near to the spring they'd used on the way in, he called a halt there once the whole party was together again. The children didn't even wake up. More about these children, tell me, he asked of Lyca, when they were on the move again and a comfortable sort of fatigue began to set in. The moon, silvering the grass around them, turned the landscape into a strange sculpture of ebony and argent. With hoofbeats muffled by the soft earth and grass, they seemed to be moving in a dream, and he asked the question more to hear a human voice than for the information itself. "'You'll find they're a funny lot,' she replied. "'You'd think, being mostly not taught anything, that they'd be wild. But, well, once they got out of babyhood, they pretty much had to teach themselves and take care of each other, and by the gods that's what they do.' Maybe it was because so many of them lost their whole families, but they've got a kind of motto, nobody left behind, and they stick to it. The older ones see that the little ones get fed and clothed, and the little ones do what they can to help the older ones. I think they're the next thing to illiterate, but they'll drink up anything you teach them like thirsty ground. They all found out that the Tedrils themselves may not do anything for them, but if they made themselves useful, they got rewards beyond whatever the Tedrils dumped in their section of the camp. So that's another thing they learned to do, how to make themselves useful. Then, when that Cantus child showed up, he really organized them. Of course, I didn't get to see much of that since I was an adult. She coughed. Very secret, that cult was. No grown-ups were to hear about it. So, when into our camp we bring them, they will helpful be, he hazarded. I would be greatly amazed if they didn't swarm the place doing all sorts of little chores. 
Anybody expecting a bunch of terrified wild little beasts is going to get a shock. Having them around is a lot like having a tribe of those little house sprites some old stories talk about. They can't do heavy labor, but by the gods, when they get determined to do something, it gets done. I had to fish more of them out of my wash tubs than I care to think about. She chuckled a little, then sobered. Listen, you have the queen's ear. Make sure no one breaks them up into little groups right away. Let them sort themselves out. They've made up little family groups of their own, and it's all they've got. Make sure none of us take that away from them. I shall, he promised. It wasn't a difficult promise to make. The caravan moved on, ghosting through the darkness, and even at the slow pace they reached the border again a little after sunrise. The children were awake by then, and peering eagerly ahead, Alberich had elected to come into the camp not from the south directly, but indirectly from the west, saving the children the sight of the battlefield. They might have run tame in the Tedril camp for most of their lives, and they might be inured to the aftermath of battle, but he didn't think they had ever seen a battlefield. Even now there would still be much of horror about it. The result of so great a conflict was not cleaned up in a day or two, and it was no sight for these little ones. So they actually made a detour up country, leaving the trampled road that the Tedrils had left until they struck an old track that crossed the border at a ford and joined up with one of the Valdemaran roads used by border patrols. The old track showed some wear, so someone was still using it. It was rutted and gave the Teamsters some hard times, but they took it in good part, knowing they were nearly home. Whenever a wagon got stuck, the children, if it was one that was carrying children, all piled out and the largest children mobbed it, put their young shoulders to it, and helped in the front by hauling on the horse's harness. No wagon remained stuck for long with that kind of help. For Alberich, crossing the border brought on a mood of melancholy and depression. Not despair, but his heart sank with every pace they came nearer the camp. For a little he had been allowed to forget but only for a little, and now they had all lost so much, so much. And yet, just as they approached the camp, with what seemed like half the inhabitants waiting for them, and in the very moment that the blackest depression descended on him, the children changed the complexion of everything. They had been clinging to the sides of the wagons, peering over and around each other trying to see ahead, when they saw the lines of white-clad heralds and companions, they could not hold themselves back. They boiled out of the wagons, spilled over the sides, tumbled to the ground, laughing and shouting, and ran to those who waited. White riders! White riders! they shouted, virtually the only car sight they knew, pouring into the camp and running up to anyone who looked even halfway friendly, as if these were not strangers but friends and beloved relations. There were a great many of these children, he realized, as more of them spilled out of the wagons and carts, more than the thousand that Lyca had promised. But no one seemed to mind. Certainly no one called him or Selene to account for it, not then, and not at any time thereafter. And in the days following, as the bodies were burned or buried, as the wounded were taken north, as the encampment was disassembled and troop after troop of fighters sent north again, it was the children who kept them all sane. They were everywhere, poking their noses into everything, trying to learn Valdemarin, trying to help where they could, and just being children, some for the first time in their short lives. Not even Selene was proof against their sheer exuberance at being here, a place that they seemed to consider an earthly paradise, and before long she had adopted a half-dozen, or they adopted her, making them her pages and promising that they would be allowed to join her royal household in that capacity once they all reached Haven. Nor was she the only one. Every wagon going north seemed to hold a handful of children going to a new home. Fighters, teamsters, heralds. Servants and high-born, everyone who could take in two, three, or four children did so. I never would have believed it, no matter who had told me, if anyone had claimed that bringing these children here was the best thing we could have done. Selene told him on the third afternoon of the return, watching a child dash away with a message to be given to the next dispatch rider going out of the camp. 
Her eyes were still shadowed with sorrow, but her lips curved in a faint, fond smile. I thought that it was something that had to be done, but truth to tell, I was dreading the mess they'd make for us. They'd taken down the black felt linings for the tents, and the painted canvas glowed with afternoon light. That, too, was a mixed blessing. More light raised the spirit a little, but the black felt had gone for use as shrouds. And I, he agreed. Most unnaturally helpful, they seem. She had to smile at that just a little. You don't see them at their worst. They're still children. They still fight, and get into things they shouldn't and have tantrums. But for all of that... I'm afraid that in years to come they're going to be held up as the good examples that every naughty child in Valdemar should behave like. Or perhaps, as children being, a year from now and they will know better nor worse than others become, Alberich suggested. She flicked a fly away with the feather end of her quill. Perhaps. She put pen to paper and signed another order. Who knows? I'm no foreseer. And I see not that far when I see it all, he admitted ruefully. If I had been, could I have changed any of this? Or was it all too big for any one man to change? Speaking of the children, I've given some thought to what to do with them, the ones that haven't managed to get themselves adopted already, that is, she said, looking up at him. And I wanted to ask what you think. Keeping them to their own uh, families, you are? he asked a little anxiously, because he had seen, just as Lyca had told him, how they sorted themselves out into their own little families and stayed together. It had been the smallest of those groups of two, three, or four children that were the ones that found homes first. Of course, she replied. It doesn't take an empath to realize we shouldn't tear apart what few bonds they have. But that's where the problem lies, you see. There aren't too many families, or even childless couples, prepared to take in six or a dozen children at once, much less ones that don't even speak our language. So my first thought was to, well, send them to school. She folded both hands over the papers on her little desk and looked anxiously at him to see what his reply would be. He nodded. That made perfect sense. Like the Academy? he hazarded. She nodded. Or the Collegia. Oh, obviously they can't actually go to the Collegia. We haven't nearly enough room for them. But something like the Collegia. And there are a lot of Valdemaran orphans to deal with, too. Though those are having to go to the Houses of Healing, I'm afraid. They need mind healers right now, not schooling. Her face darkened for a moment. But she took a deep breath and went on. So I've written to all of the major temples the ones with both day and boarding schools, and asked if they would take in some of the families for a year, teach them Valdemarin and some basic reading and writing, until I've got these orphan collegia built. She waited for his response. He pondered what she had told him. Your project, this is? She nodded. If I have to, she said with some of the same mulish stubbornness of her father, I'll pay for it out of my own household budget. He raised an eyebrow. Doubt do I, with the current mood of the council, you will have to. And now she had the good grace to blush. Then better to push it through now than wait, she said, raising her chin. Given that the booty from the Tedrils has furnished the means to restore all the damage they did down here, there isn't a great deal for the council to complain about. That was certainly true. Lyca had been correct about that as well. So, build housing for these children, but... Homes? he prompted. I'm going to look for childless couples and ask them to serve as surrogate parents, she said, warming to her subject. More than one couple, of course, for each house. It will probably take a year to get that all sorted out. Find couples that like each other enough to share that kind of responsibility, get the houses built. But then we can keep them all together. We can probably even put Valdemar and children in with them. That he interjected. A most good idea is. Help each other they can, and good it would be for Valdemar and children to know Tedril children are no different than they. She sighed deeply. I was hoping you would say that. 
Then it's settled. I'll put it up to the council first thing. Maybe they won't think it's as important as some of their other business, but I do. So the prophecy is going to come true after all, that the children of the Tedrils were going to have real homes, though they would share mothers and fathers. Once again he wondered about that mysterious child called Cantus. Since arriving back in camp, he'd been too busy to look any further for him. And by now he could be gone. Well, this will be the last one of these that I sign here, Selene said, signing the last of the papers waiting for her signature and seal and putting it in the pile of completed work. She closed her eyes for a moment, and it cost him to see how worn and tired she looked. I won't miss this place. Nor I. He could not wait to be gone, truth to tell. If this had been Carsey rather than Valdemar, the aftermath would have been left for the locals to clean up but it wasn't. So now there was a neat cemetery with rows of wooden markers out there where the churned-up ground had been, and a pit full of ashes where everything that wasn't Valdemarin had been disposed of. There had been too many burials for single ceremonies. Each day at sunset had ended with a mass ceremony at which the names of the interred fallen for that day had been read. He had come to hate sunset, as each sunset brought fresh pain or the renewal of old, as names of those he hadn't known were gone, and those he had known were dead, were read out. He woke each morning, it seemed, with the scent of death in his nostrils, and went to sleep at night with a heart too heavy for tears. Only Sendar and a few of the highborn were going north to find burial. It was too bad, but there were not many who could afford the expense to bring their loved ones home, and the horror of transporting that many bodies, stacked in the beds of wagons like so much cargo, and in the heat of summer, did not bear thinking about. There wasn't a teamster in the country who could be induced to use his wagon and team for that, but that was always the case in war. The highborn had already been taken north in their expensive sealed coffins by the family retainers in black felt-draped wagons bedecked with family crests. Only the king was left to make his final journey in the company of his daughter and those who had known him best. It would be an honor guard, and it was an honor to be included in it. And here was the one factor that leavened just a little the sadness of the journey for Alberich. No one, not one person, had objected to his presence at Selene's side. Talamir had already been sent north with the wounded, and there was no queen's own to ride with her. But she wouldn't need the Queen's own on the journey, only bodyguards. The council had gone on ahead, and now that the most urgent needs had been answered, all decisions were being held until Selene reached Haven. So when it came down to it, Selene only needed her bodyguards, not Alberich. Yet no one said a word when she posted the final list of who was to accompany her, and chief on the list was Harold Alberich, acting Queen's own. Are we on schedule? she asked, packing up her writing case with greater care than the simple task warranted. Ahead a little, he told her. In readiness all will be for leaving at dawn. She closed and locked the case, then sighed. I suppose I'll be expected to make a speech. Yes. He did not elaborate on that. He felt horribly sorry for her, but it was her duty and she knew it. But there was another aspect to this journey of grief that he didn't think she had considered. Not only the army mourned its king, but the country. It is wondered, Majesty, if pausing you will be at each village. They'd left it to him to ask that delicate question. That and any others that might come up. He was acting Queen's own, after all. Delicate questions, it seemed, were a part of the job. At each village? she asked, looking blank. A speech to make, he elaborated. She frowned and looked as if she had suddenly developed a headache. Oh, gods, I don't want to. But people are going to want to pay their respects, aren't they? But each time we stop, it's just going to make this whole thing drag out longer and... The frown turned into a look of despair, and he sensed that if he told her she should make all those stops, she'd do it, but it might break her. He racked his brain for an answer, and finally thought he had a compromise. Majesty, perhaps not a stop and not a speech, but spectacle, 
something from memory and showing honor. A herald sent ahead to warn each place that we come then, drop pace to a slow walk, with a... Uh, Muffled drums, lowered banners, through each place's center, though a detour we make, no speech but, uh, he sought for the word desperately, on your part to be the icon of grief. You need speak not, only mourn publicly. She looked as if he had taken a huge burden off of her shoulders. The very thing. Would you go see to it for me? Get it all organized? She must be near the breaking point or she wouldn't delegate that to me. At once, Majesty, he promised. Please, be eating, would you? Little have you had since morning. That got a thin ghost of a smile from her. Except for the accent you sound like Talamir, or my old nurse. All right, Nanny Alberich, I'll go get something to eat, and I promise I'll get some sleep too. Maybe I'll have Krathak give me something to make me sleep and go to bed early. That most wise would be, he said. And eat you must. Too thin are you. How are you to get a husband so thin you are? She stared at him for a moment in utter silence, as he kept his face completely expressionless. Then, weakly, she began to laugh. He allowed himself a smile. She wiped away a tear, but he could see that some of the lines of grief and worry around her eyes had eased. And they say you have no sense of humor, she said. Nor do I. All know this, he assured her. Go now, and something impossible demand of the cooks. Impossible? That caught her off guard. Why? First, that a reason they will have at last to complain. Cooks must complain. In their nature it is. Second, that injured their pride has been that you have asked for nothing. Their pride is in that their masters demand much of them. Third concerned they have been that you have asked for nothing. They fear you need them not. Fourth, they worry for you. He raised an eyebrow. But be certain, though impossible, it is something you want. Suspect I do that they will create it. Ah, she blinked. Do you know everything that is going on around here? He shook his head at that. Not I, but Cantor I have, as Cario you have. Our companions know much, and what they know not, generally they can discover. Sendar made use of that, often and often. I'd better get used to doing the same, then. This time her smile was a little stronger as she picked up her writing case and stood up. And I'll think about impossible things to eat on the way to my tent. Can you find Krathak and send him to me, while you're doing all the other things I've asked you to? Without difficulty, he returned her smile. Ask Cantor I shall. They left the tent together. She picked up her escort of Ilsa and Karen at the door of the command tent, and went her own way in the golden light of another perfect evening, while Alberich started off on the last of the errands she had set him. The last turned out to be the first. Krathak was nearby, and heartily approved of Selene's wish to sleep early. Most of the rest were trivial and easily discharged, that left the organization of what were essentially funeral cortèges through every hamlet, village, and town on the road to Haven. But rather than solve that one himself, he asked Cantor to have all the heralds that were left in camp, save only Selene's bodyguards, meet him back at the command tent and bring with them the remaining highborn, officers, and bards. The latter because bards tended to be very good at concocting ceremonies, and he suspected they would have some ideas. They did, and it didn't take very long either, since this was only going to be a procession. The greatest amount of time was spent in deciding what the order of precedence was going to be, and then what places in the procession would belong to whom. He left them at it, after about a mark. His place would be with Selene, and if they settled their differences without any interference from him, even if not everyone was happy, they couldn't attach any blame to him or the queen. And nothing would be required of her except to follow the wagon carrying the coffin on foot, with Cario walking beside her. Certainly no speeches. The focus of attention wouldn't be on her, but rightfully on the king's remains, which should be something of a relief. So he hoped, anyway. If she wept, all the better. He hoped she would weep. She hadn't done nearly enough. 
By this time it was full dark and the camp was quiet. With an early start planned for the morrow, most people had, if their duties allowed, made an early night. He moved down the now familiar lanes of tents in the light of the torches stuck on either side of his path, thinking that this place would look very odd when all of the canvas had been struck and there was no sign of what had stood here but trampled grass. I'm glad to be leaving, Cantor said. So am I. At least in Haven there would not be the ever-present reminders that this was the place where they had lost a king. His tent had been moved inside what had been the royal enclosure to adjoin Selenae's, and out of habit he glanced at hers to see if there was any light showing. There wasn't, and with a feeling of relief he nodded to the guards at the tent door and entered his own. They didn't trouble to leave guards inside the tent any more. Selene's little pages all slept in bedrolls spread out across the floor, and anyone trying to get in would probably step on one of them. He certainly wouldn't get in quietly. Those children slept lightly, and the least little sound sent half a dozen heads shooting up. Any intruder would set off more noise than disturbing a flock of geese. A lantern had been lit for him and hung from the center pole showing that most of his baggage had already been packed up and presumably put on the wagon. There wasn't much left, only a bedroll, a set of clean linen and the towels and soap he'd need in the morning, and Cantor. Most Harold's tents were big enough for their companion, Misty's being an exception, but she had obviously gotten last choice on accommodations. Somewhat to his surprise... It wasn't at all unusual for heralds to share their tents with their companions, rather than using the canvas shelters. Cantor took up roughly half the space. That first night in his own tent again, bowed down by grief, he had craved Cantor's company with a need that was almost physical. And Cantor had obliged, by leaving the canvas shelter at the side and moving into the tent proper. And at first, despite that craving... It had still seemed unnatural in a way to have a horse in his tent. Now it was just as in the old days, when he had shared tent space with another son's guard. It no longer seemed at all odd to see him there. Excuse me, I believe I am far better company than any of the son's guard you ever shared tent space with, Cantor said indignantly. He felt instantly contrite. I beg your pardon. Indeed you are. Did anyone leave anything here for me to eat? Selene's swarm of little ones had adopted him as well, and lately had taken to fetching food for him at the same time that they got meals for her, leaving them in his tent, well covered and protected against the depredations of insects and other pests. As a matter of fact, they did, and I don't suppose you'll share, Cantor asked hopefully. Since his appetite had suffered as much lately as Selene's, Cantor's hope was well-founded. I don't know why not. He sat down on the bedroll and saw that the usual covered platter and cup had been left for him, cleverly balanced on two more cups and a pan of water, which prevented insects from crawling into it. He took them out and shoved the pan of water over to Cantor's side of the tent. Taking the cover off the platter explained why Cantor had hoped he'd share. Selene had asked for the impossible, gotten it, and had seen to it that he got some of the cook's largesse. Perfect for the heavy weather and a failing appetite were two salats, a savory one and a sweet, the former a bed of greens with cheese, bits of chicken, fragrant herbs and spiced vinegar, the latter of chopped fresh fruit and nuts with honey-sweetened cream. How had she known he'd like such things, too? Piff! She asked me via cario, of course. She doesn't need being told something twice. I'd like some of that cress, please, and some spinach. With the empty platter and cup left outside his tent door, he stretched out along his bedroll and listened to the sounds of the camp. He had been a soldier for too long not to be able to sleep when he needed to, but he had also been a soldier for too long not to be able to assess the mood of the camp just from the night noises. Tonight he sensed mostly weariness and relief. They had been here long enough, and through work and time, what had been terrible anguish had muted to bearable sorrow. Now it was more than time to go home and take up their lives again. Except perhaps for Selene, 
The time for grief was over, and the time to move on had come. And that was as it should be. When morning came, he was barely able to get dressed and out of his tent before Selene's servants swarmed all over it. Her tent had already been struck, and she was finishing a strong cup of chava and a buttered roll while in her saddle, as he escaped from the collapsing tent still tying the laces at the collar and cuffs of his shirt. One of the pages handed him a similar cup and roll and waited impatiently for the empty cup. Another brought Cantor a bucket of grain. The companion immediately plunged his nose into it and began his own breakfast. Prudently, Alberich ate and drank before getting into the saddle. There wasn't a chance he'd be given a chance to finish unless he did. The chava wasn't scalding hot, as he had feared it might be, but the heavy admixture of cream and sugar, and the color like thin mud, warned him that it was probably from the bottom of the pot. It was. Even with the help of cream and sweetening, it nearly made his hair stand on end. But it certainly woke him up. He handed the empty cup to the page, who took it and vanished. The second whisked off the bucket the moment Cantor lifted his head from it. All around them tents were falling in the thin gray light of pre-dawn. Selene gave her cup to a page just as Ilsa and Karen walked their companions into what had been the royal enclosure. Alberich was in the saddle a moment later. Selene looked around at the vanishing camp. Is breaking camp always like this? she asked, a little dazed. A camp we Sunsguard seldom had, Alberich admitted. I got the impression last night that everyone was pretty impatient to be out of here, but don't take my word for it, Karen shrugged. I don't usually serve with the army. That speech you should make before we leave, I fear, Alberich told Selene in an undertone. But it will be the last until Haven we reach, this I can promise. She grimaced but nodded. I hope you two know where I'm supposed to be, she asked the other two. That's why we're here, Ilsa told her. They sent us to fetch you. Selene gestured broadly with one hand. Well, lead on, since you know where we're going. The procession, for procession it would be, even when it wasn't going through a village, had already begun to form up on the road. Karen and Ilsa went straight to the front of it, where the rest of Selene's guards were waiting. The funeral wagon would not be immediately behind her, but would be the first of the string of wagons. Bard Lelian, in charge of the ceremonial part of the journey, came up and introduced himself. Majesty, I have devised something I hope will meet with your approval, he told Selene, ignoring the rest of them in a way that told Alberich that his single-minded focus was due to anxiety, not an intention to slight them. It will not be the ordeal that stopping for speeches would have been. You will merely have to drop back and take your place on foot behind the coffin when we reach any sort of town, along with the rest of the notables who have been deemed of high enough rank to follow you afoot. That is all. Simply follow afoot and do whatever you feel impelled to do. Selene's relief at the simplicity of the arrangements was obvious. Then when you have dropped back, the riders here at the front will all divide to either side of the road, let the wagon and the walkers pass, and fall in behind the last of the walkers, except for two bards with muffled drums. The bard finished. Those will ride in front of the wagon. He peered anxiously at her. He was not a young man, but he didn't seem to know Selene very well. I hope that meets with your approval. He's a specialist in this sort of thing, Cantor confided. Funeral dirges, memorial ballads, funerary rituals. Rather a melancholy profession, I would think, but apparently it suits him. This is the first time he's had anything to do with the royals, though, and he's nervous. I think it is very fine she told him, and he smiled with relief. You must have worked terribly hard to come up with something this appropriate at such short notice. Now he blushed with pleasure and murmured a disclaimer. She raised her head to assess the state of preparations even as he thanked her. We seem to be ready to move out, Cantor told his chosen. Would you sound a call for silence, please? Selene asked the bard, who snatched up the trumpet at his saddlebow and played a four-note flourish. 
Silence fell immediately, and Selene rode Cario up onto the bank beside the road so that everyone could see her. This seems to be a moment that requires a speech, she said into the waiting silence. But a speech to me means something that has been prepared for the ears of strangers, and after all that we have been through together, I think that none of us are strangers now. She paused and looked up and down the road, and Alberich knew that she was making certain each and every one of those in this cortege felt she had made eye contact with him. Perhaps some day, when our losses are not so fresh, our wounds are not so raw, we will be able to look back on our victory as a victory, with more pride than sorrow. And we should. It was not only my father's sacrifice that won the day. It was the sacrifice of every single person who perished or was wounded, and every one of you who held a weapon, who wielded your gifts, who tended a beast, kept us fed, or served any other task here. The victory belongs to all of you, and never ever let anyone tell you differently. She took a breath, blinked hard, and continued. And even if the enemy had won here, he would never have taken Valdemar. For Valdemar is more than land. Valdemar is the people, and the spirit that lives in those people. And that spirit can never be conquered. Now she looked at the sealed coffin draped in black, and covered with a pall upon which the arms of Valdemar were embroidered a pole that had once been Sendar and Selene's battle banners, and which were still stained with blood. Not just Sendar's blood, either, but that of all those who had been with him, whether wounded or fallen. He knew that, and he trusted to that spirit to carry on, no matter what happened to him. You have shown that spirit is alive in all of you, and he could have no better tribute than that, nor would he have asked for anything more. Another pause. And I do not ask for anything less. Well said, my queen, he mind spoke to her, and was rewarded by a brief flicker of her eyes in his direction. Now it is time for all of us to tender him our final service, she finished. Now let us bear him gently home. And she rode down the bank to her place at the head of the procession and lifted her hand in signal. Alberich took his place at her side with Karen and Ilsa to the right and left. She dropped her hand, and they moved forward on the road to Haven. And though there had not yet been a ceremony or a coronation, everyone in that procession knew that this was the moment when the heir truly took up the reins of power. And so, in silence, but for the sound of hooves and feet and wheels on the road, the reign of King Sendar ended, and the reign of Queen Selene began. Twenty. The journey north accomplished for Selene what the clean-up of the battlefield had done for everyone else. It allowed her to indulge in the full expression of her mourning in public. Until the moment of departure, she had held her grief firmly in check, feeling that with so many others suffering, she should not further burden them with her own grief. If she wept, she did so only in private. Everyone she knew mourned, but she did so quietly. But on this journey, her public duty was to mourn, to be the symbol of Valdemar's grief, and at last she could give free rein to all of the anguish she had held inside. It seemed that everyone along their route wished to pay their final respects to the king. Farmers left their fields, shepherds their flocks, tradesmen their crafts. Villagers and townsfolk lined both sides of the road, and the road itself was carpeted with rushes, flowers, and herbs whenever they entered a town, so much so that the wheels of the wagons were muffled and cushioned against bumps. People carrying baskets and great bouquets of blossoms, and even hand-woven garlands and blankets of flowers, brought them up and placed them on the wagon, as it crept past them at a slow walk, until it overflowed with blooms and foliage, and nothing of the black-draped coffin could be seen. And they wept, which had the effect of freeing Selene's tears. It was exhausting for her, but at the same time it was exactly what she needed. Alberich and Krathak saw to it that she got plenty to drink, plenty of clean handkerchiefs, and the occasional arm about her shoulders. 
The healer concocted soothing eye washes to rinse her sore eyes and face with whenever they stopped. She ate with growing appetite, which was no bad thing, and was so emotionally exhausted by the time they camped for the night that she slept soundly and without waking. Her little pages saw to it that she had everything she needed, faithful as hounds. And each day that passed saw a little easing of the tension within her that had kept her so near to the breaking point. It was not that she ceased to care or became numb as the days passed. It was more as if the worst of her grief was a finite thing, a barrel that had only seemed bottomless until she began allowing it to flow freely. By the time they reached Haven, and the procession made its slow and solemn way through the city to the palace, that pinched and overstrained look had left her. She wore her sorrow and her loss like a cloak, with grave dignity, rather than being bowed down beneath their intolerable burden. She needed that release, for as the journey reached its end, she was about to undertake her final ordeal. The entrance to Haven marked the day of Sendar's official funeral. Haven had been waiting too long to put it off for even one more day, and that wasn't a bad thing. The funeral, though it would be exhausting for all concerned, especially Selene, would put closure to everything. They all camped overnight, just outside the walls at the royal and home farms, and servants from the palace brought them all formal mourning garments, formal whites, greens, and scarlets. The line for the bathing facilities, and even to use the horse troughs and pumps for a bath, was a long one, and Alberich, as did many others, elected to bathe in the river instead. The faint, weedy fragrance of the river water was no match for the strong horse soap they used on themselves, as well as their mounts. When they arrived at the gate of the city in the early morning, they looked as if they had all come straight from the palace itself, and the wagons carrying tents, belongings, and a small mountain of dirty clothing had already gone up the hill, leaving only one single wagon, the one that had carried Sendar to his final rest. The court joined them at the first gate. The Lord Marshal, the Seneschal, and the heads of Bardic, Healers, and Herald's circles all walked with her behind the coffin, while the rest joined the riders. The coffin itself was transferred by a hand-picked group of the guard, with great solemnity and ceremony, to a more ornate carriage used solely for state funerals, before Sendar made his last journey through the streets of his capital. And Talamir joined them as well. Alberich was glad enough to relinquish his place at the young queen's side and join the rest of her bodyguards. But Talamir did not so much ride to meet Selene as appear. It was a very strange moment for Alberich, when the official greetings were over and suddenly, in a pause and a pocket of silence that seemed created for him, there was Talamir. And Talamir was changed, vastly changed. It was more than just the twenty years that had been added overnight to his appearance. It was more than just that his hair had gone silver-white, like the mane of a companion. After all, Alberich had found grey roots to the hair at his temples this very morning, when he had stolen a moment at an unoccupied mirror. It was much, much more than that. There was an otherworldly stillness about the Queen's own a distant look in his eyes as if he was always listening to something no one else could hear, and a faint translucency about him, as if his flesh was not quite solid enough to contain all of the light of his spirit, and a sadness that had nothing to do with the all-too-mortal grief he displayed so openly for his king. It made Alberich shiver a little, and he sensed he wasn't the only one, but not everyone seemed to notice the change. Selene didn't, for one. But perhaps she was too young, too involved with her own grief, or both. Alberich was just glad to acknowledge Talamir's thanks, and drop back farther into the procession, selfishly grateful to Talamir for having recovered quickly enough to take his proper place back. It hadn't been a position he had been comfortable with. He hated being in the public eye, on show. Now, in the formal whites that the young queen had asked him to don for the funeral, he was just one herald among many. Besides, now we're into Haven. We come into court protocols and precedents, all the pomp and ceremony that I know nothing about. 
The arrival of the state funeral coach had been the first sign that he was rapidly getting out of his depth of experience. He and the other heralds, and the royal guards that were left, rode alongside the walkers, between them and the crowds of onlookers and mourners. Here, as out in the country, the streets were carpeted with flowers and the green herbs of morning, rue and rosemary. But there were far, far too many people here to allow folk to pile more flowers on the carriage. It would have been covered within a single block. That was all right. They seemed content enough to strew their blossoms in the path of the carriage and the procession. The muffled drums, augmented now by more mounted and walking musicians, made a dull throbbing through the two quiet streets. That was the strangest part of all, the quiet in the city. Alberich was used to the noise of Haven, but today the silence was broken only by the sound of people sobbing, and even that was muffled, as if the mourners did not want to spoil the solemnity of the occasion by being too vocal. They stopped three times in the course of the morning, at three of Sendar's favorite temples, for memorial services that were mercifully brief, just long enough that the walkers could rest before carrying on. Similar services were being held all over the city, and would be all day and well into the night, but these comprised the official funeral for the citizens of Haven. And it took most of the day to get from the city gates to the palace gates. They took one break at noon, at one of the huge guildhouse squares. Selene and her entourage retired to the needleworkers' guildhouse for rest and a meal, while Sendar's coffin lay in state in the enormous guild hall of the wool merchants' guildhouse, and lines of folk, some of whom had traveled for a day to be here, filed past. Then the procession began again after two candle marks, stopping twice more for two more memorial ceremonies and at long last they entered the gates of the palace. By then they were all exhausted, even those who had only joined the procession when it entered Haven. Sendar was to be interred in the crypt beneath the floor of the palace chapel, along with the rest of his line. All was in readiness there, and had been presumably for days. The guard now marched off to their barracks, leaving a much shrunken company to enter the chapel behind the coffin. They all filed inside, where at least it was possible for those who had been walking for so long to sit down. Candles had already been lit all over the chapel, although the last light penetrated the western windows, and the interior was overly warm, with the golden and reddish light making it appear warmer still. Incense warred with the scent of lilies for supremacy. The chapel was packed solid, shoulder to shoulder. Alberich, who had been riding all day rather than walking, took a standing position up against the wall beside the royal pew. He was glad to be there, truth to tell. The stone wall felt cool against his back. It could have been awful, speaker after interminable speaker eulogizing the king, until grief turned to benumbed boredom, and that would have been a terrible thing to do to Selene. But someone had been wise. There were no interminable eulogies, only a few brief speeches by those who had known and loved Sendar the best, punctuated by some of the most glorious music that Alberich had ever heard. Not for nothing was this also the site of Bardic Collegium. The bards had exerted themselves to the utmost, and even though he had thought that the depths of his grief had been plumbed and exhausted, it was the music that brought tears again to his eyes. Anyone who could have listened to such music and not wept must have had a heart of stone. Needless to say, when it came time for the last of the speakers, Selene, she mounted the podium with reddened eyes and tear-streaked cheeks. But her voice was clear and steady as she spoke. Sendar was my king as well as my father, she said simply. He was outstanding at both tasks. It can't have been easy to rule this unruly land of ours, and at the same time govern an ungovernable child, being father and mother to her. But he did it, and did it well. I will spend the rest of my life missing him, wishing he could be here to see so many things. I suspect Valdemar will miss his steady hands on the reins, too. I can only pray that I can be as wise and compassionate a ruler as he was. I doubt very much if I can ever equal him as a parent, and I would gladly give my own life to have our positions reversed. 
She raised her head a little. Nevertheless, such a sacrifice demands more than just words. It demands deeds. It demands that we be worthy of it. It demands that we all go beyond what we think is enough. Making our own sacrifices in the name of a better life for all of Valdemar. That in the truest essence is what he did. That is what I will do. That is what he would expect of all of us. He deserves and should have nothing less than excellence as a fitting tribute to his memory. Only then can we be worthy of such a great and terrible gift, the life of a king. She sat down in silence, and it seemed to Alberich that she had surprised many of her listeners, nonplussed some, and actually startled others. They were not sure how to react to her. This was not the speech of a young woman overwhelmed with grief that they had expected to hear. More music filled the silence then, a final prayer, and the service was over. A small and very intimate party followed the coffin down into the crypt for the final interment. Alberich was not part of that procession, nor did he wish to be. He had been an integral part of a funeral that had stretched on for far too long, from the border to Haven, and meaning no disrespect to Sendar's memory, he was weary of it and wanted only to rest. Believe me, Selene feels the same, Cantor told him, the weariness in his mind voice clear as cut crystal. She's going straight to bed, and she told Cario that she's going to sleep for a week. We're already bedded down, and Cario and I intend to stay here and rest. I told Cario to stay as long as Selene stays asleep. Good, he said, and meant it. He remained where he was only long enough to see them all emerge from the crypt, see that the seneschal cut short the line of those wishing to offer condolences, and watch Selene vanish through the private door at the rear of the chapel that led straight into the royal suite with Talamir, Krathic, and the seneschal in close attendance. Then he made good his own escape. Perhaps he should have stayed to listen to the court gossip and read what he could out of expressions and what was not said, but... But that, frankly, was Talamir's job. Then he recalled what Talamir had looked like and wondered if Talamir was even capable of descending to such mundane and petty depths now. All right. I had better start to learn it, but not tonight. The air in the chapel had been warm, and now it felt stifling. Too hot, too heavy with the mingled scents of candle wax, incense, and lilies. He was only too glad to get out into the night. It was sultry and humid out there, but not as suffocating as the chapel had been. And he was unsurprised to be intercepted at the door by Daythor, who must have stationed himself right at the exit. He'd sensed the old weapons master lurking somewhere about, but he figured that Daythor would wait until he was free before greeting him. By your son, Lord, boy, it is good to see you, was all the old man said. But Alberich felt something inside him warm at the welcome. He seized Alberich's shoulders in both hands and stared into his eyes, while the last few mourners filed out of the chapel door behind him. I wish I could tell you just how good it is. I think that I may know, for as good it is to see you he replied quietly and sighed. A thousand things I wish to tell you, and all of them can wait. A good clean-up for you, and then your own bed, Daythor told him firmly. That's why I came here to get you. Fallen on your nose won't honor Sendar or help his daughter. And besides, she's got all of the Collegium and every herald that could get here to keep an eye on her tonight. He felt compelled to protest weakly. But duties I have which are in Talamir's hands, at least as far as Selene is concerned. Do him good. Daythor gave him a little push to send him on the path down toward the Sal. As for your duties as weapons master, the court and Collegia are in a week of official mourning. No council meetings unless there's an emergency. No court functions. No classes, no lessons. The only thing that's on anyone's plate is planning the coronation and that is for the Seneschal and Bardic Collegium, not us. Not even Selene, actually. All she has to do is go through what they plan out for her. For you lot, this is a week of rest. Ah. He absorbed that with relief, 
when something that Daythor had said at the beginning of the explanation struck him as odd. Daythor, weapons master's second I am, not weapons master. Not as of today you're not, Daythor said smugly. With the dean's approval, I just retired, and you are weapons master. Ah, he said. It was all he could say. He felt completely stunned and utterly blindsided. This he had not expected. Glad you agree, said Daythor with satisfaction. Which is just as well, since it's too late for you to back out. Come along, it's a shower bath for you, and then bed. Worry about whatever it is you're going to worry about tomorrow. You might as well surrender now, Cantor said sleepily. He still outranks you. Retired weapons master outranks the current weapons master. And in fact, there was a sweet relief in doing just that, surrendering and letting someone else give the orders. He had never thought he would be comfortable in doing that, but he had never trusted anyone the way he now trusted these friends, these brothers, his fellow heralds. As they trusted him, had trusted him with the safety and life of their queen and their own as they had trusted him to go home to Carsey and come out again. In your hands I put myself, he said, and gave in gracefully to the inevitable. I find it somewhat ironic, Selene said a good two weeks and a bit later, as Alberich stood beside her on her left, that one of the first things I'd do is ask you to keep to your shadow greys, and yet circumstances keep forcing you into Wyatt's. They stood outside the doors of the great hall, and from the other side came a hum of voices and a sense of expectation. On her right was Talamir in that same set of formal whites Alberich recalled from the first moment he'd actually seen the Queen's own. Now he wore a set of whites every bit as elaborate as Talamir's, and very uncomfortable he felt in them too. It wasn't as if they were ill-fitting— Quite the contrary, they fit him better than any clothing he'd ever worn. They should. It had taken two cobblers, three tailors, and five fittings to ensure that they did. And the wonder was, it had all been done in just under a fortnight. No, it was that same reaction he'd had to Talamir's whites. This was a set of clothing for a high-born courtier, not a common man like him. I believe at the time you were thinking, a foppish high-born courtier or something of the sort. Cantor observed. So I was. I still think so. And the moment all this is over, I am changing out of these ridiculous garments as quickly as humanly possible. He refrained from tugging at his high collar. It wasn't tight. He only felt as if it should be. Only for one day it is, he replied. Tomorrow, Alberich the Grim, I shall again be. He did not add how much it would take to induce him back into the cursed whites. Is that what the trainees call you? Talamir asked with interest. Talamir's health had improved vastly and continued to do so, but there was still something that was otherworldly about him, more so at some times than others, as if only part of him was still there among the living. And it wasn't as if he was absent-minded, or that his mind wandered. Actually, he was, if anything, sharper than ever. He noticed everything, but said very little. Perhaps that was a part of it. He stood aside from life, an observer rather than a participant. The things that irritated and annoyed other people, Talamir did not even comment upon. Alberich wondered if there was even anything he was afraid of any more. There were times when he seemed so distant and remote that he didn't quite seem human. Fortunately, today he was very much in the moment, and the most like his old self that he'd been since before the last battle. Oh, that they call me. Other things among, Alberich replied, and Great Stoneface or Harold Stoneheart. He permitted himself a sardonic little smile. They take me, perhaps, for granite. Talamir and Selene both blinked at him. Was that a joke I just heard? Talamir asked, in utter disbelief. A pun? Not possible, he replied blandly. No sense of humor have I, all know this. It was too late for any retort, for the trumpets sounded just beyond the double doors of the great hall. The doors themselves were opened from inside, 
and Selene stepped forward, followed closely by her two escorting heralds. The great hall was crowded as full as it could be with every highborn and notable who had been able to get here in time for the funeral and subsequent coronation. All six of Selene's little tedral pages, decked out in the dark blue of the royal livery, preceded her as she paced up the narrow path between the two halves of the audience in time to the music. Each of them had a basket of fragrant herbs, which they scattered in her path with meticulous care. Initial rehearsals had them either dumping handfuls and running out halfway up to the dais, or being so stingy with each leaf that they still had full baskets when they got there, so they were taking immense care to do it right this time. The looks of fierce concentration on their little faces were quite endearing. All of the doors and windows were flung open to the summer day outside the hall, so at least it wasn't as close in here as it could have been. But the crowd glittered like the contents of an overturned jewel chest, garbed in so many colors that, after a fortnight of the stark blacks and whites of morning, it hurt Alberich's eyes to look at them. The sunshine pouring in the windows glanced off gold and jewels, and the crowd glittered with every tiny movement. Selene set the pace. They only had to follow her. She looked meditative as if she was taking a stroll in the gardens, not walking up to the throne that she would officially take in a few moments. Alberich thought that she looked as beautiful and fragile as a snow spirit in the gown that had been made for this moment, a gown of some soft, silky, draping stuff based on Harold's whites, but with wing-like sleeves and a train that trailed out behind her, glittering with tiny moonstones and gold beads, and a chaplet of moonstones and beads in her unbound hair. He would much rather that she had worn her armor, truth to be told. He would have preferred to see her marching up to the throne like a conquering battle-maiden. Who would take this sweet young girl seriously as a monarch? The army, anyone who was with us on the battlefield, perhaps those who heard her eulogy for her father. But the others, highborn and notables from across the land, they knew only what they saw, a girl, a mere girl, come to govern. Well, she'd better learn how to handle them. It was her job to make them take her seriously. With perfect timing they reached the dais just as the music ended and in a silence remarkable for a room holding so many people, the three of them ascended it. Waiting for them there were the chief members of the council, ranged in a half-circle behind the throne, the seneschal, the lord of the treasury, the lord marshal, and the chiefs of the heraldic, bardic, and healer's circle. Representing all of the various and varied religions of Haven was the patriarch Pelion de Genre. Albrecht didn't know which sect and temple he represented, but he looked every inch the part, white-haired, bearded, in robes of purple and white that were absolutely stiff with white embroidery, and an imposing staff capped with a huge globe of amber. "'Who comes before the throne of Valdemar?' the Lord Marshal thundered, placing his hand on the hilt of his purely ornamental sword. "'I, Selene, daughter of Sendar,' and rightful queen of Valdemar, she replied, in a voice as cool as mountain snow. In the name of the gods, I lay claim to the throne of Valdemar. By what tokens do you claim the throne? asked the seneschal, who looked nothing near as imposing as the Lord Marshal. Truth be told, he looked as if he should be asking, Have we got the order of precedence right? Selene answered the challenge as her father's daughter should. By the token of my blood, of the line of Valdemar, first king of this land, by the token of my choosing, by the companion Cario, by the token of my mind, trained to rule this land as wisely as the first king, by the token of my heart, that is given to the service of the people of this land, and by the token of my right hand, that will wield the sword of war or the staff of peace over it as need be. She held her head high, and her voice remained steady and clear. And who vouches for these things? the Lord Treasurer asked. I vouch for her blood, of the line of Valdemar, for my healers saw her born of Sendar's consort, said the chief healer. It was the chief herald's turn. And I... 
that she is chosen by the companion Cario, for my heralds saw her trained and granted whites. I, the chief bard said, somehow putting far more theatrical flourish into the words than anyone else, vouch for her mind, for my bards have tested her training and found it complete. Now it was Talamir's turn. His voice trembled a little, but only a little, and Alberich didn't think that anyone noticed but him. I vouch for her heart, for I am the queen's own, and her heart is open to me. Now tradition said that the last lines were to be spoken by the Lord Marshal himself, but Selene had asked for Alberich to take the final part. Who else could but you? she had asked, and he could not find it in him to deny her. He had drummed his response into his brain until he woke to find himself reciting it in his sleep. This was no time to let his carsite syntax mangle what he was going to say. And I, he said in a voice that sounded harsh to his own ears, vouch for her hand, strong in defense, gentle to nurture, for I am the queen's champion, and I have tested her will and her spirit in the fires of adversity. The Lord Marshal nodded and stepped back. Then come, Selene, daughter of Sendar. Come and assume your rightful place, Queen of Valdemar. Selene took the last few paces until she was within touching distance of the throne, then turned and faced the gathering. Her pages scrambled to gather up the train of her gown and arrange it at her feet. Alberich moved farther to her left and took the gold wand that served as the seldom-used scepter from the hands of the seneschal, as Talamir did the same on the right and took the crown from the seneschal. Selene removed the bejeweled chaplet with her own hands and gave it to the treasurer. With infinite care, Talamir placed the simple gold crown, hardly more than an engraved circlet, on her golden head, and stepped back to take his place behind the throne. Alberich gave the scepter into her hands, and looked for a moment deeply into her eyes. She looked back at him fearlessly. A world of question and reassurance passed between them in that look, and he could not have told which of them comforted the other more. But he knew then, in that moment, that no matter what hardships, what trials came in the future, she would not break under them. He had seen her tested in the fires of adversity tested and tried and tempered, and she had come out of it full of strength, true as steel, and as tough and flexible. As of you, Cantor said, a universe of love and pride coloring the words. And those who don't see it haven't eyes. The rest are proud that you are one of us, Harold Alberich. He stepped back and took his place next to Talamir and the Lord Marshal called out the very same words that he had used all those many days ago on the road to Haven. Valdemar, behold your queen! And the cheer that erupted from those gathered below her held nothing feigned or uncertain. Epilogue Alberich had wanted to come to the Temple of the Lord of Light and visit Gary for nearly a moon, but there had just been too much to do. It wasn't just his full duties as weapons master, although that was a time-devouring job in and of itself. When you added his continued forays into the darker streets of Haven, then his informal but very necessary lessons with Talamir, lessons detailing the intricacies of the life of the court and the high-born courtiers that made it the very hub of their existence, as well as all the eddies and swirls of intrigue within it, there just hadn't been enough marks in a day. Working with Talamir had been the hardest, although Talamir was during these sessions the most like his former self that he ever was these days. Alberich walked into the lessons with a shiver, and out of them with a feeling of relief, and the strong sense that he'd been in the naked presence of someone who'd been done no favors by being brought back to life, and who lived each moment longing to return to the path he'd been taken from so that he could finish the journey. But Krafik had been right. There was no one else that could serve as the Queen's own that Selene needed right now, and Talamir knew that. Perhaps that was why he was driving Alberich so hard, transferring the full weight of the job of 
intelligence master, for lack of a better title, onto Alberich's shoulders meant there was one less thing holding Talamir back from that delayed journey. Finally, it had been the fact that he hadn't been to the temple in far too long that had decided him. Talamir was busy with some delegation or other paying respects to Selene, and the scum of Haven could stew without him for one night. Cantor heartily approved, which eased his conscience somewhat, and truth to tell it felt very good to ride down into the city without wondering which persona he should don, if there was going to be any trouble that night, or whether he was going to have to explain himself to the constables and city guard again. He felt relaxed, as he seldom did, as Cantor stopped inside the walls of the temple's outer court and waited for him to dismount. On a pleasant evening like this one, he had expected the court to be full of the Sun Lord's worshippers, and indeed it was. As the priests intended, the court was serving its function as the neighborhood gathering place. Older children, who had not yet gone to bed, played games along one wall, a number of folk were using the free lantern and torchlight to read by, sitting at the benches on the opposite wall to where the children played. There were little knots of gossip and courtship, awkward flirtation and some friendly rivalry, and even a pair of old men playing a game of castles on a portable board. Alberich wouldn't have been surprised to see a hot pie seller there, though no doubt if one had appeared, Gary would have run him off. There were some things that were just a shade too undignified for the forecourt of a temple. None of them paid any attention to Alberich. He was now a fixture at the temple though he doubted that anyone knew him for the queen's champion in his dark gray leathers. They probably thought he was just someone's private guard. Anyone could have a white horse, after all, and what would the weapons master of Harold's Collegium be doing down here in this little neighborhood temple anyway? Those with Carsite blood took great pride in the fact that one of their own was a herald, but no one would ever dream that a herald would come here to worship the Sun Lord, however devout he was. People, he was coming to think, mostly saw what they expected to see, and if they saw something that ran counter to their expectations, they tended to rationalize it away. Useful that for a man in his position, though he would never trust his life to that principle, people were also likely to figure out the one thing you wanted to keep hidden from them at the worst possible moment. The door to the temple lay open to catch the coolness of the night breezes, and he simply walked in, and stopped to stare. For there was Gary, and around him was a gaggle of children, one of which he recognized as the little Carsite girl who had talked to him on the night of the rescue. They were all wearing a version of the warm yellow tunics and trues worn by novices in the service of Vicandis, brand new and a bit oversized, and they all acted as if they were completely at home here. Gary was giving them a Valdemaran lesson, with the flock of them tucked out of the way in the side chapel used for long vigils and private meditations. Alberich realized after a moment of complete blankness that this little temple had taken in all of the Carsite children that had been taken by the Tedrils, and if the hour seemed rather late for lessons, well, that might be the case for anyone other than a temple of Vacandis. The Sun Lord had rites and rituals going on from the dawn to sunset and only after darkness fell was Gary going to be free to give these little ones the language class they needed before they could hope to learn anything else. I'll have to ask Misty if she can get down here and give him a hand, he thought, watching them all. I wonder if there are any other car-side exiles who've got the time to help. Gary won't push it, but Misty will. He quickly moved back into the shadows, lest he disturb them, and watched and felt something extraordinary unfold inside him. Something so extraordinary that at first he didn't recognize it for what it was. Happiness. Pure, unalloyed happiness. Of all of the things he had done or had a hand in doing, this was the one that had brought nothing but good for all concerned, with nothing whatsoever to regret or wish he had done differently. The children responded to Gary with all of the warmth that he would have expected. Gary was one of the kindest souls in the world, and children liked him even when he had to discipline them for something. But these children in particular were blossoming for the young priest like flowers in the sun. 
Already he could tell a vast difference between the too eager, too helpful, anxious, pinch-faced little things they had been, and the bright-faced creatures they were now. It was wonderful. This was how Carsite children should look. And even as he reveled in the pleasure of knowing that he had had a key hand in making it possible for them to be here, he also knew a moment of sadness at the fact that even in Carsey, most Carsite children were not this free, not this happy. Sun Lord, gentle giver of light, make it possible for them too. A small hand tugged at his sleeve, and he turned and looked down. I heard you were looking for me said a very small, very red-haired boy, with amazing blue eyes that looked oddly old in such a young face. For a moment Alberich stared at him, trying to work out what on earth the child could mean. Then it struck him. You are the boy they called Cantus, he asked. The child nodded. And you're Alberich, the white rider, the one who was promised to us, right? Well... He squatted down on his heels, so that he could look the boy straight in the eye. I would say that it depends on just who was doing the promising, and where he got his information. The child grinned at him. It would be me that was doing the promising, but the promise wasn't mine. It was the prophecy. And it all came out of the writ, of course. I know the writ very well. He struck a pose and began to recite. Alcar. Canto 7, verse 9. And the children shall be reft from the people, and they shall suffer in the hands of the infidel, but those that keep faith shall endure, and the riders of light shall redeem them. Porphyr, Canto 12, verse 22. And lo, in the moment of despair I shall be with you, I shall guide you, as you were a child, out of the camp of iniquity and into the hands of the saviors, and great spirits of white shall succor you. Worth, Canto 15, verse 49. And a rider of the purest white spirit shall... Alberich held up his hand to stop the flow of words. I would say that you do indeed know the writ very well, he admitted gravely. But I am not at all certain that there is anything in those verses that I would recognize as being part of the... the prophecy. He was going to add, if there ever was a prophecy except that what this child had done, and the hope he had given the others, the way he had organized them and kept them going, how had that been so wrong? Even if it had all been a childish tale concocted out of the scraps of writ he knew, the tales the Valdemaran children babbled, and his fertile imagination, it had essentially saved them. But I suppose it depends on how you interpret them, he finished instead and smiled. I wanted to meet you, primarily because I wanted to thank you for helping all of the others so much. The boy looked at him unblinking, but with a smile playing about his lips. Isn't that what we're all supposed to do? Help each other? No matter who we are and where we come from, that's what the writ says in the great laws. Where had the child learned that? Not from any of the sun priests that Alberich had served. Absolutely right. He stood up and gazed down at the child. You are a very remarkable fellow. And so are you, Alberich of Carsey, Harold of Valdemar. The child's voice suddenly deepened and seemed to fill his ears, his mind, and his world shrank to the boy's young face and the voice that resonated all through him. He couldn't move, and he didn't want to. A man of such conscience and honor is a remarkable man indeed, so remarkable that it would seem that his prayers reach a little farther than most. Alberich could not look away from those blue eyes, eyes which held an impossible golden flame in their depths. He wasn't afraid, though, far from it. He had never felt such peace before in his life. A man of conscience and honor who has found a fitting place in his exile among those who value that honor and honor the conscience. The boy nodded. It is written that exiles do not last forever, for those who are true to their word, their family, and their home. But remember always that the writ tells us that a man's home is where his family is, Harold Alberich, 
and also that friends are the family one can choose. The child backed away a few paces, as Alberich felt his pulse hammering in his throat, as if he had run a very long distance. He hardly knew what to think. He couldn't have actually said anything if his life had depended on speaking. The boy turned and walked a few more steps away in the direction of the door, then looked back over his shoulder. And if you think what I am is remarkable, wait some few years, and you will see what my daughter can do. Or should I say, my daughter who will be my son? Then he laughed and ran off a high, utterly childlike laugh that broke the spell that had held Alberich motionless. He still couldn't think. His thoughts moved as if they were flowing through thick honey, but he needed to run after that boy. Alberich! Gary called, and he turned. The priest had broken up the class, and apparently had spotted Alberich in the back of the temple. I was hoping you'd come to see what we've done. We took all of the Carsite children when the Queen's people came to ask if we had room for any. You know, we couldn't just turn them away, and they've been a delight to have here. What's more, they are making remarkable progress. Like that boy, he replied, feeling his heart still racing with an emotion that held both excitement and fear. No, not fear, but an emotion like fear. It took him a moment to recognize it as hope. Boy? Gary looked puzzled. What boy? The boy I was... He gestured. But there was no sign that there had ever been anyone there. Talking to... They both scanned the now empty temple, but there was no sign of any children now. It must have been one of the youngsters from the courtyard, Gary replied, looking puzzled. All of the Carsite children were with me. Or... Any of the children who come here in the evening named Cantus? he ventured, not knowing whether he wanted to hear the answer. But Gary only shrugged. I haven't a clue. There are so many of them, and they just swarm the place in weather like this. Some of them aren't even worshippers of the Sun Lord. They just come to play with our children. Alberich licked dry lips and thought furiously. It might just have been a child playing a prank. It would have been natural for the Carsite children to tell others about Cantus and their peculiar prophecy. Children sometimes played the most elaborate jokes, especially on adults, when they thought they could get away with it. Although the families who worshipped here were fluent in Valdemarin, they all spoke Carsite at home, and children picked up languages easily. It would have been easy for one to pick out some passages from the writ that matched that prophecy, wouldn't it? And who was he? to be the recipient of a visitation from the Sun Lord himself. No one. If anyone should have gotten a visitation, it should be Gary, not him. And, no, I won't worry this to death. If it was the Sun Lord in his aspect as child of the morning, or if it wasn't, it's all the same to how I should continue to act. That was free will again, the gift of the Sun Lord, to choose or not choose a path. He would choose the same path he always had, that of honor. And in either case, because pearls of wisdom drop from innocent mouths, I shall take the advice to heart, for it comes from the writ, and I shall take comfort from it for the same reason. It probably was one of the youngsters from outside. If you see him again, make sure to get him to talk to you, for he is remarkably well-spoken, he said, and slapped Gary on the back. I am dying for a decent glass of tea. Why don't you tell me what you've been doing with these children and give me some idea of how I can help? After all, wasn't that what everyone was supposed to do? Even an exile in a strange land? Exile. The writ and the boy were right. When he had come here, perhaps, but among these people, he had found those who understood that a man had to hold to his word and his honor. People who were the truest sort of friends and as the writ said, the sort of friends who became one's family, which meant that he wasn't really in exile after all. It was good to be home. This concludes Exile's Honor by Mercedes Lackey, narrated by Paul Woodson, a member of SAG-AFTRA.
Copyright 2002 by Mercedes R. Lackey. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Mercedes Lackey, care of Scoville Galen Gauche Literary Agency Incorporated, and was produced in the year 2019 by Tantor Media Incorporated, a division of recorded books which holds the copyright thereto. Please visit Tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks.